Chapter One of Salambo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. Chapter One, Part One, The Feast. It was at Megara, a suburb of Carthage in the gardens of hamilcar the soldiers whom he had commanded in sicily were having a great feast to celebrate the anniversary of the battle of eryx and as the master was away and they were numerous they ate and drank with perfect freedom the captains who wore bronze cotourni had placed themselves in the central path beneath a gold-fringed purple awning which reached from the wall of the stables to the first terrace of the palace the common soldiers were scattered beneath the trees where numerous flat-roofed buildings might be seen wine-presses cellars storehouses bakeries and arsenals with a court for elephants dens for wild beasts and a prison for slaves fig trees surrounded the kitchens a wood of sycamores stretched away to meet masses of verdure where the pomegranate shone amid the white tufts of the cotton plant vines grape laden grew up into the branches of the pines a field of roses bloomed beneath the plane trees here and there lilies rocked upon the turf the paths were strewn with black sand mingled with powdered coral and in the centre the avenue of cypress formed as it were a double colonnade of green obelisks from one extremity to the other far in the background stood the palace built of yellow mottled numidian marble broad courses supporting its four terraced stories with its large straight ebony staircase bearing the prow of a vanquished gallery at the corners of every step its red doors quartered with black crosses its brass gratings protecting it from scorpions below and its trellises of gilded rods closing the apertures above it seemed to the soldiers in its haughty opulence as solemn and impenetrable as the face of hamilcar the council had appointed his house for the holding of this feast the convalescents lying in the table of eskmoun had set out at daybreak and dragged themselves thither on their crutches every minute others were arriving they poured in ceaselessly by every path like torrents rushing into a lake through the trees the slaves of the kitchens might be seen running scarred and half naked the gazelles fled bleating on the lawns the sun was setting and the perfume of citron trees rendered the exhalation from the perspiring crowd heavier still men of all nations were there ligurians lusitanians balearians negroes and fugitives from rome beside the heavy dorian dialect were audible the resonant celtic syllables rattling like chariots of war while ionian terminations conflicted with consonants of the desert as harsh as the jackal's cry the greek might be recognized by his slender figure the egyptian by his elevated shoulders the cantabrian by his broad calves there were carrions proudly nodding their helmet plumes cappadocian arches displaying large flowers painted on their bodies with the juice of herbs and a few lydians in women's robes dining in slippers and earrings others were ostentatiously daubed with vermilion and resembled coral statues they stretched themselves on the cushions they ate squatting around large trays or lying face downwards they drew out the pieces of meat 
and sated themselves leaning on their elbows in the peaceful posture of lions tearing their prey the last comers stood leaning against the trees watching the low tables half hidden beneath the scarlet coverings and awaiting their turn hamilcar's kitchen being insufficient the council had sent them slaves ware and beds and in the middle of the garden as on a battlefield when they burn the dead large bright fires might be seen at which oxen were roasting Annie's sprinkled loaves alternated with great cheeses heavier than discuses crateras filled with wine and cantharises filled with water together with baskets of gold filigree work containing flowers every eye was dilated with the joy of being able at last to gorge at pleasure and songs were beginning here and there first they were served with birds and green sauce in plates of red clay relieved by drawings in black then with every kind of shellfish that is gathered on the punic coasts wheaten porridge beans and barley and snails dressed with cumin on dishes of yellow amber afterwards the tables were covered with meats antelopes with their horns peacocks with their feathers whole sheep cooked in sweet wine haunches of she-camels and buffaloes hedgehogs with gorham fried grasshoppers and preserved dormice large pieces of fat floated in the midst of saffron in bowls of tamrapani wood everything was running over with wine truffles and asafoetida pyramids of fruit were crumbling upon honeycombs and they had not forgotten a few of those plump little dogs with pink silky hair and fattened on olive leaves a carthaginian dish held in abhorrence among other nations surprise at the novel fare excited the greed of the stomach the gauls with their long hair drawn up on the crown of the head snatched at the watermelons and lemons and crunched them up with the rind the negroes who had never seen a lobster tore their faces with its red prickles but the shaven greeks whiter than marble threw the leavings of their plates behind them while the herdsmen from brutum in their wolf-skin garments devoured in silence with their faces in their portions night fell the velarium spread over the cypress avenue was drawn back and torches were brought the apes sacred to the moon were terrified on the cedar tops by the wavering lights of the petroleum as it burned in the porphyry vases they uttered screams which afforded mirth to the soldiers oblong flames trembled in cuirasses of brass every kind of scintillation flashed from the gem-encrusted dishes the crateras with their borders of convex mirrors multiplied and enlarged the images of things the soldiers thronged around looking at their reflections with amazement and grimacing to make themselves laugh they tossed the ivory stools and golden spatulas to one another across the tables they gulped down all the greek wines in their leathern bottles the campanian wine enclosed in amphoras the cantabrian wine brought in casks with the wines of the jujube cinnamonum and lotus there were pools of these on the ground that made the foot slip the smoke of the meats ascended into the foliage with the vapour of the breath simultaneously were heard the snapping of jaws the noise of speech songs and cups the crash of companion vases shivering into a thousand pieces or the limpid sound of a large silver dish in proportion as their intoxication increased they more and more recalled the injustice of carthage 
the republic in fact exhausted by the war had allowed all the returning bands to accumulate in the town gisco their general had however been prudent enough to send them back severally in order to facilitate the liquidation of their pay and the council had believed that they would in the end consent to some reduction but at present ill-will was caused by the inability to pay them this debt was confused in the minds of the people with the three thousand two hundred euboic talents exacted by lutatius and equally with rome they were regarded as enemies to carthage the mercenaries understood this and their indignation found vent in threats and outbreaks at last they demanded permission to assemble to celebrate one of their victories and the peace party yielded at the same time revenging themselves on hamilcar who had so strongly upheld the war it had been terminated notwithstanding all his efforts so that despairing of carthage he had entrusted the government of the mercenaries to gisco to appoint his palace for their reception was to draw upon him something of the hatred which was borne to them moreover the expense must be excessive and he would incur nearly the whole proud of having brought the republic to submit the mercenaries thought that they were at last about to return to their homes with the payment for their blood in the hoods of their cloaks but as seen through the mists of intoxication their fatigues seemed to them prodigious and but ill rewarded they showed one another their wounds they told of their combats their travels and the hunting in their native lands they imitated the cries and the leaps of wild beasts then came unclean wagers they buried their heads in the amphoras and drank on without interruption like thirsty dromedaries a lusitanian of gigantic stature ran over the tables carrying a man in each hand at arm's length and spitting out fire through his nostrils some lacedaemonians who had not taken off their cuirasses were leaping with a heavy step some advanced like women making obscene gestures others stripped naked to fight amid the cups after the fashion of gladiators and a company of greeks danced around a vase whereon nymphs were to be seen while a negro tapped with an ox bone on a brazen buckler suddenly they heard a plaintive song a song loud and soft rising and falling in the air like the wing beating of a wounded bird it was the voice of the slaves in the ergastulum some soldiers rose at a bound to release them and disappeared they returned driving through the dust amid shouts twenty men distinguished by their greater paleness of face small black felt caps of conical shape covered their shaven heads they all wore wooden shoes and yet made a noise as of old iron like driving chariots they reached the avenue of cyprus where they were lost among the crowd of those questioning them one of them remained apart standing through the rents in his tunic his shoulders could be seen striped with long scars drooping his chin he looked around him with distrust closing his eyelids somewhat against the dazzling light of the torches but when he saw that none of the armed men were unfriendly to him a great sigh escaped from his breast he stammered he sneered through the bright tears that bathed his face at last he seized a brimming cantharus by its rings raised it straight up into the air with his outstretched arms from which his chains hung down and then looking to heaven and still holding the cup he said hail first to thee baal eshmoon the deliverer 
whom the people of my country call esculapius and to you genie of the fountains light and woods and to you ye gods hidden beneath the mountains and in the caverns of the earth and to you strong men in shining armour who have set me free then he let fall the cup and related his history he was called spendius the carthaginians had taken him in the battle of Aginusse, and he thanked the mercenaries once more in greek ligurian and punic he kissed their hands finally he congratulated them on the banquet while expressing his surprise at not perceiving the cups of the sacred legion these cups which bore an emerald vine on each of their six golden faces belonged to a corpse composed exclusively of young patricians of the tallest stature they were a privilege almost a sacerdotal distinction and accordingly nothing among the treasures of the republic was more coveted by the mercenaries they detested the legion on this account and some of them had been known to risk their lives for the inconceivable pleasure of drinking out of these cups accordingly they commanded that the cups should be brought they were in the keeping of the Sicitia, companies of traders who had a common table the slaves returned at that hour all the members of the Sicitia were asleep let them be awakened responded the mercenaries after a second excursion it was explained to them that the cups were shut up in a temple let it be opened they replied and when the slaves confessed with trembling that they were in the possession of gisco the general they cried out let him bring them gisco soon appeared at the far end of the garden with an escort of the sacred legion his full black cloak which was fastened on his head to a golden mitre starred with precious stones and which hung all about him down to his horse's hoofs blended in the distance with the colour of the night his white beard the radiancy of his head-dress and his triple necklace of broad blue plates beating against his breast were alone visible when he entered the soldiers greeted him with loud shouts all crying the cups the cups he began by declaring that if reference were had to their courage they were worthy of them the crowd applauded and howled with joy he knew it who had commanded them over yonder and had returned with the last cohort in the last gallery true true said they nevertheless gisco continued the republic had respected their national divisions their customs and their modes of worship in carthage they were free as to the cups of the sacred legion they were private property suddenly a gaul who was close to spendius sprang over the tables and ran straight up to gisco gesticulating and threatening him with two naked swords without interrupting his speech the general struck him on the head with his heavy ivory staff and the barbarian fell the gowls howled and their frenzy which was spreading to the others would soon have swept away the legionaries gisco shrugged his shoulders as he saw them growing pale he thought that his courage would be useless against these exasperated brute beasts he would be better to revenge himself upon them by some artifice later accordingly he signed to his soldiers and slowly withdrew then turning in the gateway towards the mercenaries he cried to them that they would repent of it the feast recommenced 
but gisco might return and by surrounding the suburb which was beside the last ramparts might crush them against the walls then they felt themselves alone in spite of their crowd and the great town sleeping beneath them in the shade suddenly made them afraid with its piles of staircases its lofty black houses and its vague guards fiercer even than its people in the distance a few ships lanterns were gliding across the harbour and there were lights in the temple of Carmon. they thought of hamilcar where was he why had he forsaken them when peace was concluded his differences with the council were doubtless but a pretence in order to destroy them their unsatisfied hate recoiled upon him and they cursed him exasperating one another with their own anger at this juncture they collected together beneath the plane trees to see a slave who with eyeballs fixed neck contorted and lips covered with foam was rolling on the ground and beating the soil with his limbs some one cried out that he was poisoned all then believed themselves poisoned they fell upon the slaves a terrible clamour was raised and a vertigo of destruction came like a whirlwind upon the drunken army they struck about them at random they smashed they slew some hurled torches into the foliage others leaning over the lion's balustrade massacred the animals with arrows the most daring ran to the elephants desiring to cut down their trunks and eat ivory some balearic slingers however who had gone around the corner of the palace in order to pillage more conveniently were checked by a lofty barrier made of indian cane they cut the lock straps with their daggers and then found themselves beneath the front that had faced carthage in another garden full of trimmed vegetation lines of white flowers all following one another in regular succession formed long parabolas like star rockets on the azure coloured earth the gloomy bushes exhaled warm and honeyed odours there were trunks of trees smeared with cinnabar which resembled columns covered with blood in the centre were twelve pedestals each supporting a great glass ball and these hollow globes were indistinctly filled with reddish lights like enormous and still palpitating eyeballs the soldiers lighted themselves with torches as they stumbled on the slope of the deeply laboured soil but they perceived a little lake divided into several basins by walls of blue stones so limpid was the wave that the flames of the torches quivered in it at the very bottom on a bed of white pebbles and golden dust it began to bubble luminous sprangles glided past and great fish with gems about their mouths appeared near the surface with much laughter the soldiers slipped their fingers into the gills and brought them to the tables they were the fish of the barca family and were all descended from those primordial lotes which had hatched the mystic egg wherein the goddess was concealed the idea of committing a sacrilege revived the greediness of the mercenaries they speedily placed fire beneath some brazen vases and amused themselves by watching the beautiful fish struggling in the boiling water the surge of soldiers pressed on they were no longer afraid they commenced to drink again their ragged tunics were wet with the perfumes that flowed in large drops from their foreheads and resting both fists on the tables which seemed to them to be rocking like ships 
they rolled their great drunken eyes around to devour by sight what they could not take others walked amid the dishes on the purple table covers breaking ivory stools and files of turian glass to pieces with their feet songs mingled with the death rattle of the slaves expiring amid the broken cups they demanded wine meat gold they cried out for women they raved in a hundred languages some thought that they were at the vapour baths on account of the steam which floated around them or else catching sight of the foliage imagined that they were at the chase and rushed upon their companions as upon wild beasts the conflagration spread to all the trays one after another and the lofty mosses of verdure emitting long white spirals looked like volcanoes beginning to smoke the clamour redoubled the wounded lions roared in the shade End of chapter 1, part 1chapter 1 part 2 of salambo by gustave flaubert this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter 1 part 2 in an instant the highest terrace of the palace was illuminated the central door opened and a woman hamilcar's daughter herself clothed in black garments appeared on the threshold she descended the first staircase which ran obliquely along the first story then the second and the third and stopped on the last terrace at the head of the gallery staircase motionless and with head bent she gazed upon the soldiers behind her on each side were two long shadows of pale men clad in white red fringed robes which fell straight to their feet they had no beard no hair no eyebrows in their hands which sparkled with rings they carried enormous lyres and with shrill voices they sang a hymn to the divinity of carthage they were the eunuch priests of the temple of tanit who were often summoned by salambo to her house at last she descended the gallery staircase the priests followed her she advanced into the avenue of cyprus and walked slowly through the tables of the captains who drew back somewhat as they watched her pass her hair which was powdered with violet sand and combined into the form of a tower after the fashion of the Kanaanit maidens added to her height tresses of pearls were fastened to her temples and fell to the corners of her mouth which was as rosy as a half-open pomegranate on her breast was a collection of luminous stones their variegation imitating the scales of the murina her arms were adorned with diamonds and issued naked from her sleeveless tunic which was starred with red flowers on a perfectly black ground between her ankles she wore a golden chainlet to regulate her steps and her large dark purple mantle cut of an unknown material trailed behind her making as it were at each step a broad wave which followed her the priests played nearly stifled chords on their lyres from time to time and in the intervals of the music might be heard the tinkling of the little golden chain and the regular patter of her papyrus sandals no one as yet was acquainted with her 
it was only known that she led a retired life engaged in pious practices some soldiers had seen her in the night on the summit of her palace kneeling before the stars amid the eddyings from kindled perfuming pans it was the moon that had made her so pale and there was something from the gods that enveloped her like a subtle vapour her eyes seemed to gaze far beyond terrestrial space she bent her head as she walked and in her right hand she carried a little ebony lyre they heard her murmur dead all dead no more will you come obedient to my voice as when seated on the edge of the lake i used to throw seeds of the watermelon into your mouths the mystery of tanit ranged in the depths of your eyes that were more limpid than the globules of rivers and she called them by their names which were those of the months siv sivan tamus elul tishri sheba ah have pity on me goddess the soldiers thronged about her without understanding what she said they wondered at her attire but she turned a long frightened look upon them all then sinking her head beneath her shoulders and waving her arms she repeated several times what have you done what have you done yet you had bread and meats and oil and all the malobatrum of the granaries for your enjoyment i had brought oxen from hecatompylos i had sent hunters into the desert her voice swelled her cheeks purpled she added where pray are you now in a conquered town or in the palace of a master and what master hamilcar the suffet my father the servant of the baals it was he who withheld from lutatius those arms of yours red now with the blood of his slaves know you of any in your own lands more skilled in the conduct of battles look our palace steps are encumbered with our victories ah desist not burn it i will carry away with me the genius of my house my black serpent slumbering up yonder on lotus leaves i will whistle and he will follow me and if i embark in a galley he will speed in the wake of my ship over the foam of the waves her delicate nostrils were quivering she crushed her nails against the gem on her bosom her eyes drooped and she resumed ah poor carthage lamentable city no longer hast thou for thy protection the strong men of former days who went beyond the oceans to build temples on their shores all the lands laboured about thee and the sea plains ploughed by thine oars rocked with thy harvests then she began to sing the adventures of melkarth the god of the sidonians and the father of her family she told of the ascent of the mountains of ersiphonia the journey to tartessus and the war against massisabal to avenge the queen of the serpents he pursued the female monster whose tail undulated over the dead leaves like a silver brook into the forest and came to a plain where women with dragon crops were round a great fire standing erect on the points of their tails the blood-coloured moon was shining within a pale circle and their scarlet tongues cloven like the harpoons of fishermen reached curling forth to the very edge of the flame then salambo without pausing related how melkart after vanquishing massisabal placed her severed head on the prow of his ship 
at each throb of the waves it sank beneath the foam but the sun embalmed it it became harder than gold nevertheless the eyes ceased not to weep and the tears fell into the water continually she sang all this in an old canaanite idiom which the barbarians did not understand they asked one another what she could be saying to them with those frightful gestures which accompanied her speech and mounted round about her on the tables beds and sycamore boughs they strove with open mouths and craned necks to grasp the vague stories hovering before their imaginations through the dimness of the theogonies like phantoms wrapped in a cloud only the beardless priests understood salambo their wrinkled hands which hung over the strings of their lyres quivered and from time to time they would draw forth a mournful chord for feebler than old women they trembled at once with mystic emotion and with the fear inspired by men the barbarians heeded them not but listened continually to the maiden's song none gazed at her like a young numidian chief who was placed at the captain's tables among the soldiers of his own nation his girdle so bristled with darts that it formed a swelling in his ample cloak which was fastened on his temples with a leather lace the cloth parted asunder as it fell upon his shoulders and enveloped his countenance in shadow so that only the fires of his two fixed eyes could be seen it was by chance that he was at the feast his father having domiciled him with the barker family according to the custom by which kings used to send their children into the households of the great in order to pave the way for alliances but nar havas had lodged there for six months without having hitherto seen salambo and now seated on his heels with his head brushing the handles of his javelins he was watching her with dilated nostrils like a leopard crouching among the bamboos on the other side of the tables was a libyan of colossal stature and with short black curly hair he had retained only his military jacket the brass plates of which were tearing the purple of the couch a necklace of silver moons was tangled in his hairy breast his face was stained with splashes of blood he was leaning on his left elbow with a smile on his large open mouth salambo had abandoned the sacred rhythm with a woman's subtlety she was simultaneously employing all the dialects of the barbarians in order to appease their anger to the greeks she spoke greek then she turned to the ligurians the companions the negroes and listening to her each one found again in her voice the sweetness of his native land she now carried away by the memories of carthage sang of the ancient battles against rome they applauded she kindled at the gleaming of the naked swords and cried aloud with outstretched arms her lyre fell she was silent and pressing both hands upon her heart she remained for some minutes with closed eyelids enjoying the agitation of all these men mato the libyan leaned over towards her involuntarily she approached him and impelled by grateful pride poured him a long stream of wine into a golden cup in order to conciliate the army drink she said he took the cup and was carrying it to his lips when a gaul the same that had been hurt by gisco struck him on the shoulder while in a jovial manner he gave utterance to pleasantries in his native tongue 
Spendidos was not far off, and he volunteered to interpret them. Speak, said Mato. The gods protect you. You are going to become rich. When will the nuptials be? What nuptials? Yours, for with us, said the Gaul, when a woman gives a drink to a soldier, it means that she offers him her couch. He had not finished when Nar Havas, with a bound, drew a javelin from his girdle, and leaning his right foot upon the edge of the table, hurled it against Mato. The javelin whistled among the cups, and piercing the Libyan's arm, pinned it so firmly to the cloth that the shaft quivered in the air. Mato quickly plucked it out, but he was weaponless and naked, at last he lifted the overladen table with both arms and flung it against nar havas into the very centre of the crowd that rushed between them the soldiers and nomedians pressed together so closely that they were unable to draw their swords mato advanced dealing great blows with his head when he raised it nar havas had disappeared he sought for him with his eyes salambo also was gone then directing his looks to the palace he perceived the red door with the black cross closing far above and he darted away they saw him run between the prows of the galleys and then reappear along the three staircases until he reached the red door against which he dashed his whole body. Panting, he leaned against the wall to keep himself from falling. But a man had followed him, and through the darkness, for the lights of the feast were hidden by the corner of the palace, he recognized Spendius. "'Be gone,' said he the slave without replying began to tear his tunic with his teeth then kneeling beside mato he tenderly took his arm and felt it in the shadow to discover the wound by a ray of the moon which was then gliding between the clouds spendius perceived a gaping wound in the middle of the arm he rolled the piece of stuff about it but the other said irritably leave me leave me oh no replied the slave you released me from the ergastulum i am yours you are my master command me matto walked around the terrace brushing against the walls he strained his ears at every step glancing down into the silent apartments through the spaces between the gilded reeds at last he stopped with a look of despair listen said the slave to him oh do not despise me for my feebleness i have lived in the palace i can wind like a viper through the walls come in the ancestor's chamber there is an ingot of gold beneath every flagstone an underground path leads to their tombs well what matters it said matto spendius was silent they were on the terrace a huge mass of shadows stretched before them appearing as if it contained vague accumulations like the gigantic billows of a black and petrified ocean but a luminous bar rose towards the east far below on the left the canals of megara were beginning to stripe the vendor of the gardens with their winding of white the conical roofs of the heptagonal temples the staircases terraces and ramparts were being carved by degrees upon the paleness of the dawn and a girdle of white foam rocked around the carthaginian peninsula while the emerald sea appeared as if it were curdled in the freshness of the morning then as the rosy sky grew larger the lofty houses bending over the sloping soil reared and massed themselves like a herd of black goats 
coming down from the mountains the deserted streets lengthened the palm trees that topped the walls here and there were motionless the brimming cisterns seemed like silver bucklers lost in the courts the beacon on the promontory of hermaeum was beginning to grow pale the horses of eskmoun on the very summit of the acropolis in the cypress wood feeling that the light was coming placed their hoofs on the marble parapet and night towards the sun it appeared as spendius raised his arms with a cry everything stirred in a diffusion of red for the god as if he were rendering himself now poured full raid upon carthage the golden rain of his veins the beak of the galleys sparkled the roof of Camon appeared to be all in flames while far within the temples whose doors were opening glimmerings of light could be seen large chariots arriving from the country rolled their wheels over the flagstones in the street dromedaries baggage laden came down the ramps money-changers raced the penthouses of their shops at the crossways storks took to flight while sails fluttered in the wood of tanit might be heard the tambourines of the sacred courtesans and the furnaces for baking the clay coffins were beginning to smoke on the mappalian point spendius leaned over the terrace his teeth chattered and he repeated ah yes yes master i understand why you scorned the pillage of the house just now mato was as if he had just been awakened by the hissing of his voice and did not seem to understand spendius resumed ah what riches and the men who possess them have not even the steel to defend them then pointing with his right arm outstretched to some of the populace who were crawling on the sand outside the mole to look for gold dust see he said to him the republic is like these wretches bending on the brink of the ocean she buries her greedy arms in every shore and the noise of the billows so fills her ear that she cannot hear behind her the tread of a master's heel he drew mato to quite the other end of the terrace and showed him the garden where in the soldiers swords hanging on the trees were like mirrors in the sun but here there are strong men whose hatred is roused and nothing binds them to carthage neither families oaths nor gods mato remained leaning against the wall spendius came close and continued in a low voice do you understand me soldier we should walk purple clad like satraps we should bathe in perfumes and i should in turn have slaves are you not weary of sleeping on hard ground of drinking the vinegar of the camps and of continually hearing the trumpet but you will rest later will you not when they pull off your cuirass to cast your corpse to the vultures or perhaps blind lame and weak you will go leaning on a stick from door to door to tell of your youth to pickle sellers and little children remember all the injustice of your chiefs the campings in the snow the marchings in the sun the tyrannies of discipline and the everlasting menace of the cross and after all this misery they have given you a necklace of honour as they hang a girdle of bells around the breast of an ass to deafen it on its journey and to prevent it from feeling fatigue a man like you braver than pyrrhus if only you had wished it ah how happy will you be in large cool halls with the sound of lyres lying on flowers with women and buffoons do not tell me that the enterprise is impossible have not the mercenaries already possessed regium and other forty-five places in italy who is to prevent you 
hamilcar is away the people execrate the rich gisco can do nothing with the cowards who surround him command them carthage is ours let us fall upon it no said matto the curse of moloch weighs upon me i felt it in her eyes and just now i saw a black ram retreating in a temple looking around him he added but where is she then spendius understood that a great disquiet possessed him and did not venture to speak again the trees behind them were still smoking half-burnt carcasses of apes dropped from their blackened boughs from time to time into the midst of the dishes drunken soldiers snored open-mouthed by the sight of the corpses and those who were not asleep lowered their heads dazzled by the light of day the trampled soil was hidden beneath splashes of red the elephants poised their bleeding trunks between the stakes of their pens in the open granaries might be seen sacks of spilled wheat below the gate was a thick line of chariots which had been heaped up by the barbarians and the peacocks perched in the cedars were spreading their tails and beginning to utter their cry matos immobility however astonished spendius he was even paler than he had recently been and he was following something on the horizon with fixed eyeballs and with both fists resting on the edge of the terrace spendius crouched down and so at last discovered at what he was gazing in the distance a golden speck was turning in the dust of the road to utica it was the nave of a chariot drawn by two mules a slave was running at the end of the pole and holding them by the bridle two women were seated in the chariot the manes of the animals were puffed between the ears after the persian fashion beneath a network of blue pearls spendius recognized them and restrained a cry a large veil floated behind in the wind end of chapter one part two Chapter Two, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Two, At Sicca. Two days afterwards, the mercenaries left Carthage. They had each received a piece of gold on the condition that they should go into camp at Sicca, and they had been told with all sorts of caresses you are the saviours of carthage but you would starve it if you remained here it would become insolvent withdraw the republic will be grateful to you later for all this condescension we are going to levy taxes immediately your pay shall be in full and galleys shall be equipped to take you back to your native lands they did not know how to reply to all this talk these men accustomed as they were to war were wearied by residence in a town there was difficulty in convincing them and the people mounted the walls to see them go away they defiled through the street of Camon and the Serta gate pell-mell arches with hoplites captains with soldiers lusitanians with greeks they marched with a bold step rattling their heavy cothurni on the paving stones their armour was dented by the catapult and their faces blackened by the sunburn of battles hoarse cries issued from their thick beards their tattered coats of mail flapped upon the pommels of their swords 
and through the holes in the brass might be seen their naked limbs as frightful as engines of war sarisay axes spears felt caps and bronze helmets all swung together with a single motion they filled the street thickly enough to have made the walls crack and the long mass of armed soldiers overflowed between the lofty bitumen smeared houses six stories high behind their gratings of iron or reed the women with veiled heads silently watched the barbarians pass the terraces fortifications and walls were hidden beneath the crowd of carthaginians who were dressed in garments of black the sailors tunics showed like drops of blood among the dark multitude and nearly naked children whose skin shone beneath their copper bracelets gesticulated in the foliage of the columns or amid the branches of a palm tree some of the ancients were posted on the platform of the towers and people did not know why a personage with a long beard stood thus in a dreamy attitude here and there he appeared in the distance against the background of the sky vague as a phantom and motionless as stone all however were oppressed with the same anxiety it was feared that the barbarians seeing themselves so strong might take a fancy to stay but they were leaving with so much good faith that the carthaginians grew bold and mingled with the soldiers they overwhelmed them with protestations and embraces some with exaggerated politeness and audacious hypocrisy even sought to induce them not to leave the city they threw perfumes flowers and pieces of silver to them they gave them amulets to avert sickness but they had spit upon them three times to attract death or had enclosed jackal's hair within them to put cowardice into their hearts aloud they invoked milkarth's favour and in a whisper his curse then came the mob of baggage beasts of burden and stragglers the sick groaned on the backs of dromedaries while others limped along leaning on broken pikes the drunkards carried leathern bottles and the greedy quarters of meat cakes fruits butter wrapped in fig leaves and snow in linen bags some were to be seen with parasols in their hands and parrots on their shoulders they had mastiffs gazelles and panthers following behind them women of libyan race mounted on asses inveighed against the negresses who had forsaken the lupanaria of malacca for the soldiers many of them were suckling children suspended on their bosoms by leathern throngs the mules were goaded out at the point of the sword their backs bending beneath the load of tents while there were numbers of saving men and water-carriers emaciated jaundiced with fever and filthy with vermin the scum of the carthaginian populace who had attached themselves to the barbarians when they had passed the gates were shut behind them but the people did not descend from the walls the army soon spread over the breadth of the isthmus it parted into unequal masses then the lances appeared like tall blades of grass and finally all was lost in a train of dust those of the soldiers who looked back towards carthage could now only see its long walls with their vacant battlements cut out against the edge of the sky then the barbarians heard a great shout they thought that some from among them for they did not know their own number had remained in the town and were amusing themselves by pillaging a temple they laughed a great deal at the idea of this and then continued their journey 
they were rejoiced to find themselves as in former days marching all together in the open country and some of the greeks sang the old song of the marmotines with my lance and sword i plough and reap i am master of the house the disarmed man falls at my feet and calls me lord and great king they shouted they leaped the merriest began to tell stories the time of their miseries was past as they arrived at tunis some of them remarked that a troop of balearic slingers was missing they were doubtless not far off and no further heed was paid to them some went to lodge in the houses others camped at the foot of the walls and the townspeople came out to chat with the soldiers during the whole night fires were seen burning on the horizon in the direction of carthage the light stretched like giant torches across the motionless lake no one in the army could tell what festival was being celebrated on the following day the barbarians passed through a region that was covered with cultivation the domains of the patricians succeeded one another along the border of the route channels of water flowed through woods of palm there were long green lines of olive trees rose-coloured vapours floated in the gorges of the hills while blue mountains reared themselves behind a warm wind was blowing chameleons were crawling on the broad leaves of the cactus the barbarians slackened their speed they marched on in isolated detachments or lagged behind one another at long intervals they ate grapes along the margin of the vines they lay on the grass and gazed with stupefaction upon the large artificially twisted horns of the oxen the sheep clothed with skins to protect their wool the furrows crossing one another so as to form lozenges and the ploughshares like ships anchors with the pomegranate trees that were watered with silphium such wealth of the soil and such inventions of wisdom dazzled them in the evening they stretched themselves on the tents without unfolding them and thought with regret of hamilcar's feast as they fell asleep with their faces towards the stars in the middle of the following day they halted on the bank of a river amid clumps of rose bays then they quickly threw aside lances bucklers and belts they bathed with shouts and drew water in their helmets while others drank lying flat on their stomachs and all in the midst of the beasts of burden whose baggage was slipping from them spendius who was seated on a dromedary stolen in hamilcar's parks perceived matho at a distance with his arm hanging against his breast his head bare and his face bent down giving his mule drink and watching the water flow spendius immediately ran through the crowd calling him master master matho gave him but scant thanks for his blessings but spendius paid no heed to this and began to march behind him from time to time turning restless glances in the direction of carthage he was the son of a greek retour and a companion prostitute he had at first grown rich by dealing in women then ruined by a shipwreck he had made war against the romans with the herdsmen of samnium he had been taken and had escaped he had been retaken and had worked in the carries panted in the vapour baths shrieked under torture passed through the hands of many masters and experienced every frenzy at last one day in despair he had flung himself into the sea from the top of a trireme 
where he was working at the oar some of hamilcar's sailors had picked him up when at the point of death and had brought him to the ergastulum of megara at carthage but as fugitives were to be given back to the romans he had taken advantage of the confusion to fly with the soldiers during the whole of the march he remained near matto he brought him food assisted him to dismount and spread a carpet in the evening beneath his head matto at last was touched by these attentions and by degrees unlocked his lips he had been born in the gulf of Syrtis. his father had taken him on a pilgrimage to the temple of ammon then he had hunted elephants in the forests of the garamantes afterwards he had entered the service of carthage he had been appointed tetrarch at the capture of drepanum the republic owned him four horses twenty-three medimni of wheat and a winter's pay he feared the gods and wished to die in his native land spendius spoke to him of his travels and of the peoples and temples that he had visited he knew many things he could make sandals bore spears and nets he could tame wild beasts and could cook fish sometimes he would interrupt himself and utter a hoarse cry from the depths of his throat matto's mule would quicken his pace and others would hasten after them and then spendius would begin again though still torn with agony this subsided at last on the evening of the fourth day they were marching side by side to the right of the army on the side of a hill below them stretched the plain lost in the vapours of the night the lines of soldiers also were defiling below making undulations in the shade from time to time these passed over eminences lit up by the moon then stars would tremble on the points of the pikes the helmets would glimmer for an instant all would disappear and others would come on continually startled flocks bleated in the distance and a something of infinite sweetness seemed to sink upon the earth spendius with his head thrown back and his eyes half closed inhaled the freshness of the wind with great sighs he spread out his arms moving his fingers that he might the better feel the caresses that streamed over his body hopes of vengeance came back to him and transported him he pressed his hands upon his mouth to check his sobs and half swooning with intoxication let go the halter of his dromedary which was proceeding with long regular steps matto had relapsed into his former melancholy his legs hung down to the ground and the grass made a continuous rustling as it beat against his cothurni the journey however spread itself out without ever coming to an end at the extremity of a plain they would always reach a round-shaped plateau then they would descend again into a valley and the mountains which seemed to block up the horizon would in proportion as they were approached glide as it were from their positions from time to time a river would appear amid the venture of tamarisks to lose itself at the turning of the hills sometimes a huge rock would tower aloft like the prow of a vessel or the pedestal of some vanished colossus at regular intervals they met with little quadrangular temples which served as stations for the pilgrims who repaired to sicca they were closed like tombs the libyans struck great blows upon the doors to have them opened but no one inside responded then the cultivation became more rare they suddenly entered upon belts of sand bristling with thorny thickets 
flocks of sheep were browsing among the stones a woman with a blue fleece about her waist was watching them she fled screaming when she saw the soldiers pikes among the rocks they were marching through a kind of large passage bordered by two chains of reddish-coloured hillocks when their nostrils were greeted with a nauseous odour and they thought that they could see something extraordinary on the top of a corrupt tree a lion's head reared itself above the leaves they ran thither it was a lion with his four limbs fastened to a cross like a criminal his huge muzzle fell upon his breast and his two forepaws half hidden beneath the abundance of his mane were spread out wide like the wings of a bird his ribs stood severally out beneath his distended skin his hind legs which were nailed against each other were raised somewhat and the black blood flowing through his hair had collected in stalactites at the end of his tail which hung down perfectly straight along the cross the soldiers made merry around they called him consul and roman citizen and threw pebbles into his eyes to drive away the nuts but a hundred paces further on they saw two more and then there suddenly appeared a long file of crossed bearing lions some had been so long dead that nothing was left against the wood but the remains of their skeletons others which were half eaten away had their jaws twisted into horrible grimaces there were some enormous ones the shafts of the crosses bent beneath them and they swayed in the wind while bands of crows wheeled ceaselessly in the air above their heads it was thus that the carthaginian peasants avenged themselves when they captured a wild beast they hoped to terrify the others by such an example the barbarians ceased their laughter and were lost in amazement what people is this they thought that amuses itself by crucifying lions they were besides especially the men of the north vaguely uneasy troubled and already sick they tore their hands with the darts of the aloes great mosquitoes buzzed in their ears and dysentery was breaking out in the army they were weary and not yet seeing sicca they were afraid of losing themselves and of reaching the desert the country of sands and terrors many even were unwilling to advance further others started back to carthage at last on the seventh day after following the base of a mountain for a long time they turned abruptly to the right and there then appeared a line of walls resting on white rocks and blending with them suddenly the entire city rose blue yellow and white veils moved on the walls in the redness of the evening these were the priestesses of tanith who had hastened hither to receive the men they stood ranged along the rampart striking tambourines playing lyres and shaking crotala while the rays of the sun setting behind them in the mountains of numidia shot between the strings of their lyres over which their naked arms were stretched at intervals their instruments would become suddenly still and a cry would break forth strident precipitate frenzied continuous a sort of barking which they made by striking both corners of the mouth with the tongue others more motionless than the sphinx rested on their elbows with their chins on their hands and darted their great black eyes upon the army as it ascended although sicca was a sacred town it could not hold such a multitude the temple alone with its appurtenances occupied half of it 
accordingly the barbarians established themselves at their ease on the plain those who were disciplined in regular troops and the rest according to nationality or their own fancy the greeks arranged their tents of skin in parallel lines the iberians placed their canvas pavilions in a circle the gauls made themselves huts of planks the libyans cabins of dry stones while the negroes with their nails hollowed out trenches in the sand to sleep in many not knowing where to go wandered about among the baggage and at nightfall lay down in their ragged mantles on the ground the plain which was wholly bounded by mountains expanded around them here and there a palm tree leaned over a sand hill and pines and oaks flecked the sides of the precipices sometimes the rain of a storm would hang from the sky like a long scarf while the country everywhere was still covered with azure and serenity then a warm wind would drive before it tornadoes of dust and a stream would descend in cascades from the heights of sicca where with its roofing of gold on its columns of brass rose the temple of the carthaginian venus the mistress of the land she seemed to fill it with her soul in such convulsions of the soil such alternations of temperature and such plays of light would she manifest the extravagance of her might with the beauty of her eternal smile the mountains at their summits were crescent-shaped others were like women's bosoms presenting their swelling breasts and the barbarians felt a heaviness that was full of delight weighing down their fatigues spendius had bought a slave with the money brought him by his dromedary the whole day long he lay asleep stretched before matto's tent often he would awake thinking in his dream that he heard the whistling of the thongs with a smile he would pass his hands over the scars on his legs at the place where the fetters had long been worn and then he would fall asleep again matsu accepted his companionship and when he went out spendius would escort him like a lictor with a long sword on his thigh or perhaps matsu would rest his arm carelessly on the other's shoulder for spendius was small one evening when they were passing together through the streets in the camp they perceived some men covered with white cloaks among them was narhavas the prince of the numidians matto started your sword he cried i will kill him not yet said spendius restraining him narhavas was already advancing towards him he kissed both thumbs in token of alliance showing nothing of the anger which he had experienced at the drunkenness of the feast then he spoke at length against carthage but did not say what brought him among the barbarians was it to betray them or else the republic spendius asked himself and as he expected to profit by every disorder he felt grateful to narhavas for the future perfidies of which he suspected him the chief of the numidians remained among the mercenaries he appeared desirous of attaching matto to himself he sent him fat goats gold dust and ostrich feathers the libyan who was amazed at such caresses was in doubt whether to respond to them or to become exasperated at them but spendius pacified him and matto allowed himself to be ruled by the slave remaining ever irresolute and in an unconquerable torpor like those who have once taken a draught of which they are to die one morning when all three went out lion-hunting narhavas concealed a dagger in his cloak 
spendius kept continually behind him and when they returned the dagger had not been drawn another time narhavas took them a long way off as far as the boundaries of his kingdom they came to a narrow gorge and narhavas smiled as he declared that he had forgotten the way spendius found it again but most frequently matho would go off at sunrise as melancholy as an augur and wander about the country he would stretch himself on the sand and remain there motionless until the evening he consulted all the soothsayers in the army one after the other those who watch the trail of serpents those who read the stars and those who breathe upon the ashes of the dead he swallowed galbanum cecily and viper's venom which freezes the heart negro women singing barbarous words in the moonlight pricked at the skin of his forehead with golden stylets he loaded himself with necklaces and charms he invoked in turn bal kamun moloch the seven kabiri tanith and the venus of the greeks he engraved a name upon a copper plate and buried it in the sand at the threshold of his tent spendius used to hear him groaning and talking to himself one night he went in end of chapter two part one Chapter Two, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Two, Part Two. Matto, as naked as a corpse, was lying on a lion's skin, flat on his stomach, with his face in both his hands. A hanging lamp lit up his armor which was hooked on to the tent-pole above his head you are suffering said the slave to him what is the matter with you answer me and he shook him by the shoulder calling him several times master master at last matto lifted large troubled eyes towards him listen he said in a low voice and with a finger on his lips it is the wrath of the gods hamilcar's daughter pursues me i am afraid of her spendius he pressed himself close against his breast like a child terrified by a phantom speak to me i am sick i want to get well i have tried everything but you you perhaps know some stronger gods or some resistless invocation for what purpose asked spendius striking his head with both his fists he replied to rid me of her then speaking to himself with long pauses he said i am no doubt the victim of some holocaust which she has promised to the gods she holds me fast by a chain which people cannot see if i walk it is that she is advancing when i stop she is resting her eyes burn me i hear her voice she encompasses me she penetrates me it seems to me that she has become my soul and yet between us there are as it were the invisible billows of a boundless ocean she is far away and quite inaccessible the splendour of her beauty forms a cloud of light around her and at times i think that i have never seen her that she does not exist and that it is all a dream matho wept thus in the darkness the barbarians were sleeping spendius as he looked at him recalled the younger man who once used to entreat him with golden cases in their hands 
when he led his herd of courtesans through the towns a feeling of pity moved him and he said be strong my master summon your will and beseech the gods no more for they turn not aside at the cries of men weeping like a coward and you are not humiliated that a woman can cause you so much suffering am i a child said matto do you think that i am moved by their faces and songs we kept them at drepanum to sweep out our stables i have embraced them amid assaults beneath falling ceilings and while the catapult was still vibrating but she spendius she the slave interrupted him if she were not hanno's daughter no cried matto she has nothing in common with the daughters of other men have you seen her great eyes beneath her great eyebrows like suns beneath triumphal arches think when she appears all the torches grow pale her naked breast shone here and there through the diamonds of her necklace behind her you perceived as it were the odour of a temple and her whole being emitted something that was sweeter than wine and more terrible than death she walked however and then she stopped he remained gaping with his head cast down and his eyeballs fixed but i want her i need her i am dying for her i am transported with frenzied joy at the thought of clasping her in my arms and yet i hate her spendius i should like to beat her what is to be done i have a mind to sell myself and become her slave you have been that you were able to get sight of her speak to me of her every night she ascends to the terrace of her palace does she not ah the stones must quiver beneath her sandals and the stars bend down to see her he fell back in a perfect frenzy with a rattling in his throat like a wounded bull then matto sang he pursued into the forest the female monster whose tail undulated over the dead leaves like a silver brook and with lingering tones he imitated salambo's voice while his outspread hands were held like two light hands on the strings of a lyre to all the consolations offered by spendius he repeated the same words their nights were spent in these wailings and exhortations matto sought to drown his thoughts in wine after his fits of drunkenness he was more melancholy still he tried to divert himself at huckle bones and lost the gold plates of his necklace one by one he had himself taken to the servants of the goddess but he came down the hill sobbing like one returning from a funeral spendius on the contrary became more bold and gay he was to be seen in the leafy taverns discoursing in the midst of the soldiers he mended old cuirasses he juggled with daggers he went and gathered herbs in the fields for the sick he was facetious dexterous full of invention and talk the barbarians grew accustomed to his services and he came to be loved by them however they were awaiting an ambassador from carthage to bring the mules laden with baskets of gold and ever beginning the same calculation over again they would trace figures with their fingers in the sand every one was arranging his life beforehand they would have concubines slaves lands other intended to bury their treasure or risk it on a vessel but their tempers were provoked by want of employment there were constant disputes between horse soldiers and foot soldiers barbarians and greeks while there was a never-ending din of shrill female voices every day men came flocking in nearly naked and with grass on their heads to protect them from the sun 
they were the debtors of the rich carthaginians and had been forced to till the lands of the latter but had escaped libyans came pouring in with peasants ruined by the taxes outlaws and malefactors then the horde of traders all the dealers in wine and oil who were furious at not being paid laid the blame upon the republic spendius disclaimed against it soon the provisions ran low and there was talk of advancing in a body upon carthage and calling in the romans one evening at supper-time dull cracked sounds were heard approaching and something red appeared in the distance among the undulations of the soil it was a large purple litter adorned with ostrich feathers at the corners chains of crystal and garlands of pearls beat against the closed hangings it was followed by camels sounding the great bells that hung at their breasts and having around them horsemen clad from shoulder to heel in armour of golden scales they halted three hundred paces from the camp to take their round bucklers broad swords and boeotian helmets out of the cases which they carried behind their saddles some remained with the camels while the others resumed their march at last the ensigns of the republic appeared that is to say staffs of blue wood terminated in horses heads on fur cones the barbarians all rose with applause the women rushed towards the guards of the legion and kissed their feet the litter advanced on the shoulders of twelve negroes who walked in step with short rapid strides they went at random to right or left being embarrassed by the tent ropes the animals that were straying about or the tripods where food was being cooked sometimes a fat hand laden with rings would partially open the litter and a hoarse voice would utter loud reproaches then the bearers would stop and take a different direction through the camp but the purple curtains were raised and a human head impassable and bloated was seen resting on a large pillow the eyebrows which were like arches of ebony met each other at the points golden dust sparkled in the frizzled hair and the face was so wan that it looked as if it had been powdered with marble raspings the rest of the body was concealed beneath the fleeces which filled the litter in the man so reclining the soldiers recognized the suffered hanno he whose slackness had assisted to lose the battle of the aegean islands and as to his victory at the hecatompylos over the libyans even if he did behave with clemency thought the barbarians it was owing to cupidity for he had sold all the captives on his own account although he had reported their deaths to the republic after seeking for some time a convenient place from which to harangue the soldiers he made a sign the litter stopped and hanno supported by two slaves put his tottering feet to the ground he wore boots of black felt strewn with silver moons his legs were swathed in bands like those wrapped about a mummy and the flesh crept through the crossings of the linen his stomach came out beyond the scarlet jacket which covered his thighs the folds of his neck fell down to his breast like the dewlaps of an ox his tunic which was painted with flowers was bursting at the armpits he wore a scarf a girdle and an ample black cloak with laced double sleeves but the abundance of his garments his great necklace of blue stones his golden clasps and heavy earrings only rendered his deformity still more hideous 
he might have been taken for some big idol rough hewn in a block of stone for the pale leprosy which was spread over his whole body gave him the appearance of an inert thing his nose however which was hooked like a vulture's beak was violently dilated to breathe in the air and his little eyes with their gummed lashes shone with a hard and metallic lustre he held a spatula of aloe wood in his hand wherewith to scratch his skin at last two heralds sounded their silver horns the tumult subsided and hanno commenced to speak he began with an eulogy of the gods and the republic the barbarians ought to congratulate themselves on having served it but they must show themselves more reasonable times were hard and if a master has only three olives is it not right that he should keep two for himself the old suffet mingled his speech in this way with prophets and apologues nodding his head the while to solicit some approval he spoke in punic and those surrounding him the most alert who had hastened thither without their arms were campanians gauls and greeks so that no one in the crowd understood him hanno perceiving this stopped and reflected swaying himself heavily from one leg to the other it occurred to him to call the captains together then his heralds shouted the order in greek the language which from the time of xantippus had been used for commands in the carthaginian armies the guards dispersed the mob of soldiers with strokes of the whip and the captains of the spartan phalanxes and the chiefs of the barbarian cohorts soon arrived with the insignia of their rank and in the armour of their nation night had fallen a great tumult was spreading through the plain fires were burning here and there and the soldiers kept going from one to another asking what the matter was and why the suffet did not distribute the money he was setting the infinite burdens of the republic before the captains her treasury was empty the tribute to rome was crushing her we are quite at a loss what to do she is much to be pitied from time to time he would rub his limbs with his aloe wood spatula or perhaps he would break off to drink a tisane made of the ashes of a weasel and asparagus boiled in vinegar from a silver cup handed to him by a slave then he would wipe his lips with a scarlet napkin and resume what used to be worth a shekel of silver is now worth three shekels of gold while the cultivated lands which were abundant during the war bring in nothing our purpura fisheries are nearly gone and even pearls are becoming exorbitant we have scarcely unguents enough for the service of the gods and for the things of the table i shall say nothing about them it is a calamity for want of galleys we are without spices and it is a matter of great difficulty to procure sylphium on account of the rebellions on the Cyrenian frontier sicily where so many slaves used to be had is now closed to us only yesterday i gave more money for a bantha and four scullions than i used at one time to give for a pair of elephants he unrolled a long piece of papyrus and without omitting a single figure read all the expenses that the government had incurred so much for repairing the temples for paving the streets for the construction of vessels for the coral fisheries for the enlargement of the syssitia and for engines in the mines in the country of the cantabrians but the captains understood punic as little as the soldiers although the mercenaries saluted one another in that language it was usual to place a few carthaginian officers in the barbarian armies to act as interpreters 
after the war they had concealed themselves through fear of vengeance and hamu had not thought of taking them with him his hollow voice too was lost in the wind the greeks girthed in their iron waistbelts strained their ears as they strove to guess at his words while the mountaineers covered with furs like bears looked at him with distrust or yawned as they leaned on their brass-nailed clubs the heedless gauls sneered as they shook their lofty heads of hair and the men of the desert listened motionless cowled in their garments of grey wool others kept coming up behind the guards crushed by the mob staggered on their horses the negroes held out burning fir branches at arm's length and the big carthaginian mounted on a grassy hillock continued his harangue the barbarians however were growing impatient murmuring arose and every one apostrophized him hanno gesticulated with his spatula and those who wished the others to be quiet shouted still more loudly thereby adding to the din suddenly a man of mean appearance bounded to hanno's feet snatched up a herald's trumpet blew it and spendius for it was he announced that he was going to say something of importance at this declaration which was rapidly uttered in five different languages greek latin gallic libyan and balearic the captains half laughing and half surprised replied speak speak spendius hesitated he trembled at last addressing the libyans who were the most numerous he said to them you have all heard this man's horrible threats hanno made no exclamation therefore he did not understand libyan and to carry on the experiment spendius repeated the same phrase in the other barbarian dialects they looked at one another in astonishment then as by a tacit agreement and believing perhaps that they had understood they bent their heads in token of assent then spendius began in vehement tones he said first that all the gods of the other nations were but dreams beside the gods of carthage he called you cowards thieves liars dogs and the sons of dogs but for you he said that the republic would not be forced to pay excessive tribute to the romans and through your excesses you have drained it of perfumes aromatics slaves and sylphium for you are in the league with the nomads of the Cyrenian frontier but the guilty shall be punished he read the enumeration of their torments they shall be made to work at the paving of the streets and the equipment of the vessels at the adornment of the sicitia while the rest shall be sent to scrape the earth in the mines in the country of the cantabrians spendius repeated the same statements to the gauls greeks companions and balearians the mercenaries recognizing several of the proper names which had met their ears were convinced that he was accurately reporting the suffet's speech a few cried out to him you lie but their voices were drowned in the tumult of the rest spendius added have you not seen that he has left a reserve of his horse soldiers outside the camp at a given signal they will hasten hither to slay you all the barbarians turned in that direction and as the crowd was then scattering there appeared in the midst of them and advancing with the slowness of a phantom a human being bent lean entirely naked and covered down to his flanks with long hair bristling with dried leaves dust and thorns about his loins and his knees he had wisps of straw and linen rags his soft and earthy skin hung on his emaciated limbs like tatters on dried boughs 
his hands trembled with a continuous quivering and as he walked he leaned on a staff of olive wood he reached the negroes who were bearing the torches his pale gums were displayed in a sort of idiotic titter his large scared eyes gazed upon the crowd of barbarians around him but uttering a cry of terror he threw himself behind them shielding himself with their bodies there they are there they are he stammered out pointing to the suffet's guards who were motionless in their glittering armour their horses dazzled by the light of the torches which crackled in the darkness were pouring the ground the human spectre struggled and howled they have killed them at these words which were screamed in balearic some balearians came up and recognized him without answering them he repeated yes all killed all crushed like grapes the fine young men the slingers my companions and yours they gave him wine to drink and he wept then he launched forth into speech spendius could scarcely repress his joy as he explained the horrors related by zarxas to the greeks and libyans he could not believe them so appropriately did they come in the balearians grew pale as they learned how their companions had perished it was a troop of three hundred slingers who had disembarked the evening before and had on that day slept too late when they reached the square of Camon, the barbarians were gone and they found themselves defenceless their clay bullets having been put on the camels with the rest of the baggage they were allowed to advance into the street of sartep as far as the brass sheathed oaken gate then the people with a single impulse had sprung upon them indeed the soldiers remembered a great shout spendius who was flying at the head of the columns had not heard it then the corpses were placed in the arms of the partake gods that fringed the temple of Camon. they were upbraided with all the crimes of the mercenaries their gluttony their thefts their impiety their disdain and the murder of the fishes in salambo's garden their bodies were subjected to infamous mutilations the priests burnt their hair in order to torture their souls they were hung up in pieces in the meat shops some even buried their teeth in them and in the evening funeral piles were kindled at the crossways to finish them these were the flames that had gleamed from a distance across the lake but some houses having taken fire any dead or dying that remained were speedily thrown over the walls saxas had remained among the reeds of the edge of the lake until the following day then he had wandered about through the country seeking for the army by the footprints in the dust in the morning he hid himself in caves in the evening he resumed his march with his bleeding wounds famished sick living on roots and carrion at last one day he perceived lances on the horizon and he had followed them for his reason was disturbed through his terrors and miseries the indignation of the soldiers restrained so long as he was speaking broke forth like a tempest they were going to massacre the gods together with the suffet a few interposed saying that they ought to hear him and know at least whether they should be paid then they all cried our money hanno replied that he had brought it they ran to the outposts and the suffet's baggage arrived in the midst of the tents pressed forward by the barbarians without waiting for the slaves they quickly unfastened the baskets in them they found hyacinth ropes sponges scrapers brushes perfumes and antimony pencils for painting the eyes all belonging to the guards who were rich men and accustomed to such refinements next they uncovered a large bronze tub on a camel 
it belonged to the suffet who had it for bathing in during his journey for he had taken all manner of precautions even going so far as to bring caged weasels from hecatompylus which were burnt alive to make his tisane but as his malady gave him a great appetite there were also many comestibles and many wines pickle meats and fishes preserved in honey with little pots of comagene or melted goose fat covered with snow and chopped straw there was a considerable supply of it the more they opened the baskets the more they found and laughter arose like conflicting waves as to the pay of the mercenaries it nearly filled two esparto grass baskets there were even visible in one of them some of the leathern discs which the republic used to economize its specie and as the barbarians appeared greatly surprised hanno told them that their accounts being very difficult the ancients had not had leisure to examine them meanwhile they had sent them this then everything was in disorder and confusion mules serving men litter provisions and baggage the soldiers took the coin in the bags to stone hanno with great difficulty he was able to mount an ass and he fled clinging to its hair howling weeping shaken bruised and calling down the curse of all the gods upon the army his broad necklace of precious stones rebounded up to his ears his cloak which was too long and which trailed behind him he kept on with his teeth and from afar the barbarians shouted at him be gone coward pig sink of moloch sweat your gold and your plague quicker quicker the routed escort galloped beside him but the fury of the barbarians did not abate they remembered that several of them who had set out for carthage had not returned no doubt they had been killed so much injustice exasperated them and they began to pull up the stakes of their tents to roll up their cloaks and to bridle their horses every one took his helmet and sword and instantly all was ready those who had no arms rushed into the woods to cut staves day dawned the people of sicca were roused and stirring in the streets they are going to carthage said they and the rumour of this soon spread through the country from every path and every ravine men arose shepherds were seen running down from the mountains then when the barbarians had set out spendius circled the plain riding on a punic stallion and attended by his slave who led a third horse a single tent remained spendius entered it up master rise we are departing and where are you going asked matho to carthage cried spendius matho bounded upon the horse which the slave held at the door End of chapter two Chapter Three of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Three, Salambo. The moon was rising just above the waves, and on the town, which was still wrapped in darkness, there glittered white and luminous specks the pole of a chariot a dangling rag of linen the corner of a wall or a golden necklace on the bosom of a god the glass balls on the roofs of the temples beamed like great diamonds here and there but ill-defined ruins piles of black earth 
and gardens formed deeper masses in the gloom and below malka fishermen's nets stretched from one house to another like gigantic bats spreading their wings the grinding of the hydraulic wheels which conveyed water to the highest stories of the palaces was no longer heard and the camels lying ostrich fashion on their stomachs rested peacefully in the middle of the terraces the porters were asleep in the streets on the thresholds of the houses the shadows of the colossuses stretched across the deserted squares occasionally in the distance the smoke of a still-burning sacrifice would escape through the bronze tiling and the heavy breeze would waft the odours of aromatics blended with the scent of the sea and the exhalation from the sun-heated walls the motionless waves shone around carthage for the moon was spreading her light at once upon the mountain-circled gulf and upon the lake of tunis where flamingos formed long rose-coloured lines amid the banks of sand while further on beneath the catacombs the great salt lagoon shimmered like a piece of silver the blue vault of heaven sank on the horizon in one direction into the dustiness of the plains and in the other into the mists of the sea and on the summit of the acropolis the pyramidical cypress trees fringing the temple of eskmoun swayed murmuring like the regular waves that beat slowly along the mole beneath the ramparts salambo ascended to the terrace of her palace supported by a female slave who carried an iron dish filled with live coals in the middle of the terrace there was a small ivory bed covered with lynx skins and cushions made with the feathers of the parrot a fatidical animal consecrated to the gods and at the four corners rose four long perfuming pans filled with nard incense cinnamonum and myrrh the slave lit the perfumes salambo looked at the polar star she slowly saluted the four points of heaven and knelt down on the ground in an azure dust which was strewn with golden stars in imitation of the firmament then with both elbows against her sides her forearms straight and her hands open she threw back her head beneath the rays of the moon and said o oh, rabetna balet tanith and her voice was lengthened in a plaintive fashion as if calling to some one anaitis astate derseto astoreth milita athara elissa tiratha by the hidden symbols by the resounding sistra by the furrows of the earth by the eternal silence and by the eternal fruitfulness mistress of the gloomy sea and of the azure shores o queen of the watery world all hail she swayed her whole body twice or thrice and then cast herself face downwards in the dust with both arms outstretched but the slave nimbly raised her for according to the rites some one must catch the suppliant at the moment of his prostration this told him that the gods accepted him and salambo's nurse never failed in this pious duty some merchants from daritian gaetulia had brought her to carthage when quite young and after her enfranchisement she would not forsake her old masters as was shown by her right ear which was pierced with a large hole a petticoat of many-coloured stripes fitted closely on her hips 
and fell to her ankles where two thin rings clashed together her somewhat flat face was yellow like her tunic silver bodkins of great length formed a sun behind her head she wore a coral button on the nostril and she stood beside the bed more erect than a hermes and with her eyelids cast down salambo walked to the edge of the terrace her eyes swept the horizon for an instant and then were lowered upon the sleeping town while the sigh that she heaved swelled her bosom and gave an undulating movement to the whole length of the long white simar which hung without clasp or girdle about her her curved and painted sandals were hidden beneath a heap of emeralds and a net of purple thread was filled with her disordered hair but she raised her head to gaze upon the moon and murmured mingling her speech with fragments of hymns how lightly turnest thou supported by the impalpable ether it brightens about thee and tis the stir of thine agitation that distributes the winds and fruitful dews according as thou dost wax and wane the eyes of cats and spots of panthers lengthen or grow short wives shriek thy name in the pangs of childbirth thou makest the shells to swell the wine to bubble and the corpse to putrefy thou formest the pearls at the bottom of the sea and every gem o goddess ferments in the dark depths of thy moisture when thou appearest quietness is spread abroad upon the earth the flowers close the waves are soothed wearied man stretches his breast toward thee and the world with its oceans and mountains looks at itself in thy face as in a mirror thou art white gentle luminous immaculate helping purifying serene the crescent of the moon was then over the mountain of the hot springs in the hollow formed by its two summits on the other side of the gulf below in there was a little star and all around it a pale circle salambo went on but thou art a terrible mistress monsters terrifying phantoms and lying dreams come from thee thine eyes devour the stones of buildings and the apes are ever ill each time thou growest young again whither ghost thou why dost thou change thy forms continually now slender and curved thou glidest through space like a mastless galley and then amid the stars thou art like a shepherd keeping his flock shining and round thou dost graze the mountain tops like the wheel of a chariot o oh, tanith thou dost love me i have looked so much on thee but no thou sailest through thine azure and i i remain on the motionless earth tanach take your nebel and play softly on the silver string for my heart is sad the slave lifted a sort of harp of ebony wood taller than herself and triangular in shape like a delta she fixed the point in a crystal globe and with both hands began to play the sounds followed one another hurried and deep like the buzzing of bees and with increasing sonorousness floated away into the night with the complaining of the waves and the rustling of the great trees on the summit of the acropolis hush cried salambo what ails you mistress the blowing of the breeze the passing of a cloud everything disquiets you just now i don't know 
she said. You are wearied with too long prayers. O oh, Tarnach, I would fain be dissolved in them like a flower in wine. Perhaps it is the smoke of your perfumes. No, said Salambo, the spirit of the gods dwells in fragrant odours. Then the slave spoke to her of her father. It was thought that he had gone towards the amber country, behind the pillars of Melkarth. But if he does not return, she said, you must nevertheless, since it was his will, choose a husband among the sons of the ancients, and then your grief will pass away in a man's arms. Why? asked the young girl. All those that she had seen had horrified her with their fellow dear laughter and their coarse limbs. Sometimes, Tarnach, from the depth of my being, there exhale, as it were, hot fumes heavier than the vapours from a volcano. Voices call me, a globe of fire rolls and mounts within my bosom, it stifles me. I am at the point of death, and then something sweet, flowing from my brow to my feet, passes through my flesh. It is a caress enfolding me, and I feel myself crushed as if some god were stretched upon me. Oh, would that I could lose myself in the mists of the night, the waters of the fountains, the sap of the trees, that I could issue from my body and be but a breath, or a ray, and glide, mount up to thee, O oh mother! She raised her arms to their full length, arching her form, which in its long garment was as pale and light as the moon. Then she fell back, panting, on the ivory couch. But Tanach passed an amber necklace with dolphin's teeth about her neck to banish terrors, and Salambo said in an almost stifled voice, "'Go and bring me Shahabarim!' Her father had not wished her to enter the college of priestesses, nor even be made at all acquainted with the popular Tanith. He was reserving her for some alliance that might serve his political ends, so that Salambo lived alone in the midst of the palace. Her mother was long since dead. She had grown up with abstinences, fastings, and purifications, always surrounded by grave and exquisite things, her body saturated with perfumes, and her soul filled with prayers. She had never tasted wine, nor eaten meat, nor touched an unclean animal, nor set her heels in the house of death. She knew nothing of obscene images, for as each god was manifested in different forms, the same principle often received the witness of contradictory cults, and Salambo worshipped the goddess in her sidereal presentation. An influence had descended upon the maiden from the moon, when the planet passed diminishing away, Salambo grew weak. She languished the whole day long, and revived at evening. During an eclipse she nearly died. But Rabetna, in jealousy, revenged herself for the virginity withdrawn from her sacrifices, and she tormented Salambo with possessions, all the stronger for being vague, which were spread through this belief and excited by it. Unceasingly was Hamilcar's daughter disquieted about Tanith. She had learned her adventures, her travels, and all her names, which she would repeat without their having any distinct signification for her. In order to penetrate into the depth of her dogma, she wished to become acquainted, in the most secret part of the temple, with the old idol in the magnificent mantle, whereon depended the destinies of Carthage, 
for the idea of a god did not stand out clearly from his representation and to hold or even see the image of one was to take away part of his virtue and in a measure to rule him but salammbo turned around she had recognized the sound of the golden bells which shahabarim wore at the hem of his garment he ascended the staircases then at the threshold of the terrace he stopped and folded his arms his sunken eyes shone like the lamps of a sepulchre his long thin body floated in its linen robe which was weighed by the bells the latter alternating with balls of emeralds at his heels he had feeble limbs an oblique skull and a pointed chin his skin seemed cold to the touch and his yellow face which was deeply furrowed with wrinkles was as if it contracted in a longing in an everlasting grief he was the high priest of tanith and it was he who had educated salammbo speak he said what will you i hoped you had almost promised me she stammered and was confused then suddenly why do you despise me what have i forgotten in the rites you are my master and you told me that no one was so accomplished in the things pertaining to the goddess as i but there are some of which you will not speak is it so o oh father shahabarim remembered hamilcar's orders and replied no i have nothing more to teach you a genius she resumed impels me to this love i have climbed the steps of eskmoun god of the planets and intelligences i have slept beneath the golden olive of melkarth patron of the turian colonies i have pushed open the doors of baal kamun the enlighter and fertilizer i have sacrificed to the subterranean kabiri to the gods of woods winds rivers and mountains but can you understand they are all too far away too high too insensible while she i feel her mingled in my life she fills my soul and i quiver with inward startings as though she were leaping in order to escape methinks i am about to hear her voice and see her face lightnings dazzle me and then i sink back again into the darkness shahabarim was silent she entreated him with suppliant looks at last he made a sign for the dismissal of the slave who was not of chananitish race taanach disappeared and shahabarim raising one arm in the air began before the gods darkness alone was and a breathing stirred dull and indistinct as the conscience of a man in a dream it contracted creating desire and cloud and from desire and cloud there issued primitive matter this was a water muddy black icy and deep it contained senseless monsters incoherent portions of the forms to be born which are painted on the walls of the sanctuaries then matter condensed it became an egg it burst one half formed the earth and the other the firmament sun moon winds and clouds appeared and at the crash of the thunder intelligent creatures awoke then eskmoun spread himself in the starry sphere Carmon beamed in the sun melkarth thrust him with his arms behind gates the kabiri descended beneath the volcanoes and rabetna like a nurse bent over the world pouring out her light like milk and her night like a mantle and then she said 
he had related the secret of the origins to her to divert her from sublimer prospects but the maiden's desire kindled again in his last words and shahabarim half yielding resumed she inspires and governs the loves of men the loves of men repeated salambo dreamily she is the soul of carthage continued the priest and although she is everywhere diffused it is here that she dwells beneath the sacred veil o oh, father cried salambo i shall see her shall i not you will bring me to her i had long been hesitating i am devoured with curiosity to see her form pity help me let us go he repulsed her with a vehement gesture that was full of pride never do you not know that it means death the hermaphrodite baals are unveiled to us alone who are men in understanding and women in weakness your desire is sacrilege be satisfied with the knowledge that you possess she fell upon her knees placing two fingers against her ears in token of repentance and crushed by the priest's words and filled at once with anger against him with terror and humiliation she burst into sobs shahabarim remained erect and more insensible than the stones of the terrace he looked down upon her quivering at his feet and felt a kind of joy on seeing her suffer for his divinity whom he himself could not wholly embrace the birds were already singing a cold wind was blowing and little clouds were drifting in the paling sky suddenly he perceived on the horizon behind tunis what looked like slight mists trailing along the ground then these became a great curtain of dust extending perpendicularly and amid the whirlwinds of the thronging mass dromedaries heads lances and shields appeared it was the army of the barbarians advancing upon carthage End of chapter three Chapter Four, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Four, Beneath the Walls of Carthage, Part One. Some country people, riding on asses or running on foot, arrived in the town, pale, breathless, and mad with fear they were flying before the army it had accomplished the journey from sicca in three days in order to reach carthage and wholly exterminate it the gates were shut the barbarians appeared almost immediately but they stopped in the middle of the isthmus on the edge of the lake at first they made no hostile announcement several approached with palm branches in their hands they were driven back with arrows so great was the terror in the morning and at nightfall prowlers would sometimes wander along the walls a little man carefully wrapped in a cloak and with his face concealed beneath a very low visor was especially noticed he would remain whole hours gazing at the aqueduct and so persistently that he doubtless wished to mislead the carthaginians as to his real designs another man a sort of giant who walked bareheaded used to accompany him but carthage was defended throughout the whole breadth of the isthmus 
first by a trench then by a grassy rampart and lastly by a wall thirty cubits high built of freestone and in two stories it contained stables for three hundred elephants with stores for their caparisons shackles and food other stables again for four thousand horses with supplies of barley and harness and barracks for twenty thousand soldiers with armour and all materials of war towers rose from the second story all provided with battlements and having bronze bucklers hung on cramps on the outside this first line of wall gave immediate shelter to malqua the sailors and dyer's quarter masts might be seen whereupon purple sails were drying and on the highest terraces clay furnaces for heating the pickle were visible behind the lofty houses of the city rose in an amphitheatre of cubical form they were built of stone planks shingle reeds shells and beaten earth the woods belonging to the temples were like lakes of verdure in this mountain of diversely coloured blocks it was levelled at unequal distances by the public squares and was cut from top to bottom by countless intersecting lanes the enclosures of the three old quarters which are now lost might be distinguished they rose here and there like great reefs or extended in enormous fronts blackened half covered with flowers and broadly stripped by the casting of filth while streets passed through their yawning apertures like rivers beneath bridges the hill of the acropolis in the centre of bizra was hidden beneath a disordered array of monuments there were temples with wreathed columns bearing bronze capitals and metal chains cones of dry stones with bands of azure copper cupolas marble architraves babylonian buttresses obelisks poised on their points like inverted torches peristyles reached to pediments volutes were displayed through colonnades granite walls supported tile partitions the whole mounting half hidden the one above the other in a marvellous and incomprehensible fashion in it might be felt the succession of the ages and as it were the memorials of forgotten fatherlands behind the acropolis the mappalian road which was lined with tombs extended through red lands in a straight line from the shore to the catacombs then spacious dwellings occurred at intervals in the gardens and this third quarter megara which was the new town reached as far as the edge of the cliff where rose a giant pharos that blazed forth every night in this fashion was carthage displayed before the soldiers quartered in the plain they could recognize the markets and crossways in the distance and disputed with one another as to the sites of the temples carmons fronting the sicitia had golden tiles melkarth to the left of eskmoun had branches of coral on its roofing beyond tanith's copper cupola swelled among the palm trees the dark moloch was below the cisterns in the direction of the pharos at the angles of the pediments on the top of the walls at the corners of the squares everywhere divinities with hideous heads might be seen colossal or squat with enormous bellies or immoderately flattened opening their jaws extending their arms and holding forks 
chains or javelins in their hands while the blue of the sea stretched away behind the straits which were rendered still steeper by the perspective they were filled from morning till evening with a tumultuous people young boys shaking little bells shouted at the doors of the baths the shops for hot drinks smoked the air resounded with the noise of anvils the white cocks sacred to the sun crowd on the terraces the oxen that were being slaughtered below in the temples slaves ran about with baskets on their heads and in the depths of the porticos a priest would sometimes appear draped in a dark cloak barefooted and wearing a pointed cap the spectacle afforded by carthage irritated the barbarians they admired it and execrated it and would have liked both to annihilate it and to dwell in it but what was there in the military harbour defended by a triple wall then behind the town at the back of megara and higher than the acropolis appeared hamilcar's palace matho's eyes were directed thither every moment he would ascend the olive trees and lean over with his hand spread out above his eyebrows the gardens were empty and the red door with its black cross remained constantly shut more than twenty times he walked around the ramparts seeking some breach by which he might enter one night he threw himself into the gulf and swam for three hours at a stretch he reached the foot of the mappalian quarter and tried to climb up the face of the cliff he covered his knees with blood broke his nails and then fell back into the waves and returned his impotence exasperated him he was jealous of this carthage which contained salambo as if of some one who had possessed her his nervelessness left him to be replaced by a mad and continual eagerness for action with flaming cheek angry eyes and hoarse voice he would walk with rapid strides through the camp or seated on the shore he would scour his great sword with sand he shot arrows at the passing vultures his heart overflowed into frenzied speech give free course to your wrath like a runaway chariot said spendius shout blaspheme ravage and slay grief is allayed with blood and since you cannot sate your love gorge your hate it will sustain you matho resumed the command of his soldiers he drilled them pitilessly he was respected for his courage and especially for his strength moreover he inspired a sort of mystic dread and it was believed that he conversed at night with phantoms the other captains were animated by his example the army soon grew disciplined from their houses the carthaginians could hear the boggle flourishes that regulated their exercises at last the barbarians drew near to crush them in the isthmus it would have been necessary for two armies to take them simultaneously in the rear one disembarking at the end of the gulf of adica and the second at the mountain of the hot springs but what could be done with the single sacred legion mustering at most six thousand men if the enemy bent towards the east they would join the nomads and intercept the commerce of the desert if they fell back to the west numidia would rise finally lack of provisions would sooner or later lead them to devastate the surrounding country like grasshoppers and the rich trembled for their fine country houses their vineyards and their cultivated lands 
hanno proposed atrocious and impracticable measures such as promising a heavy sum for every barbarian's head or setting fire to their camp with ships and machines his colleague gisco on the other hand wished them to be paid but the ancients detested him owing to his popularity for they dreaded the risk of a master and through terror of monarchy strove to weaken whatever contributed to it or might re-establish it outside the fortification there were people of another race and of unknown origin all hunters of the porcupine and eaters of the shellfish and serpents they used to go into caves to catch hyenas alive and amuse themselves by making them run in the evening on the sands of megara between the stelae of the tombs their huts which were made of mud and rack hung on the cliff like swallows nests there they lived without government and without gods pell-mell completely naked at once feeble and fierce and execrated by the people of all time on account of their unclean food one morning the sentries perceived that they were all gone at last some members of the great council arrived at a decision they came to the camp without necklaces or girdles and in open sandals like neighbours they walked at a quiet pace waving salutations to the captains or stopped to speak to the soldiers saying that all was finished and that justice was about to be done to their claims many of them saw a camp of mercenaries for the first time instead of the confusion which they had pictured to themselves there prevailed everywhere terrible silence and order a grassy rampart formed a lofty wall around the army immovable by the shock of catapults the ground in the streets was sprinkled with fresh water through the holes in the tents they could perceive tawny eyeballs gleaming in the shade the piles of pikes and hanging panoplies dazzled them like mirrors they conversed in low tones they were afraid of upsetting something with their long robes the soldiers requested provisions undertaking to pay for them out of the money that was due oxen sheep guinea fowl fruit and lupins were sent to them with smoked scombri that excellent scombri which carthage dispatched to every port but they walked scornfully around the magnificent cattle and disparaging what they coveted offered the worth of a pigeon for a ram or the price of a pomegranate for three goats the eaters of uncleanness came forward as arbitrators and declared that they were being duped then they drew their swords with threats to slay commissaries of the great council wrote down the number of years for which pay was due to each soldier but it was no longer possible to know how many mercenaries had been engaged and the ancients were dismayed at the enormous sum which they would have to pay the reserve of silphium must be sold and the trading towns taxed the mercenaries would grow impatient tunis was already with them and the rich stunned by hanno's ragings and his colleagues reproaches urged any citizens who might know a barbarian to go to see him immediately in order to win back his friendship and to speak him fair such a show of confidence would soothe them traders scribes workers in the arsenal and whole families visited the barbarians the soldiers allowed all the carthaginians to come in but by a single passage so narrow that four men abreast jostled one another in it spendius standing against the barrier had them carefully searched 
facing him matho was examining the multitude trying to recognize some one whom he might have seen at salambo's palace the camp was like a town so full of people and of movement was it the two distinct crowds mingled without blending one dressed in linen or wool with felt caps like fir cones and the other clad in iron and wearing helmets amid serving men and itinerant vendors there moved women of all nations as brown as ripe dates as greenish as olives as yellow as oranges sold by sailors picked out of dens stolen from caravans taken in the sacking of towns women that were jaded with love so long as they were young and plied with blows when they were old and that died in routs on the roadsides among the baggage and the abandoned beasts of burden the wives of the nomads had square tawny robes of dromedary's hair swinging at their heels musicians from cyrenaica wrapped in violet gauze and with painted eyebrows sang squatting on mats old negresses with hanging breasts gathered the animal's dung that was drying in the sun to light their fires the syracusan women had golden plates in their hair the lusitanians had necklaces of shells the gauls wore wolf skins upon their white bosoms and sturdy children vermin covered naked and uncircumcised butted with their heads against passes by or came behind them like young tigers to bite their hands the carthaginians walked through the camp surprised at the quantities of things with which it was running over the most miserable were melancholy and the rest dissembled their anxiety the soldiers struck them on the shoulder and exhorted them to be gay as soon as they saw any one they invited him to their amusements if they were playing at discus they would manage to crush his feet or if at boxing to fracture his jaw with the very first blow the slingers terrified the carthaginians with their slings the psili with their vipers and the horsemen with their horses while their victims addicted as they were to peaceful occupations bent their heads and tried to smile at all these outrages some in order to show themselves brave made signs that they should like to become soldiers they were set to split wood and curry mules they were buckled up in armour and rolled like casks through the streets of the camp then when they were about to leave the mercenaries plucked out their hair with grotesque contortions but many from foolishness or prejudice innocently believed that all the carthaginians were very rich and they walked behind them entreating them to grant them something they requested everything that they thought fine a ring a girdle sandals the fringe of a robe and when the despoiled carthaginians cried but i have nothing left what do you want they would reply your wife others even said your life the military accounts were handed to the captains read to the soldiers and definitely approved then they claimed tents they received them next the pole marches of the greeks demanded some of the handsome suits of armour that were manufactured at carthage the great council voted sums of money for their purchase but it was only fair so the horsemen pretended that the republic should indemnify them for their horses one had lost three at such a siege another five during such a march another fourteen in the precipices stallions from hecatompylus were offered to them but they preferred money 
next they demanded that they should be paid in money in pieces of money and not in leathern coins for all the corn that was owing to them and at the highest price that it had fetched during the war so that they exacted four hundred times as much for a measure of meal as they had given for a sack of wheat such injustice was exasperating but it was necessary nevertheless to submit then the delegates from the soldiers and from the great council swore renewed friendship by the genius of carthage and the gods of the barbarians they exchanged excuses and caresses with oriental demonstrativeness and verbosity then the soldiers claimed as a proof of friendship the punishment of those who had estranged them from the republic their meaning it was pretended was not understood and they explained themselves more clearly by saying that they must have hanno's head several times a day they left their camp and walked along the foot of the walls shouting a demand that the suffet's head should be thrown to them and holding out their robes to receive it the great council would perhaps have given way but for a last exaction more outrageous than the rest they demanded maidens chosen from illustrious families in marriage for their chiefs it was an idea which had emanated from spendius and which many thought most simple and practicable but the assumption of their desire to mix with punic blood made the people indignant and they were bluntly told that they were to receive no more then they exclaimed that they had been deceived and that if their pay did not arrive within three days they would themselves go and take it in carthage the bad faith of the mercenaries was not so complete as their enemies thought hamilcar had made them extravagant promises vague it is true but at the same time solemn and reiterated they might have believed that when they disembarked at carthage the town would be abandoned to them and that they should have treasures divided among them and when they saw that scarcely their wages would be paid the disillusion touched their pride no less than their greed had not dionysius pyrrhus agathocles and the generals of alexander furnished examples of marvellous good fortune hercules whom the canaanites confounded with the sun was the ideal which shone on the horizon of armies they knew that simple soldiers had won diadems and the echoes of crumbling empires would furnish dreams to the gaul in his oak forest to the ethiopian amid his sands but there was a nation always ready to turn courage to account and the robber driven from his tribe the patricide wandering on the roads the perpetrator of sacrilege pursued by the gods all who were starving or in despair strove to reach the port where the carthaginian broker was recruiting soldiers usually the republic kept its promises this time however the eagerness of its avarice had brought it into perilous disgrace numidians libyans the whole of africa was about to fall upon carthage only the sea was open to it and there it met with the romans so that like a man assailed by murderers it felt death all around it end of chapter four part one Chapter Four, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Caroline. Chapter Four, Part Two. 
it was quite necessary to have recourse to gisco and the barbarians accepted his intervention one morning they saw the chains of the harbour lowered and three flat-bottomed boats passing through the canal of tenia entered the lake gisco was visible on the first at the prow behind him rose an enormous chest higher than a catafalque and furnished with rings like hanging crowns then appeared the legion of interpreters with their hair dressed like sphinxes and with parrots tattooed on their breasts friends and slaves followed all without arms and in such numbers that they shouldered one another the three long dangerously loaded barges advanced amid the shouts of the onlooking army as soon as gisco disembarked the soldiers ran to him he had a sort of tribune erected with knapsacks and declared that he should not depart before he had paid them all in full there was an outburst of applause and it was a long time before he was able to speak then he censured the wrongs done to the republic and to the barbarians the fault lay with a few mutineers who had alarmed carthage by their violence the best proof of good intention on the part of the latter was that it was he the eternal adversary of the suffered hanno who was sent to them they must not credit the people with the folly of desiring to provoke brave men nor with ingratitude enough not to recognize their services and gisco began to pay the soldiers commencing with the libyans as they had declared that the lists were untruthful he made no use of them they defiled before him according to nationality opening their fingers to show the numbers of their years of service they were marked in succession with green paint on the left arm the scribes dipped into the yawning coffer while others made holes with a style on a sheet of lead a man passed walking heavily like an ox come up beside me said the suffet suspecting some fraud how many years have you served twelve replied the libyan gisco slipped his finger under his chin for the chin-piece of the helmet used in course of time to occasion two callosities there these were called carabs and to have the carabs was an expression used to denote a veteran thief exclaimed the suffet your shoulders ought to have what your face lacks and tearing off his tunic he laid bare his back which was covered with a bleeding scab he was a labourer from hippo Zaretus. hootings were raised and he was decapitated as soon as night fell spendius went and roused the libyans and said to them when the ligurians greeks balearians and men of italy are paid they will return but as for you you will remain in africa scattered through your tribes and without any means of defence it will be then that the republic will take its revenge mistrust the journey are you going to believe everything that is said both the suffets are agreed and this one is imposing on you remember the island of bones and xantippus whom they sent back to sparta in a rotten galley how are we to proceed they asked reflect said spendius the two following days were spent in paying the men of magdala leptis and hecatompylos spendius went about among the gauls they are paying off the libyans and then they will discharge the greeks the balearians the asiatics and all the rest but you who are few in number will receive nothing you will see your native lands no more you will have no ships and they will kill you to save your food the gauls came to the suffet 
autaritus he whom he had wounded at hamilcar's palace put questions to him but was repelled by the slaves and disappeared swearing he would be revenged the demands and complaints multiplied the most obstinate penetrated at night into the suffet's tent they took his hands and sought to move him by making him feel their toothless mouths their wasted arms and the scars of their wounds those who had not yet been paid were growing angry those who had received the money demanded more for their horses and vagabonds and outlaws assumed soldiers arms and declared that they were being forgotten every minute there arrived whirlwinds of men as it were the tents strained and fell the multitude thick pressed between the ramparts of the camp swayed with loud shouts from the gates to the centre when the tumult grew excessively violent gisco would rest one elbow on his ivory sceptre and stand motionless looking at the sea with his fingers buried in his beard matho frequently went off to speak with spendius then he would again place himself in front of the suffet and gisco could feel his eyes continually like two flaming phalaricas darted against him several times they hurled reproaches at each other over the heads of the crowd but without making themselves heard the distribution meanwhile continued and the suffet found expedients to remove every obstacle the greeks tried to quibble about differences in currency but he furnished them with such explanations that they retired without a murmur the negroes demanded white shells such as are used for trading in the interior of africa but when he offered to send to carthage for them they accepted money like the rest but the balearians had been promised something better namely women the suffet replied that a whole caravan of maidens was expected for them but the journey was long and would require six moons more when they were fat and well rubbed with benjamin they should be sent in ships to the ports of the balearians suddenly zaxas now handsome and vigorous leaped like a mountebank upon the shoulders of his friends and cried have you reserved any of them for the corpses at the same time pointing to the gate of carmon in carthage the brass plates with which it was furnished from top to bottom shone in the sun's latest fires and the barbarians believed that they could discern on it a trail of blood every time that gisco wished to speak their shouts began again at last he descended with measured steps and shut himself up in his tent when he left it at sunrise his interpreters who used to sleep outside did not stir they lay on their backs with their eyes fixed their tongues between their teeth and their faces of a bluish colour white mucus flowed from their nostrils and their limbs were stiff as if they had been frozen by the cold during the night each had a little noose of rushes around his neck from that time onward the rebellion was unchecked the murder of the balearians which had been recalled by zaxas strengthened the distrust inspired by spendius they imagined that the republic was always trying to deceive them an end must be put to it the interpreters should be dispensed with zaxas sang war songs with a sling around his head autaritus brandished his great sword spendius whispered a word to one or gave a dagger to another the boldest endeavoured to pay themselves while those who were less frenzied wished to have the distribution continued 
no one now relinquished his arms and the anger of all combined into a tumultuous hatred of gisco some got up beside him so long as they vociferated abuse they were listened to with patience but if they tried to utter the least word in his behalf they were immediately stoned or their heads were cut off by a sabre stroke from behind the heap of knapsacks was redder than an altar they became terrible after their meal and when they had drunk wine this was an enjoyment forbidden in the punic armies under pain of death and they raised their cups in the direction of carthage in derision of its discipline then they returned to the slaves of the exchequer and again began to kill the word strike though different in each language was understood by all gisco was well aware that he was being abandoned by his country but in spite of its ingratitude he would not dishonour it when they reminded him that they had been promised ships he swore by moloch to provide them himself at his own expense and pulling off his necklace of blue stones he threw it into the crowd as the pledge of his oath then the africans claimed the corn in accordance with the engagements made by the great council gisco spread out the accounts of the sicitia traced in violet pigment on sheepskins and read out all that had entered carthage month by month and day by day suddenly he stopped with gaping eyes as if he had just discovered his sentence of death among the figures the ancients had in fact fraudulently reduced them and the corn sold during the most calamitous period of the war was set down at so low a rate that blindness apart it was impossible to believe it speak they shouted louder ah he is trying to lie the coward don't trust him for some time he hesitated at last he resumed his task the soldiers without suspecting that they were being deceived accepted the accounts of the sicitia as true but the abundance that had prevailed at carthage made them furiously jealous they broke open the sycamore chest it was three parts empty they had seen such sums coming out of it that they thought it inexhaustible gisco must have buried some in his tent they scaled the knapsacks matho led them and as they shouted the money the money gisco at last replied let your general give it to you he looked them in the face without speaking with his great yellow eyes and his long face that was paler than his beard an arrow held by its feathers hung from the large gold ring in his ear and a stream of blood was trickling from his tiara upon his shoulder at a gesture from matho all advanced gisco held out his arms spendius tied his wrists with a slip-knot another knocked him down and he disappeared amid the disorder of the crowd which was stumbling over the knapsacks they sacked his tent nothing was found in it except things indispensable to life and on a closer search three images of tanit and wrapped up in an ape's skin a black stone which had fallen from the moon many carthaginians had chosen to accompany him they were eminent men and all belonged to the war party they were dragged outside the tents and thrown into the pit used for the reception of filth they were tied with iron chains around the body to solid stakes and were offered food at the point of the javelin 
autoritas overwhelmed them with invectives as he inspected them but being quite ignorant of his language they made no reply and the gaul from time to time threw pebbles at their faces to make them cry out the next day a sort of languor took possession of the army now that their anger was over they were seized with anxiety mato was suffering from vague melancholy it seemed to him that salambo had indirectly been insulted these rich men were a kind of appendage to her person he sat down in the night on the edge of the pit and recognized in their groanings something of the voice of which his heart was full all however upbraided the libyans who alone had been paid but while national antipathies revived together with personal hatreds it was felt that it would be perilous to give way to them reprisals after such an outrage would be formidable it was necessary therefore to anticipate the vengeance of carthage conventions and harangues never ceased every one spoke no one was listened to spendius usually so loquacious shook his head at every proposal one evening he asked matto carelessly whether there were not springs in the interior of the town not one replied matto the next day spendius drew him aside to the bank of the lake master said the former slave if your heart is dauntless i will bring you into carthage how repeated the other panting swear to execute all my commands and to follow me like a shadow then matto raising his arm towards the planet of chabar exclaimed by tanith i swear spendius resumed to-morrow after sunset you will wait for me at the foot of the aqueduct between the ninth and tenth arcades bring with you an iron pick a crestless helmet and leathern sandals the aqueduct of which he spoke crossed the entire isthmus obliquely a considerable work afterwards enlarged by the romans in spite of her disdain of other nations carthage had awkwardly borrowed this novel invention from them just as rome herself had built punic galleys and five rows of superposed arches of a dumpy kind of architecture with buttresses at their foot and lions heads at the top reached to the western part of the acropolis where they sank beneath the town to incline what was nearly a river into the cisterns of megara spendius met matto here at the hour agreed upon he fastened a sort of harpoon to the end of a cord and whirled it rapidly like a sling the iron instrument caught fast and they began to climb up the wall the one after the other but when they had ascended to the first story the cramp fell back every time that they threw it and in order to discover some fissure they had to walk along the edge of the cornice at every row of arches they found that it became narrower then the cord relaxed several times it nearly broke at last they reached the upper platform spendius stooped down from time to time to feel the stones with his hand here it is he said let us begin and leaning on the pick which matto had brought they succeeded in dislodging one of the flagstones in the distance they perceived a troop of horsemen galloping on horses without bridles their golden bracelets leaped in the vague drapings of their cloaks a man could be seen in front covered with ostrich feathers and galloping with a lance in each hand nar havas exclaimed matto what matter returned spendius and he leaped into the hole which they had just made by removing the flagstone matto at his command tried to thrust out one of the blocks 
but he could not move his elbows for want of room we shall return said spendius go in front then they ventured into the channel of water it reached to their waists soon they staggered and were obliged to swim their limbs knocked against the walls of the narrow duct the water flowed almost immediately beneath the stones above and their faces were torn by them then the current carried them away their breasts were crushed with air heavier than that of a sepulchre and stretching themselves out as much as possible with their heads between their arms and their legs closed together they passed like arrows into the darkness choking gurgling and almost dead suddenly all became black before them and the speed of the waters redoubled they fell when they came to the surface again they remained for a few minutes extended on their backs inhaling the air delightfully arcades one behind another opened up amid large walls separating the various basins all were filled and the water stretched in a single sheet throughout the length of the cisterns through the air holes in the cupolas on the ceiling there fell a pale brightness which spread upon the waves discs as it were of light while the darkness round about thickened towards the walls and threw them back to an indefinite distance the slightest sound made a great echo spendius and matho commenced to swim again and passing through the opening of the arches traversed several chambers in succession two other rows of smaller basins extended in a parallel direction on each side they lost themselves they turned and came back again at last something offered a resistance to their heels it was the pavement of the gallery that ran along the cisterns then advancing with great precautions they felt along the wall to find an outlet but their feet slipped and they fell into the great centre basins they had to climb up again and there they fell again they experienced terrible fatigue which made them feel as if all their limbs had been dissolved in the water while swimming their eyes closed they were in the agonies of death spendius struck his hand against the bars of a grating they shook it it gave way and they found themselves on the steps of a staircase a door of bronze closed it above with the point of a dagger they moved the bar which was opened from without and suddenly the pure open air surrounded them the night was filled with silence and the sky seemed at an extraordinary height clusters of trees projected over the long lines of walls the whole town was asleep the fires of the outposts shone like lost stars spendius who had spent three years in the ergastulum was but imperfectly acquainted with the different quarters matho conjectured that to reach hamilcar's palace they ought to strike to the left and cross the mappalian district no said spendius take me to the temple of tanith matho wished to speak remember said the former slave and raising his arms he showed him the glittering planet of chabar then matho turned in silence towards the acropolis they crept along the nopal hedges which bordered the path the water trickled from their limbs upon the dust their damp sandals made no noise spendius with eyes that flamed more than torches searched the bushes at every step and he walked behind matho with his hands resting on the two daggers which he carried in his arms and which hung from below the armpit by a leathern band End of chapter four part two
Chapter Five, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Five, Tanith. After leaving the gardens, Mato and Spendius found themselves checked by the rampart of Megara, but they discovered a breach in the great wall and passed through the ground sloped downwards forming a kind of very broad alley it was an exposed place listen said spendius and first of all fear nothing i shall fulfil my promise he stopped abruptly and seemed to reflect as though searching for words do you remember that time at sunrise when i showed carthage to you on salambo's terrace we were strong that day but he would listen to nothing then in a grave voice master in the sanctuary of tanith there is a mysterious veil which fell from heaven and which covers the goddess i know said Mato. Spendius resumed. It is itself divine, for it forms part of her. The gods reside where their images are. It is because Carthage possesses it that Carthage is powerful. Then, leaning over to his ear, I have brought you with me to carry it off. Mato recoiled in horror be gone look for some one else i will not help you in this execrable crime but tanith is your enemy retorted spendius she is persecuting you and you are dying through her wrath you will be revenged upon her she will obey you and you will become almost immortal and invincible Mato bent his head spendius continued we should succumb the army would be annihilated of itself we have neither flight nor succour nor pardon to hope for what chastisement from the gods can you be afraid of since you will have their power in your own hands would you rather die on the evening of a defeat in misery beneath the shelter of a bush or amid the outrages of the populace and the flames of funeral piles master one day you will enter carthage among the colleges of the pontiffs who will kiss your sandals and if the veil of tanith weighs upon you still you will reinstate it in its temple follow me come and take it Mato was consumed by a terrible longing. He would have liked to possess the veil while refraining from the sacrilege. He said to himself that perhaps it would not be necessary to take it in order to monopolize its virtue. He did not go to the bottom of his thought, but stopped at the boundary, where it terrified him. "'Come on,' he said and they went off with rapid strides side by side and without speaking the ground rose again and the dwellings were near they turned again into the narrow street amid the darkness the strips of esparto grass with which the doors were closed beat against the walls some camels were ruminating in a square before heaps of cut grass then they passed beneath a gallery covered with foliage a pack of dogs were barking but suddenly the space grew wider and they recognized the western face of the acropolis at the foot of bizra there stretched a long black mass it was the temple of tanith a hole made up of monuments and galleries courts and forecourts and bounded by a low wall of dry stones spendius and matto leaped over it 
this first barrier enclosed a wood of plane trees as a precaution against plague and infection in the air tents were scattered here and there in which during the daytime depilatory pastes perfumes garments moon-shaped cakes and images of the goddess with representations of the temple hollowed out in blocks of alabaster were on sale they had nothing to fear for on nights when the planet did not appear all rites were suspended nevertheless mato slackened his speed and stopped before the three ebony steps leading to the second enclosure forward said spendius pomegranate almond trees cypresses and myrtles alternated in regular succession the path which was paved with blue pebbles creaked beneath their footsteps and full-blown roses formed a hanging bower over the whole length of the avenue they arrived before an oval hall protected by a grating then matho who was frightened by the silence said to spendius it is here that they mix the fresh water and the bitter i have seen all that returned the former slave in syria in the town of mafuk and they ascended into the third enclosure by a staircase of six silver steps a huge cedar occupied the centre its lowest branches were hidden beneath scraps of material and necklaces hung upon them by the faithful they walked a few steps further on and the front of the temple was displayed before them two long porticos with their architraves resting on dumpy pillars flanked a quadrangular tower the platform of which was adorned with the crescent of a moon on the angles of the porticos and at the four corners of the tower stood vases filled with kindled aromatics the capitals were laden with pomegranates and coloquintidas twining knots lozenges and rows of pearls alternated on the walls and a hedge of silver filigree formed a wide semicircle in front of the brass staircase which led down from the vestibule there was a cone of stone at the entrance between a stella of gold and one of emerald and mato kissed his right hand as he passed beside it the first room was very lofty its vaulted roof was pierced by numberless apertures and if the head were raised the stars might be seen all around the wall rush baskets were heaped up with the first fruits of adolescence in the shape of beards and curls of hair and in the centre of the circular apartment the body of a woman issued from a sheath which was covered with breasts fat bearded and with eyelids downcast she looked as though she were smiling while her hands were crossed upon the lower part of her big body which was polished by the kisses of the crowd then they found themselves again in the open air in a transverse corridor wherein there was an altar of small dimensions leaning against an ivory door there was no further passage the priests alone could open it for the temple was not a place of meeting for the multitude but the private abode of a divinity the enterprise is impossible said matho you had not thought of this let us go back spendius was examining the walls he wanted the veil not because he had confidence in its virtue spendius believed only in the oracle 
but because he was persuaded that the carthaginians would be greatly dismayed on seeing themselves deprived of it they walked all around behind in order to find some outlet edicules of different shapes were visible beneath clusters of turpentine trees here and there rose a stone phallus and large stags roamed peacefully about spanning the fallen fir cones with their cloven hoofs but they retraced their steps between two long galleries which ran parallel to each other there were small open cells along their sides and tabourines and cymbals hung against their cedar columns from top to bottom women were sleeping stretched on mats outside the cells their bodies were greasy with unguents and exhaled an odour of spices and extinguished perfuming pans while they were so covered with tattooings necklaces rings vermilion and antimony that but for the motion of their breasts they might have been taken for idols as they lay thus on the ground there were lotus trees encircling a fountain in which fish like salambos were swimming and then in the background against the wall of the temple spread a vine the branches of which were of glass and the grape bunches of emerald the rays from the precious stones making a play of light through the painted columns upon the sleeping faces matho felt suffocated in the warm atmosphere pressed down upon him by the cedar partitions all these symbols of fecundation these perfumes radiations and breathings overwhelmed him through all the mystic dazzling he kept thinking of salambo she became confused with the goddess herself and his love unfolded itself all the more like the great lotus plants blooming upon the depths of the waters spendius was calculating how much money he would have made in former days by the sale of these women and with a rapid glance he estimated the weight of the golden necklaces as he passed by the temple was impenetrable on this side as on the other and they returned behind the first chamber while spendius was searching and ferreting matho was prostrate before the door supplicating tanith he besought her not to permit the sacrilege and strove to soften her with caressing words such as are used to an angry person spendius noticed a narrow aperture above the door rise he said to matho and he made him stand erect with his back against the wall placing one foot in his hands and then the other upon his head he reached up to the air-hole made his way into it and disappeared then matho felt a knotted cord that one which spendius had rolled around his body before entering the cisterns fall upon his shoulders and bearing upon it with both hands he soon found himself by the side of the other in a large hall filled with shadow such an attempt was something extraordinary the inadequacy of the means for preventing it was a sufficient proof that it was considered impossible the sanctuaries were protected by terror more than by their walls matho expected to die at every step however a light was flickering far back in the darkness and they went up to it it was a lamp burning in a shell on the pedestal of a statue which wore the cap of the kabiri its long blue robe was strewn with diamond discs 
and its heels were fastened to the ground by chains which sank beneath the pavement matho suppressed a cry ah there she is there she is he stammered out spendius took up the lamp in order to light himself what an impious man you are murmured matho following him nevertheless the apartment which they entered had nothing in it but a black painting representing another woman her legs reached to the top of the wall and her body filled the entire ceiling a huge egg hung by a thread from her navel and she fell head downwards upon the other wall reaching as far as the level of the pavement which was touched by her pointed fingers they drew a hanging aside in order to go on further but the wind blew and the light went out then they wandered about lost in the complications of the architecture suddenly they felt something strangely soft beneath their feet sparks crackled and leaped they were walking in fire spendius touched the ground and perceived that it was carefully carpeted with lynx skins then it seemed to them that a big cord wet cold and vicious was gliding between their legs through some fissures cut in the wall there fell thin white rays and they advanced by this uncertain light at last they distinguished a large black serpent it darted quickly away and disappeared let us fly exclaimed matho it is she i feel her she's coming no no replied spendius the temple is empty then a dazzling light made them lower their eyes next they perceived all around them an infinite number of beasts lean panting with bristling claws and mingled together one above another in a mysterious and terrifying confusion there were serpents with feet and bulls with wings fishes with human heads were devouring fruit flowers were blooming in the jaws of crocodiles and elephants with uplifted trunks were sailing proudly through the azure like eagles their incomplete or multiplied limbs were distended with terrible exertion as they thrust out their tongues they looked as though they would fain give forth their souls and every shape was to be found among them as if the germ receptacle had been suddenly hatched and had burst emptying itself upon the walls of the hall round the latter were twelve globes of blue crystal supported by monsters resembling tigers their eyeballs were starting out of their heads like those of snails with their dumpy loins bent they were turning around towards the background where their supreme rabbit the omnifecund the last invented shone splendid in a chariot of ivory she was covered with scales feathers flowers and birds as high as the waist for earrings she had silver cymbals which flapped against her cheeks her large fixed eyes gazed upon you and a luminous stone set in an obscure symbol on her brow lightened the whole hall by its reflection in red copper mirrors above the door matho stood a step forward but a flagstone yielded beneath his heels and immediately the spheres began to revolve and the monsters to roar music rose melodious and pealing like the harmony of the planets the tumultuous soul of tanith was poured streaming forth 
she was about to arise as lofty as the hall and with open arms suddenly the monsters closed their jaws and the crystal globes revolved no more then a mournful modulation lingered for a time through the air and at last died away and the veil said spendius nowhere could it be seen where was it to be found how could it be discovered what if the priests had hidden it matho experienced anguish of heart and felt as though he had been deceived in his belief this way whispered spendius an inspiration guided him he drew matho behind tanith's chariot where a cleft a cubit wide ran down the wall from top to bottom then they penetrated into a small and completely circular room so lofty that it was like the interior of a pillar in the centre there was a big black stone of semispherical shape like a tambourine flames were burning upon it an ebony cone bearing a head and two arms rose behind but beyond it seemed as though there were a cloud wherein were twinkling stars faces appeared in the depths of its folds eshmoun with the kabiri some of the monsters that had already been seen the sacred beasts of the babylonians and others with which they were not acquainted it passed beneath the idol's face like a mantle and spread fully out was drawn up on the wall to which it was fastened by the corners appearing at once bluish as the night yellow as the dawn purple as the sun multitudinous diaphanous sparkling light it was the mantle of the goddess the holy zaimph which might not be seen both turned pale take it said matho at last spendius did not hesitate and leaning upon the idol he unfastened the veil which sank to the ground matho laid his hand upon it then he put his head through the opening then he wrapped it around his body and he spread out his arms the better to view it let us go said spendius matho stood panting with his eyes fixed upon the pavement suddenly he exclaimed but what if i went to her i fear her beauty no longer what could she do to me i am now more than a man i could pass through flames or walk upon the sea i am transported salambo salambo i am your master his voice was like thunder he seemed to spendius to have grown taller and transformed end of chapter five part one Chapter Five, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Five, Part Two. Tanith. A sound of footsteps drew near. A door opened, and a man appeared, a priest with lofty cap and staring eyes before he could make a gesture spendius had rushed upon him and clasping him in his arms had buried both his daggers in his sides his head rang upon the pavement then they stood for a while as motionless as the corpse listening 
nothing could be heard but the murmuring of the wind through the half-opened door the letter led into a narrow passage spendius advanced along it matho followed him and they found themselves almost immediately in the third enclosure between the lateral porticos in which were the dwellings of the priests behind the cells there must be a shorter way out they hastened along spendius squatted down at the edge of the fountain and washed his blood-stained hands the women slept the emerald vine shone they resumed their advance but something was running behind them under the trees and matho who bore the veil several times felt that it was being pulled very gently from below it was a large sonocephalus one of those which dwelt at liberty within the enclosure of the goddess it clung to the mantle as though it had been conscious of the theft they did not dare to strike it however fearing that it might redouble its cries suddenly its anger subsided and it trotted close behind them swinging its body with its long hanging arms then at the barrier it leaped at a bound into a palm tree when they had left the last enclosure they directed their steps towards hamilcar's palace spendius understanding that it would be useless to try to dissuade matho they went by the street of the tanners the square of mutumbal the green market and the crossways of sinasin at the angle of a wall a man drew back frightened by the sparkling thing which pierced the darkness hide the zaimph said spendius other people passed them but without perceiving them at last they recognized the houses of megara the pharos which was built behind them on the summit of the cliff lit up the heavens with a great red brightness and the shadow of the palace with its rising terraces projected a monstrous pyramid as it were upon the gardens they entered through the hedge of jujube trees beating down the branches with blows of the dagger the traces of the feast of the mercenaries were everywhere still manifest the parks were broken up the trenches drained the doors of the egastolum opened no one was to be seen about the kitchens or cellars they wondered at the silence which was occasionally broken by the hoarse breathing of the elephants moving in their shackles and the crepitation of the pharos in which a pile of aloes was burning matho however kept repeating but where is she i wish to see her lead me it is a piece of insanity spendius kept saying she will call her slaves will run up and in spite of your strength you will die they reached thus the gallery staircase matho raised his head and thought that he could perceive far above a vague brightness radiant and soft spendius sought to restrain him but he dashed up the steps as he found himself again in places where he had already seen her the interval of the days that had passed was obliterated from his memory but now had she been singing among the tables she had disappeared and he had since been continually ascending this staircase 
the sky above his head was covered with fires the sea filled the horizon at each step he was surrounded by a still greater immensity and he continued to climb upward with that strange facility which we experience in dreams the rustling of the veil as it brushed against the stones recalled his new power to him but in the excess of his hope he could no longer tell what he was to do this uncertainty alarmed him from time to time he would press his face against the quadrangular openings in the closed apartments and he thought that in several of the latter he could see persons asleep the last story which was narrower formed a sort of dado on the summit of the terraces matho walked around it slowly a milky light filled the sheets of talc which closed the little apertures in the wall and in their symmetrical arrangement they looked in the darkness like rows of delicate pearls he recognized the red door with the black cross the throbbing of his heart increased he would fain have fled he pushed the door and it opened a gallery-shaped lamp hung burning in the back part of the room and three rays emitted from its silver keel trembled on the lofty wainscots which were painted red with black bands the ceiling was an assemblage of small beams with amethysts and topazes amid their gilding in the knots of the wood on both the great sides of the apartment there stretched a very low bed made with white leathern straps while above semicircles like shells opened in the thickness of the wall suffered a garment to come out and hang down to the ground there was an oval basin with a step of onyx around it delicate slippers of serpent skin were standing on the edge together with an alabaster flagon the trace of a wet footstep might be seen beyond exquisite scents were evaporating matho glided over the pavement which was encrusted with gold mother of pearl and glass and in spite of the polished smoothness of the ground it seemed to him that his feet sank as though he were walking on sand behind the silver lamp he had perceived a large square of azure held in the air by four courts from above and he advanced with loins bent and mouth open flamingo's wings fitted on branches of black coral lay about among purple cushions tortoise shell striggles cedar boxes and ivory spatulas there were antelopes horns with rings and bracelets strung upon them and clay vases were cooling in the wind in the cleft of the wall with a lattice-work of reeds several times he struck his foot for the ground had various levels of unequal height which formed a succession of apartments as it were in the room in the background there were silver balustrades surrounding a carpet strewn with painted flowers at last he came to the hanging bed beside an ebony stool serving to get into it but the light ceased at the edge and the shadow like a great curtain revealed only a corner of the red mattress with the extremity of a little naked foot lying upon its ankle then matho took up the lamp very gently 
she was sleeping with her cheek in one hand and with the other arm extended her ringlets were spread about her in such abundance that she appeared to be lying on black feathers and in her ample white tunic wound in soft draperies to her feet following the curves of her person her eyes were just visible beneath her half-closed eyelids the curtains which stretched perpendicularly enveloped her in a bluish atmosphere and the motion of her breathing communicating itself to the cords seemed to rock her in the air a long mosquito was buzzing matho stood motionless holding the silver lamp at arm's length but on a sudden the mosquito net caught fire and disappeared and salambo awoke the fire had gone out of itself she did not speak the lamp caused great luminous moires to flicker on the wainscots what is it she said he replied tis the veil of the goddess the veil of the goddess cried salambo and supporting herself on both clenched hands she leaned shuddering out he resumed i have been in the depth of the sanctuary to seek it for you look the zaimph shone a mass of rays do you remember it said matho you appeared at night in my dreams but i did not guess the mute command of your eyes she put out one foot upon the ebony stool had i understood i should have hastened hither i should have forsaken the army i should not have left carthage to obey you i would go down through the caverns of hadramentum into the kingdom of the shades forgive me it was as though mountains were weighing upon my days and yet something drew me on i tried to come to you should i ever have dared this without the gods let us go you must follow me or if you do not wish to do so i will remain what matters it to me drown my soul in your breath let my lips be crushed with kissing your hands let me see it she said nearer nearer day was breaking and the sheets of talc in the walls were filled with a vinous colour salambo leaned fainting against the cushions of the bed i love you cried matho give it she stammered out and they drew closer together she kept advancing clothed in her white trailing simar and with her large eyes fastened on the veil matho gazed at her dazzled by the splendours of her head and holding out the zaimph towards her was about to enfold her in an embrace she was stretching out her arms suddenly she stopped and they stood looking at each other open-mouthed then without understanding the meaning of his solicitation a horror seized upon her her delicate eyebrows rose her lips opened she trembled at last she struck one of the brass pateras which hung at the corners of the red mattress crying to the rescue to the rescue back sacrilegious man infamous and accursed help tarnach kraum eva mikipsa scowl and the scared face of spendius appearing in the wall between the clay flagons cried out these words fly they are hastening hither a great tumult came towards shaking the staircases and a flood of people women serving men and slaves 
rushed into the room with stakes tomahawks cutlasses and daggers they were nearly paralyzed with indignation on perceiving a man the female servants uttered funeral wailings and the eunuchs grew pale beneath their black skins matho was standing behind the balustrades with the zaimph which was wrapped about him he looked like a sidereal god surrounded by the firmament the slaves were going to fall upon him but she stopped them touch it not it is the mantle of the goddess she had drawn back into a corner but she took a step towards him and stretched forth her naked arm a curse upon you you who have plundered tanith hatred vengeance massacre and grief may gurzel god of battles rend you may mastiman god of the dead stifle you and may the other he who may not be named burn you matho uttered a cry as though he had received a sword thrust she repeated several times be gone be gone the crowd of servants spread out and matho with hanging head passed slowly through the midst of them but at the door he stopped for the fringe of the zaimph had caught on one of the golden stars with which the flagstones were paved he pulled it off abruptly with a movement of his shoulder and went down the staircases spendius bounding from terrace to terrace and leaping over the hedges and trenches had escaped from the gardens he reached the foot of the pharos the wall was discontinued at this spot so inaccessible was the cliff he advanced to the edge lay down on his back and let himself slide feet foremost down the whole length of it to the bottom then by swimming he reached the cape of the tombs made a wide circuit of the salt lagoon and re-entered the camp of the barbarians in the evening the sun had risen and like a retreating lion matho went down the pass casting terrible glances about him a vague clamour reached his ears it had started from the palace and it was beginning afresh in the distance towards the acropolis some said that the treasure of the republic had been seized in the temple of moloch others spoke of the assassination of a priest it was thought moreover that the barbarians had entered the city matho who did not know how to get out of the enclosures walked straight before him he was seen and an outcry was raised every one understood and there was consternation then immense wrath from the bottom of the mappalian quarter from the heights of the acropolis from the catacombs from the borders of the lake the multitude came in haste the patricians left their palaces and the traders left their shops the women forsook their children swords hatches and sticks were seized but the obstacle which had stayed salambo stayed them how could the veil be taken back the mere sight of it was a crime it was of the nature of the gods and contact with it was death the despairing priests wrung their hands on the peristyles of the temples the guards of the legion galloped about at random the people climbed upon the houses the terraces the shoulders of the colossuses and the masts of the ships he went on nevertheless and the rage and the terror also increased at each of his steps 
the streets cleared at his approach and the torrent of flying men strained on both sides up to the tops of the walls everywhere he could perceive only eyes opened widely as if to devour him chattering teeth and outstretched fists and salambo's imprecations resounded many times renewed suddenly a long arrow whizzed past then another and stones began to buzz about him but the missiles being badly aimed for there was the dread of hitting the zaimph passed over his head moreover he made a shield of the veil holding it to the right to the left before him and behind him and they could devise no expedient he quickened his steps more and more advancing through the open streets they were barred with cords chariots and snares and all his windings brought him back again at last he entered the square of carmon where the balearians had perished and stopped growing pale as one about to die this time he was surely lost and the multitude clapped their hands he ran up to the great gate which was closed it was very high made throughout of heart of oak with iron nails and sheathed with brass matto flung himself against it the people stamped their feet with joy when they saw the impotence of his fury then he took his sandal spit upon it and beat the immovable panels with it the whole city howled the veil was forgotten now and they were about to crush him matto gazed with wide vacant eyes upon the crowd his temples were throbbing with violence enough to stun him and he felt a numbness as of intoxication creeping over him suddenly he caught sight of the long chain used in working the swinging of the gate with a bound he grasped it stiffening his arms and making a buttress of his feet and at last the huge leaves partly opened then when he was outside he took the great zaimph from his neck and raised it as high as possible above his head the material upborne by the sea breeze shone in the sunlight with its colours its gems and the figures of its guards matto bore it thus across the whole plain as far as the soldiers tents and the people on the walls watched the fortune of carthage depart End of chapter five Chapter Six, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Six, Part One. Hanno. I ought to have carried her off, Matto said in the evening to Spendius. I should have seized her and torn her from her house. No one would have dared to touch me spendius was not listening to him stretched on his back he was taking delicious rest beside a large jar filled with honey-coloured water into which he would dip his head from time to time in order to drink more copiously matter resumed what is to be done how can we re-enter carthage i do not know said spendius 
such impassibility exasperated matto and he exclaimed why the fault is yours you carry me away and then you forsake me coward that you are why pray should i obey you do you think that you are my master ah you prostitute you slave you son of a slave he ground his teeth and raised his broad hand above spendius the greek did not reply an earthen lamp was burning gently against the tent-pole where the zaimph shone amid the hanging panoply suddenly matho put on his coturni buckled on his brazen jacket of mail and took his helmet where are you going asked spendius i am returning leave me alone i will bring her back and if they show themselves i will crush them like vipers i will put her to death spendius yes he repeated i will kill her you shall see i will kill her but spendius who was listening eagerly snatched up the zaimph abruptly and threw it into a corner heaping up fleeces above it a murmuring of voices was heard torches gleamed and narhavas entered followed by about twenty men they wore white woollen cloaks long daggers copper necklaces wooden earrings and boots of hyena skin and standing on the threshold they leaned upon their lances like herdsmen resting themselves narhavas was the handsomest of all his slender arms were bound with straps ornamented with pearls the golden circlet which fastened his ample garment about his head held an ostrich feather which hung down behind his shoulder his teeth were displayed in a continual smile his eyes seemed sharpened like arrows and there was something observant and airy about his whole demeanour he declared that he had come to join the mercenaries for the republic had long been threatening his kingdom accordingly he was interested in assisting the barbarians and he might also be of service to them i will provide you with elephants my forests are full of them wine oil barley dates pitch and sulphur for sieges twenty thousand foot soldiers and ten thousand horses if i address myself to you matto it is because the possession of the zaimph has made you chief man in the army moreover he added we are old friends matto however was looking at spendius who seated on the sheepskins was listening and giving little nods of assent the while narhavas continued speaking he called the gods to witness he cursed carthage in his imprecations he broke a javelin all his men uttered simultaneously a loud howl and matto carried away by so much passion exclaimed that he accepted the alliance a white bull and a black sheep the symbols of day and night were then broad and their throats were cut on the edge of a ditch when the latter was full of blood they dipped their arms into it then narhavas spread out his hand upon matto's breast and matto did the same to narhavas they repeated the stain upon the canvas of their tents afterwards they passed the night in eating and the remaining portions of the meat were burnt together with the skin bones horns and hoofs matto had been greeted with great shouting when he had come back bearing the veil of the goddess even those who were not of the kanainitish religion were made by their vague enthusiasm to feel the arrival of a genius as to seizing the zaimph no one thought of it but the mysterious manner in which he had acquired it was sufficient in the minds of the barbarians 
to justify its possession such were the thoughts of the soldiers of the african race the others whose hatred was not of such long standing did not know how to make up their minds if they had had ships they would immediately have departed spendius narr havas and mato dispatched men to all the tribes on punic soil carthage was sapping the strength of these nations she wrung exorbitant taxes from them and arrears or even murmurings were punished with fetters the axe or the cross it was necessary to cultivate whatever suited the republic and to furnish what she demanded no one had the right of possessing a weapon when villages rebelled the inhabitants were sold governors were esteemed like wine-presses according to the quantity which they succeeded in extracting then beyond the regions immediately subject to carthage extended the allies roamed the nomads who might be let loose upon them by this system the crops were always abundant the studs skilfully managed and the plantations superb the elder cato a master in the matters of tillage and slaves was amazed at it ninety-two years later and the death cry which he repeated continually at rome was but the exclamation of jealous greed during the last war the exactions had been increased so that nearly all the towns of libya had surrendered to regulus to punish them a thousand talents twenty thousand oxen three hundred bags of gold dust and considerable advances of grain had been exacted from them and the chiefs of the tribes had been crucified or thrown to the lions tunis especially execrated carthage older than the metropolis it could not forgive her her greatness and it fronted her walls crouching in the mire on the water's edge like a venomous beast watching her transportation massacres and epidemics did not weaken it it had assisted archagathas the son of agathocles and the eaters of uncleanness found arms there at once the couriers had not yet set out when universal rejoicing broke out in the provinces without waiting for anything they strangled the controllers of the houses and the functionaries of the republic in the baths they took the old weapons that had been concealed out of the caves they forged swords with the iron of the ploughs the children sharpened javelins at the doors and the women gave their necklaces rings earrings and everything that could be employed for the destruction of carthage piles of lances were heaped up in the country towns like sheaves of maize cattle and money were sent off mato speedily paid the mercenaries their arrears and owing to this which was spendius's idea he was appointed commander-in-chief the scarlishim of the barbarians reinforcements of men poured in at the same time the aborigines appeared first and were followed by the slaves from the country caravans of negroes were seized and armed and merchants on their way to carthage despairing of any more certain profit mingled with the barbarians numerous bands were continually arriving from the heights of the acropolis the growing army might be seen but the guards of the legion were posted as sentries on the platform of the aqueduct and near them rose at intervals brazen vats in which floods of asphalt were boiling below in the plain the great crowd stirred tumultuously they were in a state of uncertainty feeling the embarrassment with which barbarians are always inspired when they met with walls Eudica and hippozaritus refused their alliance 
phoenician colonies like carthage they were self-governing and always had clauses inserted in the treaties concluded by the republic to distinguish them from the latter nevertheless they respected this strong sister of theirs who protected them and did not think that she could be vanquished by a mass of barbarians these would on the contrary be themselves exterminated they desired to remain neutral and live at peace but their position rendered them indispensable utica at the foot of the gulf was convenient for bringing assistance to carthage from without if utica alone were taken hippo Zaretes, six hours further distant along the coast would take its place and the metropolis being revictualled in this way would be impregnable spendius wished the siege to be undertaken immediately narhavas was opposed to this an advance should first be made upon the frontier this was the opinion of the veterans and of Mat himself and it was decided that spendius should go to attack utica and matto hippozarites while in the third place the main body should rest on tunis and occupy the plain of carthage otarius being in command as to narhavas he was to return to his own kingdom to procure elephants and to scour the roads with his cavalry the women cried out loudly against this decision they coveted the jewels of the punic ladies the libyans also protested they had been summoned against carthage and now they were going away from it the soldiers departed almost alone Mato commanded his own companions together with the iberians lusitanians and the men from the west and of the islands all those who spoke greek had asked for spendius on account of his cleverness great was the stupefaction when the army was seen suddenly in motion it stretched along beneath the mountain of ariana on the road to utica beside the sea a fragment remained before tunis the rest disappeared to reappear on the other shore of the gulf on the outskirts of the woods in which they were lost they were perhaps eighty thousand men the two tyrian cities would offer no resistance and they would return against carthage already there was a considerable army attacking it from the base of the isthmus and it would soon perish from famine for it was impossible to live without the aid of the provinces the citizens not paying contributions as they did at rome carthage was wanting in political genius her eternal anxiety for gain prevented her from having the prudence which results from loftier ambitions a gallery anchored on the libyan sands it was with toil that she maintained her position the nations roared like billows around her and the slightest storm shook this formidable machine the treasury was exhausted by the roman war and by all that had been squandered and lost in the bargaining with the barbarians nevertheless soldiers must be had and not a government would trust the republic ptolemaeus had lately refused at two thousand talents moreover the rape of the veil disheartened them spendius had clearly foreseen this but the nation feeling that it was hated clasped its money and its gods to its heart and its patriotism was sustained by the very constitution of its government first the power rested with all without any one being strong enough to engross it private debts were considered as public debts men of canaitish race had a monopoly of commerce and by multiplying the profits of piracy with those of usury by hard dealings in lands and slaves 
and with the poor fortunes were sometimes made these alone opened up all the magistracies and although authority and money were perpetuated in the same families people tolerated the oligarchy because they hoped ultimately to share in it the societies of merchants in which the laws were elaborated chose the inspectors of the exchequer who on leaving office nominated the hundred members of the council of the ancients themselves dependent on the grand assembly or general gathering of all the rich as to the two suffets the relics of the monarchy and the less than consuls they were taken from distinct families on the same day all kinds of enmities were contrived between them so that they might mutually weaken each other they could not deliberate concerning war and when they were vanquished the great council crucified them the power of carthage emanated therefore from the syssitia that is to say from a large court in the centre of malca at the place it was said where the first bark of phoenician sailors had touched the sea having retired a long way since then it was a collection of little rooms of archaic architecture built of palm trunks with corners of stone and separated from one another so as to accommodate the various societies separately the rich crowded there all day to discuss their own concerns and those of the government from the procuring of pepper to the extermination of rome thrice in a moon they would have their beds brought up to the lofty terrace running along the wall of the court and they might be seen from below at table in the air without cothurni or cloaks with their diamond-covered fingers wandering over the dishes and their large earrings hanging down among the flagons all fat and lusty half naked smiling and eating beneath the blue sky like great sharks sporting in the sea but just now they were unable to dissemble their anxiety they were too pale for that the crowd which waited for them at the gates escorted them to their palaces in order to obtain some news from them as in times of pestilence all the houses were shut the streets would fill and suddenly clear again people ascended the acropolis or ran to the harbour and the great council deliberated every night at last the people were convened in the square of Carmon, and it was decided to leave the management of things to hanno the conqueror of hecatompylos he was a true carthaginian devout crafty and pitiless towards the people of africa his revenues equalled those of the barkas no one had such experience in administrative affairs he decreed the enrolment of all healthy citizens he placed catapults on the towers he exacted exorbitant supplies of arms he even ordered the construction of fourteen galleys which were not required and he desired everything to be registered and carefully set down in writing he had himself conveyed to the arsenal the pharos and the treasuries of the temples his great litter was continually to be seen swinging from step to step as it ascended the staircase of the acropolis and then in his palace at night being unable to sleep he would yell out warlike manoeuvres in terrible tones so as to prepare himself for the fray in their extremity of terror all became brave the rich ranged themselves in line along the mappalian district at cockro and tucking up their robes practised themselves in handling the pike but for want of an instructor they had disputes about it they would sit down breathless upon the tombs and then begin again 
several even dieted themselves some imagined that it was necessary to eat a great deal in order to acquire strength while others who were inconvenienced by their corpulence weakened themselves with fasts in order to become thin Utica had already called several times upon carthage for assistance but hanno would not set out until the engines of war had been supplied with the last screws he lost three moons more in equipping the one hundred and twelve elephants that were lodged in the ramparts they were the conquerors of regulus the people loved them it was impossible to treat such old friends too well hanno had the brass plates which adorned their breasts recast their trunks gilt their towers enlarged and caparisons edged with very heavy fringes cut out of the handsomest purple finally as their drivers were called indians after the first ones no doubt who came from the indies he ordered them all to be costumed after the indian fashion that is to say with white pads around their temples and small drawers of byssus which with their transverse folds looked like two valves of a shell applied to the hips the army under autarius still remained before tunis it was hidden behind a wall made with mud from the lake and protected on the top by thorny brushwood some negroes had planted tall sticks here and there bearing frightful faces human masks made with birds feathers and jackals or serpents heads which gaped towards the enemy for the purpose of terrifying him and the barbarians reckoning themselves invincible through these means danced wrestled and juggled convinced that carthage would perish before long any one but hanno would easily have crushed such a multitude hampered as it was with herds and women moreover they knew nothing of drill and autarius was so disheartened that he had ceased to require it they stepped aside when he passed by rolling his big blue eyes then on reaching the edge of the lake he would draw back his seal-skin cloak unfasten the cord which tied up his long red hair and soak the letter in the water he regretted that he had not deserted to the romans along with the two thousand gauls of the temple of eryx often the sun would suddenly lose his rays in the middle of the day then the gulf and the open sea would seem as motionless as molten lead a cloud of brown dust stretching perpendicularly would speed whirling along the palm trees would bend and the sky disappear while stones would be heard rebounding on the animal's cruppers and the gaul his lips glued against the holes in his tent would gasp with exhaustion and melancholy his thoughts would be of the scent of the pastures on autumn mornings of snowflakes or of the bellowing of the urus lost in the fog and closing his eyelids he would in imagination behold the fires in long straw-roofed cottages flickering on the marshes in the depths of the woods others regretted their native lands as well as he even though they might not be so far away indeed the carthaginian captives could distinguish the velaria spread over the courtyards of their houses beyond the gulf on the slopes of bizra but sentries marched around them continually they were all fastened to a common chain each one wore an iron carcanet and the crowd was never weary of coming to gaze at them 
the women would show their little children the handsome robes hanging in tatters on their wasted limbs whenever otarius looked at gisco he was seized with rage at the recollection of the insult that he had received and he would have killed him but for the oath which he had taken to narhavas then he would go back into his tent and drink a mixture of barley and cumin until he swooned away from intoxication to awake afterwards in broad daylight consumed with horrible thirst End of chapter six part one Chapter six part two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter six part two. Mato, meanwhile, was besieging Hippo Zaritus, but the town was protected by a lake communicating with the sea it had three lines of circumvallation and upon the heights which surrounded it there extended a wall fortified with towers he had never commanded in such an enterprise before moreover he was beset with thoughts of salambo and he raved in the delight of her beauty as in the sweetness of a vengeance that transported him with pride he felt an acrid frenzied permanent want to see her again he even thought of presenting himself as the bearer of a flag of truce in the hope that once within carthage he might make his way to her often he would cause the assault to be sounded and waiting for nothing rush upon the mole which it was sought to construct in the sea he would snatch up the stones with his hands overturn strike and deal sword thrusts everywhere the barbarians would dash on pall mall the ladders would break with a loud crash and masses of men would tumble into the water causing it to fly up in red waves against the walls finally the tumult would subside and the soldiers would retire to make a fresh beginning mato would go and seat himself outside the tents wipe his blood-splashed face with his arm and gaze at the horizon in the direction of carthage in front of him among the olives palms myrtles and plains stretched two broad ponds which met another lake the outlines of which could not be seen behind one mountain other mountains reared themselves and in the middle of the immense lake rose an island perfectly black and pyramidical in form on the left at the extremity of the gulf were sand heaps like arrested waves large and pale while the sea flat as a pavement of lapis lazuli ascended by insensible degrees to the edge of the sky the vendor of the country was lost in places beneath long sheets of yellow carobs were shining like knobs of coral vine branches drooped from the tops of the sycamores the murmuring of the water could be heard crested larks were hopping about and the sun's latest fires gilded the carapaces of the tortoises as they came forth from the reeds to inhale the breeze mato would heave deep sighs he would lie flat on his face with his nails buried in the soil and weep he felt wretched paltry forsaken never would he possess her and he was unable even to take a town at night when alone in his tent he would gaze upon the zaimph of what use to him was this thing which belonged to the gods 
and doubt crept into the barbarian's thoughts then on the contrary it would seem to him that the vesture of the goddess was depending from salambo and that a portion of her soul hovered in it subtler than a breath and he would feel it breathe it in bury his face in it and kiss it with sobs he would cover his shoulders with it in order to delude himself that he was beside her sometimes he would suddenly steal away stride in the starlight over the sleeping soldiers as they lay wrapped in their cloaks spring upon a horse on reaching the camp gates and two hours later be at utica in spendius's tent at first he would speak of the siege but his coming was only to ease his sorrow by talking about salambo spendius exhorted him to be prudent drive away these trifles from your soul which is degraded by them formerly you were used to obey now you command an army and if carthage is not conquered we shall at least be granted provinces we shall become kings but how was it that the possession of the zaimph did not give them the victory according to spendius they must wait mato fancied that the veil affected people of canaitish race exclusively and in his barbarian-like subtlety he said to himself the zaimph will accordingly do nothing for me but since they have lost it it will do nothing for them afterwards a scruple troubled him he was afraid of offending moloch by worshipping abtuknos the god of the libyans and he timidly asked spendius to which of the gods it would be advisable to sacrifice a man keep on sacrificing laughed spendius mato who could not understand such indifference suspected the greek of having a genius of whom he did not speak all modes of worship as well as all races were to be met with in these armies of barbarians and consideration was had to the gods of others for they too inspired fear many mingled foreign practices with their native religion it was to no purpose that they did not adore the stars if a constellation were fatal or helpful sacrifices were offered to it an unknown amulet found by chance at a moment of peril became a divinity or it might be a name and nothing more which would be repeated without any attempt to understand its meaning but after pillaging temples and seeing numbers of nations and slaughters many ultimately ceased to believe in anything but destiny and death and every evening these would fall asleep with the placidity of wild beasts spendius had spit upon the images of jupiter olympius nevertheless he dreaded to speak aloud in the dark nor did he fail every day to put on his right boot first he reared a long quadrangular terrace in front of utica but in proportion as it ascended the rampart was also heightened and what was thrown down by the one side was almost immediately raised again by the other spendius took care of his men he dreamt of plans and strove to recall the stratagems which he had heard described in his travels but why did narr havas not return there was nothing but anxiety hanno had at last concluded his preparations one night when there was no moon he transported his elephants and soldiers on rafts across the gulf of carthage then they wheeled around the mountain of the hot springs so as to avoid alteritas and continued their march so slowly that instead of surprising the barbarians in the morning as the suffet had calculated they did not reach them until it was broad daylight on the third day 
Utica had on the east a plain which extended to the large lagoon of Carthage. Behind it a valley ran at right angles between two low and abruptly terminated mountains. The barbarians were encamped further to the left, in such a way as to blockade the harbour, and they were sleeping in their tents, for on that day both sides were too weary to fight and were resting when the carthaginian army appeared at the turning of the hills some camp followers furnished with slings were stationed at intervals on the wings the first line was formed of the guards of the legion in golden scale armour mounted on their big horses which were without mane hair or ears and had silver horns in the middle of their foreheads to make them look like rhinoceroses between their squadrons were youths wearing small helmets and swinging an ashen javelin in each hand the long files of the heavy infantry marched behind all these traders had piled as many weapons upon their bodies as possible some might be seen carrying an axe a lance a club and two swords all at once others bristled with darts like porcupines and their arms stood out from their caresses in sheets of horn or iron plates at last the scaffoldings of the lofty engines appeared caroballistas onagers catapults and scorpions rocking on chariots drawn by mules and quadringas of oxen and in proportion as the army drew out the captains ran panting right and left to deliver commands close up the files and preserve the intervals such of the ancients as held commands had common purple cassocks the magnificent fringes of which tangled in the white straps of their couturni their faces which were smeared all over with vermilion shone beneath enormous helmets surmounted with images of the gods and as they had shields with ivory borders covered with precious stones they might have been taken for suns passing over walls of brass but the carthaginians manoeuvred so clumsily that the soldiers in derision urged them to sit down they called out that they were just going to empty their big stomachs to dust the gilding of their skin and to give them iron to drink a strip of green cloth appeared at the top of the pole planted before spendius's tent it was the signal the carthaginian army replied to it with a great noise of trumpets cymbals flutes of asses bones and tympanums the barbarians had already leaped outside the palisades and were facing their enemies within a javelin's throw of them a balearic slinger took a step forward put one of his clay bullets into his thong and swung around his arm an ivory shield was shivered and the two armies mingled together the greeks made the horses rear and fall back upon their masters by pricking their nostrils with the points of their lances the slaves who were to hurl stones had picked such as were too big and they accordingly fell close on them the punic foot-soldiers exposed the right side in cutting with their long swords the barbarians broke their lines they slaughtered them freely they stumbled over the dying and dead quite blinded by the blood that spurted into their faces the confused heap of pikes helmets caresses and swords turned round about widening out and closing in with elastic contradictions the gaps increased more and more in the carthaginian cohorts the engines could not get out of the sand and finally the suffet's litter his grand litter with crystal pendants 
which from the beginning might have been seen tossing among the soldiers like a bark on the waves suddenly foundered he was no doubt dead the barbarians found themselves alone the dust around them fell and they were beginning to sing when hanno himself appeared on the top of an elephant he sat bareheaded beneath a parasol of byssus which was carried by a negro behind him his necklace of blue plates flapped against the flowers on his black tunic his huge arms were compressed within circles of diamonds and with open mouth he brandished a pike of inordinate size which spread out at the end like lotus and flashed more than a mirror immediately the earth shook and the barbarians saw all the elephants of carthage with their gilt tusks and blue painted ears hastening up in a single line clothed with bronze and shaking the leathern towers which were placed above their scarlet caparisons in each of which were three archers bending large bows the soldiers were barely in possession of their arms they had taken up their positions at random they were frozen with terror they stood undecided javelins arrows phalaricas and masses of lead were already being showered down upon them from the towers some clung to the fringes of the comparisons in order to climb up but their hands were struck off with cutlasses and they fell backwards upon the sword's points the pikes were too weak and broke and the elephants passed through the phalanxes like wild boars through tufts of grass they plucked up the stakes of the camp with their trunks and traversed it from one end to the other overthrowing the tents with their breasts all the barbarians had fled they were hiding themselves in the hills bordering the valley by which the carthaginians had come the victorious hanno presented himself before the gates of utica he had a trumpet sounded the three judges of the town appeared in the opening of the battlements on the summit of a tower but the people of utica would not receive such well-armed guests hanno was furious at last they consented to admit him with a feeble escort the streets were too narrow for the elephants they had to be left outside as soon as the suffet was in the town the principal men came to greet him he had himself taken to the vapour baths and called for his cooks three hours afterward he was still immersed in the oil of cinnamonum with which the basin had been filled and while he bathed he ate flamingo's tongs with honeyed poppy seeds on a spread ox hide beside him was his greek physician motionless in a long yellow robe directing the reheating of the bath from time to time and two young boys leaned over the steps of the basin and rubbed his legs but attention to his body did not check his love for the commonwealth for he was dictating a letter to be sent to the great council and as some prisoners had just been taken he was asking himself what terrible punishment could be devised stop said he to a slave who stood writing in the hollow of his hand let some of them be brought to me i wish to see them and from the bottom of the hall full of a whitish vapour on which the torches cast red spots three barbarians were thrust forward a samnite a spartan and a cappadocian proceed rejoice light of the baals your suffet has exterminated the ravenous hounds blessings on the republic give orders for prayers he perceived the captives and burst out laughing 
ah my fine fellows of sicca you are not shouting so loudly to-day it is i do you recognize me and where are your swords what really terrible fellows and he pretended to be desirous to hide himself as if he were afraid of them you demanded horses women estates magistracies no doubt and priesthoods why not well i will provide you with the estates and such as you will never come out of you shall be married to gibbets that are perfectly new your pay it shall be melted in your mouths in leaden ingots and i will put you into good and very exalted positions among the clouds so as to bring you close to the eagles the three long-haired and ragged barbarians looked at him without understanding what he said wounded in the knees they had been seized by having ropes thrown over them and the ends of the great chains on their hands trailed upon the pavement hanno was indignant at their impassibility on your knees on your knees jackals dust vermin excrements and they make no reply enough be silent let them be flayed alive uh, no presently he was breathing like a hippopotamus and rolling his eyes the perfumed oil overflowed beneath the mass of his body and clinging to the scales on his skin made it look pink in the light of the torches he resumed for four days we suffered greatly from the sun some mules were lost in crossing the makaras in spite of their position the extraordinary courage ah demonades how i suffer have the bricks reheated and let them be red-hot a noise of rakes and furnaces was heard the incense smoked more strongly in the large perfuming pans and the shampooers who were quite naked and were sweating like sponges crushed a paste composed of wheat sulphur black wine bitches milk myrrh galbanum and storax upon his joints he was consumed with incessant thirst but the yellow-robed man did not yield to his inclination and held out to him a golden cup in which viper broth was smoking drink said he that strength of sun-born serpents may penetrate into the marrow of your bones and take courage or reflection of the gods you know moreover that a priest of eskmoun watches those cruel stars around the dog from which your malady is derived they are growing pale like the spots on your skin and you are not to die from them oh yes that is so is it not repeated the suffet i am not to die from them and his violaceous lips gave forth a breath more nauseous than the exhalation from a corpse two coals seemed to burn in the place of his eyes which had lost their eyebrows a mass of wrinkled skin hung over his forehead both his ears stood out from his head and were beginning to increase in size and the deep lines forming semicircles around his nostrils gave him a strange and terrifying appearance the look of a wild beast his unnatural voice was like a roar he said perhaps you are right demonades in fact there are many ulcers here which have closed i feel robust here look how i am eating and less from greediness than from ostentation and the desire to prove to himself that he was in good health he cut into the forcemeats of cheese and marjoram the boned fish gourds oysters with eggs horseradishes truffles and brochettes of small birds as he looked at the prisoners he revelled in the imagination of their tortures nevertheless he remembered sicca 
and the rage caused by all his woes found vent in the abuse of these three men ah traitors ah wretches infamous accursed creatures and you outraged me me the suffet their services the price of their blood say they ah yes their blood their blood then speaking to himself all shall perish no one shall be sold it would be better to bring them to carthage i should be seen but doubtless i have not brought chains enough right send me how many of them are there go and ask mutumbal go now pity and let all their hands be cut off and brought to me in baskets but strange cries at once hoarse and shrill penetrated into the hall above hanno's voice and the rattling of the dishes that were being placed around him they increased and suddenly the furious trumpeting of the elephants burst forth as if the battle were beginning again a great tumult was going on around the town the carthaginians had not attempted to pursue the barbarians they had taken up their quarters at the foot of the walls with their baggage mules serving men and all their train of satraps and they made merry in their beautiful pearl-bordered tents while the camp of the mercenaries was now nothing but a heap of ruins in the plain spendius had recovered his courage he dispatched zaxas to mato scoured the woods rallied his men the losses had been inconsiderable and they were reforming their lines enraged at having been conquered without a fight when they discovered a vat of petroleum which had no doubt been abandoned by the carthaginians then spendius had some pigs carried off from the farms smeared them with bitumen set them on fire and drove them towards utica the elephants were terrified by the flames and fled the ground sloped upwards javelins were thrown at them and they turned back and with great blows of ivory and trampling feet they ripped up the carthaginians stifled them flattened them the barbarians descended the hill behind them the punic camp which was without entrenchments was sacked at the first rush and the carthaginians were crushed against the gates which were not opened through fear of the mercenaries day broke and matho's foot-soldiers were seen coming up from the west at the same time horsemen appeared they were narhavas with his numidians leaping ravines and bushes they ran down the fugitives like greyhounds pursuing hares the change of fortune interrupted the suffet he called out to be assisted to leave the vapour bath the three captives were still before him then a negro the same who had carried his parasol in the battle leaned over to his ear well replied the suffet slowly ah kill them he added in an abrupt tone the ethiopian drew a long dagger from his girdle and the three heads fell one of them rebounded among the remains of the feast and leaped into the basin where it floated for some time with open mouth and staring eyes the morning light entered through the chinks in the wall the three bodies streamed with great bubbles like three fountains and a sheet of blood flowed over the mosaics with their powdering of blue dust the suffet dipped his hand into this hot mire and rubbed his knees with it it was a cure when evening had come he stole away from the town with his escort and made his way into the mountain to rejoin his army he succeeded in finding the remains of it 
four days afterward he was on the top of the defile at gorza when the troops under spendius appeared below twenty stout lances might easily have checked them by attacking the head of their column but the carthaginians watched them pass by in a stare of stupefaction hanno recognized the king of the numidians in the rear-guard narhavas bowed to him at the same time making a sign which he did not understand the return to carthage took place amid all kinds of terrors they marched only at night hiding in the olive woods during the day there were deaths at every halting-place several times they believed themselves lost at last they reached cape hermaeum where vessels came to receive them hanno was so fatigued so desperate the loss of the elephants in particular overwhelmed him that he demanded poison from demonades in order to put an end to it all moreover he could already feel himself stretched upon the cross carthage had not strength enough to be indignant with him its losses had amounted to one hundred thousand nine hundred and seventy-two shekels of silver fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty-three shekels of gold eighteen elephants fourteen members of the great council three hundred of the rich eight thousand citizens corn enough for three moons a considerable quantity of baggage and all the engines of war the defection of narhavas was certain and both sieges were beginning again the army under autaritis now extended from tunis to rades from the top of the acropolis long columns of smoke might be seen in the country ascending to the sky they were the mansions of the rich which were set on fire one man alone could have saved the republic people repented that they had slighted him and the peace party itself voted holocausts for hamilcar's return the sight of the zaimph had upset salambo at night she thought that she could hear the footsteps of the goddess and she would awake terrified and shrieking every day she sent food to the temples Tanakh was worn out with executing her orders and shahabarim never left her End of chapter six part two Chapter Seven, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Seven, Hamilcar Barca, Part One. The announcer of the moons, who watched on the summit of the temple of Eskmoun every night in order to signal the disturbances of the planet with his trumpet one morning perceived towards the west something like a bird skimming the surface of the sea with its long wings it was a ship with three tires of oars and with a horse carved on the prow the sun was rising the announcer of the moons put up his hand before his eyes and then grasping his clarion with outstretched arms sounded a loud brazen cry over carthage people came out of every house they would not believe what was said they disputed with one another the mole was covered with people at last they recognized hamilcar's tyram it advanced in fierce and haughty fashion cleaving the foam around it 
the latine yard quite square and the sail bulging down the whole length of the mast its gigantic oars kept time as they beat the water every now and then the extremity of the keel which was shaped like a ploughshare would appear and the ivory-headed horse rearing both its feet beneath the spur which terminated the prow would seem to be speeding over the plains of the sea as it rounded the promontory the wind ceased the sail fell and a man was seen standing bareheaded beside the pilot it was he hamilcar the suffet about his sides he wore gleaming sheets of steel a red cloak fastened to his shoulders left his arms visible two pearls of great length hung from his ears and his black bushy beard rested on his breast the galley however tossing amid the rocks was proceeding along the side of the mole and the crowd followed it on the flagstones shouting greeting blessing i of Carmon, ah deliver us tis the fault of the rich they want to put you to death take care of yourself barca he made no reply as if the loud clamour of oceans and battles had completely deafened him but when he was below the staircase leading down from the acropolis hamilcar raised his head and looked with folded arms upon the temple of eschmoun his gaze mounted higher still to the great pure sky he shouted an order in a harsh voice to his sailors the tireem leaped forward it graced the idol set up at the corner of the mole to stay the storms and in the merchant harbour which was full of filth fragments of wood and rinds of fruit it pushed aside and crushed against the other ships moored to stakes and terminating in crocodile's jaws the people hastened thither and some threw themselves into the water to swim to it it was already at the very end before the gate which bristled with nails the gate rose and the tireem disappeared beneath the deep arch the military harbour was completely separated from the town when ambassadors arrived they had to proceed between two walls through a passage which had its outlet on the left in front of the temple of Carmon. this great expanse of water was as round as a cup and was bordered with quays on which sheds were built for sheltering the ships before each of these rose two pillars bearing the horns of ammon on their capitals and forming continuous porticos all around the basin on an island in the centre stood a house for the marine suffet the water was so limpid that the bottom was visible with its paving of white pebbles the noise of the straits did not reach so far and hamilcar as he passed recognized the triremes which he had formerly commanded not more than twenty perhaps remained under shelter on the land leaning over on their sides or standing upright on their keels with lofty poops and swelling prows and covered with gildings and mystic symbols the chimeras had lost their wings the patek gods their arms the bulls their silver horns and half painted motionless and rotten as they were yet full of associations and still emitting the scent of voyages they all seemed to say to him like mutilated soldiers on seeing their master again tis we tis we and you too are vanquished no one excepting the marine suffet might enter the admiral's house so long as there was no proof of his death he was considered as still in existence 
in this way the ancients avoided a master the more and they had not failed to comply with the custom in respect to hamilcar the suffet proceeded into the deserted apartments at every step he recognized armor and furniture familiar objects which nevertheless astonished him and in a perfuming pan in the vestibule there even remained the ashes of the perfumes that had been kindled at his departure for the conjuration of melkarth it was not thus that he had hoped to return everything that he had done everything that he had seen unfolded itself in his memory assaults conflagrations legions tempests Depranum, syracuse lilibaeum mount etna the plateau of eryx five years of battles until the fatal day when arms had been laid down and sicily had been lost then he once more saw the woods of citron trees and herdsmen with their goats on grey mountains and his heart leaped at the thought of the establishment of another carthage down yonder his projects and his recollections buzzed through his head which was still dizzy from the pitching of the vessel he was overwhelmed with anguish and becoming suddenly weak he felt the necessity of drawing near to the guards then he went up to the highest story of his house and taking a nail-studded staple from a golden shell which hung on his arm he opened a small oval chamber it was softly lighted by means of delicate black discs let into the wall and as transparent as glass between the rows of these equal discs holes like those for the urns in columbaria were hollowed out each of them contained a round dark stone which appeared to be very heavy only people of superior understanding honoured these abadirs which had fallen from the moon by their fall they denoted the stars the sky and fire by their colour dark night and by their density the cohesion of terrestrial things a stifling atmosphere filled this mystic place the round stones lying in the niches were whitened somewhat with sea-sand which the wind had no doubt driven through the door hamilcar counted them one after another with the tip of his finger then he hid his face in a saffron-coloured veil and falling on his knees stretched himself on the ground with both arms extended the daylight outside was beginning to strike on the folding shutters of black lattice-work arborescence hillocks eddies and ill-defined animals appeared in their diaphanous thickness and the light came terrifying and yet peaceful as it must be behind the sun in the dull spaces of future creations he strove to banish from his thoughts all forms and all symbols and appellations of the gods that he might the better apprehend the immutable spirit which outward appearances took away something of the planetary vitalities penetrated him and he felt with all a wiser and more intimate scorn of death and of every accident when he rose he was filled with serene fearlessness and was proof against pity or dread and as his chest was choking he went to the top of the tower which overlooked carthage the town sank downwards in a long hollow curve with its cupolas its temples its golden roofs its houses its clusters of palm trees here and there and its glass balls with streaming rays while the ramparts formed as it were the gigantic border of this horn of plenty which poured itself out before him far below he could see the harbours the squares the interiors of the courts the plan of the streets and the people who seemed very small and but little above the level of the pavement 
ah if hanno had not arrived too late on the morning of the agassian islands he fastened his eyes on the extreme horizon and stretched forth his quivering arms in the direction of rome the steps of the acropolis were occupied by the multitude in the square of carmon the people were pressing forward to see the suffet come out and the terraces were gradually being loaded with people a few recognized him and he was saluted but he retired in order the better to excite the impatience of the people hamilcar found the most important men of his party below in the hall istaten subedia hictamon Yoibas and others they related to him all that had taken place since the conclusion of the peace the greed of the ancients the departure of the soldiers their return their demands the capture of gisco the theft of the zaimph the relief and subsequent abandonment of utica but no one ventured to tell him of the events which concerned himself at last they separated to meet again during the night in the assembly of the ancients in the temple of moloch they had just gone out when a tumult arose outside the door some one was trying to enter in spite of the servants and as the disturbance was increasing hamilcar ordered the stranger to be shown in an old negress made her appearance broken wrinkled trembling stupid-looking wrapped to the heels in ample blue veils she advanced face to face with the suffet and they looked at each other for some time suddenly hamilcar started at a wave of his hand the slaves withdrew then signing to her to walk with precaution he drew her by the arm into a remote apartment the negress threw herself upon the floor to kiss his feet he raised her brutally where have you left him idibal down there master and extricating herself from her veils she rubbed her face with her sleeve the black colour the senile trembling the bent figure disappeared and there remained a strong old man whose skin seemed tanned by sand wind and sea a tuft of white hair rose on his skull like the crest of a bird and he indicated his disguise as it lay on the ground with an ironic glance you have done well idibal tis well then piercing him as it were with his keen gaze no one yet suspects the old man swore to him by the kabiri that the mystery had been kept they never left their cottage which was three days journey from hadramentum on a shore pebbled with turtles and with palms on the dune and in accordance with your command o oh master i teach him to hurl the javelin and to drive a team he is strong is he not yes master and intrepid as well he has no fear of serpents or thunder or phantoms he runs barefooted like a herdsman along the brinks of precipices speak speak he invents snares for wild beasts would you believe it that last moon he surprised an eagle he dragged it away and the bird's blood and the child's were scattered in the air in large drops like driven roses the animal in its fury enwrapped him in the beating of its wings he strained it against his breast and as it died his laughter increased piercing and proud like the clashing of swords hamilcar bent his head dazzled by such presages of greatness but he has been for some time restless and disturbed he gazes at the sails passing far out at sea he is melancholy he rejects bread 
he inquires about the guards and he wishes to become acquainted with carthage no no not yet exclaimed the suffet the old slave seemed to understand the peril which alarmed hamilcar and he resumed how is he to be restrained already i am obliged to make him promises and i have come to carthage only to buy him a dagger with a silver handle and pearls all around it then he told how having perceived the suffet on the terrace he had passed himself off on the waters of the harbour as one of salambo's women so as to make his way in to him hamilcar remained for a long time apparently lost in deliberation at last he said to-morrow you will present yourself at sunset behind the purple factories in megara and imitate a jackal's cry three times if you do not see me you will return to carthage on the first day of every moon forget nothing love him you may speak to him now about hamilcar the slave resumed his costume and they left the house and the harbour together hamilcar went on his way alone on foot and without an escort for the meetings of the ancients were under extraordinary circumstances always secret and were resorted to mysteriously at first he went along the western front of the acropolis and then passed through the green market the galleries of Kinisto and the perfumer's suburb the scattered lights were being extinguished the broader streets grew still then shadows glided through the darkness they followed him others appeared and like him they all directed their course towards the mappalian district the temple of moloch was built at the foot of a steep defile in a sinister spot from below nothing could be seen but lofty walls rising indefinitely like those of a monstrous tomb the night was gloomy a greyish fog seemed to weigh upon the sea which beat against the cliff with a noise as of death rattles and sobs and the shadows gradually vanished as if they had passed through the walls but as soon as the doorway was crossed one found oneself in a vast quadrangular court bordered by arcades in the centre rose a mass of architecture with eight equal faces it was surmounted by cupolas which thronged around a second story supporting a kind of rotunda from which sprang a cone with a re-entrant curve and terminating in a ball on the summit fires were burning in cylinders of filigree work fitted upon poles which men were carrying to and fro these lights flickered in the gusts of wind and reddened the golden combs which fastened their plaited hair on the nape of the neck they ran about calling to one another to receive the ancients here and there on the flagstones huge lions were couched like sphinxes living symbols of the devouring sun they were slumbering with half-closed eyelids but roused by the footsteps and voices they rose slowly came towards the ancients whom they recognized by their dresses and rubbed themselves against their thighs arching their backs with sonorous yawns the vapour of their breath passed across the light of the torches the stir increased doors locked all the priests fled and the ancients disappeared beneath the columns which formed a deep vestibule around the temple these columns were arranged in such a way that their circular ranks which were contained one within another showed the saturnian period with its years the years with their months and the months with their days and finally reached to the walls of the sanctuary 
here it was that the ancients laid aside their sticks of narwhal's horn for a law which was always observed inflicted the punishment of death upon any one entering the meeting with any kind of weapon several wore a rent repaired with a strip of purple at the bottom of their garment to show that they had not been economical in their dress when mourning for their relatives and this testimony to their affliction prevented the slit from growing larger others had their beards enclosed in little bags of violet skin and fastened to their ears by two cords they all accosted one another by embracing breast to breast they surrounded hamilcar with congratulations they might have been taken for brothers meeting their brother again these men were generally thick-set with curved noses like those of the assyrian colossi in a few however the more prominent cheekbone a taller figure and the narrower foot betrayed an african origin and nomad ancestors those who lived continually shut up in their counting-houses had pale faces others showed in theirs the severity of the desert and strange jewels sparkled on all the fingers of their hands which were burnt by unknown suns the navigators might be distinguished by their rolling gait while the men of agriculture smelt of the wine-press dried herbs and the sweat of mules these old pirates had lands under tillage these money-grubbers would fit out ships these proprietors of cultivated lands supported slaves who followed trades all were skilled in religious discipline experts in strategy pitiless and rich they looked wearied of prolonged cares their flaming eyes expressed distrust and their habits of travelling and lying trafficking and commanding gave an appearance of cunning and violence a sort of discreet and convulsive brutality to their whole demeanour further the influence of the god cast a gloom upon them they first passed through a vaulted hall which was shaped like an egg seven doors corresponding to the seven planets displayed seven squares of different colours against the wall after traversing a long room they entered another similar hall a candelabrum completely covered with chiselled flowers was burning at the far end and each of its eight golden branches bore a wick of byssus in a diamond chalice it was placed upon the last of the long steps leading to a great altar the corners of which terminated in horns of brass two lateral staircases led to its flattened summit the stones of it could not be seen it was like a mountain of heaped cinders and something indistinct was slowly smoking at the top of it then further back higher than the candelabrum and much higher than the altar rose the moloch all of iron and with gaping apertures in his human breast his outspread wings were stretched upon the wall his tapering hands reached down to the ground three black stones bordered by yellow circles represented three eyeballs on his brow and his bull's head was raised with a terrible effort as if in order to bellow ebony stools were ranged around the apartment behind each of them was a bronze shaft resting on three claws and supporting a torch all these lights were reflected in the mother-of-pearl lozenges which formed the pavement of the hall so lofty was the letter that the red colour of the walls grew black as it rose toward the vaulted roof and the three eyes of the idol appeared far above like stars half lost in the night 
the ancients sat down on the ebony stools after putting the trains of their robes over their heads they remained motionless with their hands crossed inside their broad sleeves and the mother-of-pearl pavement seemed like a luminous river streaming from the altar to the door and flowing beneath their naked feet End of chapter seven part one Chapter seven part two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter seven part two the four pontiffs had their places in the centre sitting back to back on four ivory seats which formed a cross the high priest of eskmoun in a hyacinth robe the high priest of tanith in a white linen robe the high priest of Carmon in a tawny woollen robe and the high priest of moloch in a purple robe hamilcar advanced towards the candelabrum he walked all round it looking at the burning wicks then he threw a scented powder upon them and violet flames appeared at the extremities of the branches then a shrill voice rose another replied to it and the hundred ancients the four pontiffs and hamilcar who remained standing simultaneously intoned a hymn and their voices ever repeating the same syllables and strengthening the sounds rose grew loud became terrible and then suddenly were still there was a pause for some time at last hamilcar drew from his breast a little three-headed statuette as blue as a sapphire and placed it before him it was the image of truth the very genius of his speech then he replaced it in his bosom and all as if seized with sudden wrath cried out they are good friends of yours are the barbarians infamous traitor you come back to see us perish do you not let him speak no no they were taking their revenge for the constraint to which political ceremonial had just obliged them and even though they had wished for hamilcar's return they were now indignant that he had not anticipated their disasters or rather that he had not endured them as well as they when the tumult had subsided the pontiff of moloch rose we ask you why you did not return to carthage what is that to you replied the suffet disdainfully their shouts were redoubled of what do you accuse me i managed the war badly perhaps you have seen how i order my battles you who conveniently allow barbarians enough enough he went on in a low voice so as to make himself the better listened to oh that is true i am wrong lights of the baals there are intrepid men amongst you gisco rise and surveying the step of the altar with half-closed eyelids as if he sought for some one he repeated rise gisco you can accuse me they will protect you but where is he then as if he remembered himself ah in his house no doubt surrounded by his sons commanding his slaves happy and counting on the wall the necklaces of honour which his country has given to him 
they moved about raising their shoulders as if they were being scourged with thongs you do not even know whether he is living or dead and without giving any heed to their clamours he said that in deserting the suffet they had deserted the republic so too the peace with rome however advantageous it might appear to them was more fatal than twenty battles a few those who were the least rich of the council and were suspected of perpetual leanings towards the people or towards tyranny applauded their opponents chief of the Sicitia and administrators triumphed over them in point of numbers and the more eminent of them had ranged themselves close to hanno who was sitting at the other end of the hall before the lofty door which was closed by a hanging of hyacinth colour he had covered the ulcers on his face with paint but the gold dust in his hair had fallen upon his shoulders where it formed two brilliant sheets so that his hair appeared whitish fine and frizzled like a wool his hands were enveloped in linen soaked in a greasy perfume which dripped upon the pavement and his disease had no doubt considerably increased for his eyes were hidden beneath the folds of his eyelids he had thrown back his head in order to see his partisans urged him to speak at last in a hoarse and hideous voice he said less arrogance barca we have all been vanquished each one supports his own misfortune be resigned tell us rather said hamilcar smiling how it was that you steered your galleys into the roman fleet i was driven by the wind replied hanno you are like a rhinoceros trampling on his dung you are displaying your own folly be silent and they began to indulge in recriminations respecting the battle of the agatian islands hanno accused him of not having come to meet him but that would have left eric's undefended you ought to have stood out from the coast what prevented you ah, i forgot all elephants are afraid of the sea hamilcar's followers thought this jest so good that they burst into loud laughter the vault rang with it like the beating of tympanums hanno denounced the unworthiness of such an insult the disease had come upon him from a cold taken at the siege of hecatompylos and tears flowed down his face like winter rain on a ruined wall hamilcar resumed if you had loved me as much as him there would be great joy in carthage now how many times did i not call upon you and you always refused me money we had need of it said the chiefs of the Sicitia. and when things were desperate with me we drank mules urine and ate the straps of our sandals when i would fain have had the blades of grass soldiers and made battalions with the rottenness of our dead you recalled the vessels that i had left we could not risk everything replied bart baal who possessed gold mines in deretian gatulia but what did you do here at carthage in your houses behind your walls there are gauls on the eridanus who ought to have been roused canaites at cyrene who would have come and while the romans sent ambassadors to ptolemaeus now he is extolling the romans to us some one shouted out to him how much have they paid you to defend them ask that of the plains of brutium of the ruins of the locri of metapontum and of heraclea 
i have burnt all their trees i have pillaged all their temples and even to the death of their grandchildren's grandchildren why you disclaim like a rhetor said kapuras a very illustrious merchant what is it that you want i say that we must be more ingenuous or more terrible if the whole of africa rejects your yoke the reason is my feeble masters that you do not know how to fasten it on their shoulders agatocles regulus copio any bold man has only to land and capture her and when the libyans in the east concert with the numidians in the west and the nomads come from the south and the romans from the north a cry of horror rose oh you will beat your breasts and roll in the dust and tear your cloaks no matter you will have to go and turn the millstone in the subura and gather grapes on the hills of latium they smote their right thighs to mark their sense of the scandal and the sleeves of their robes rose like large wings of startled birds hamilcar carried away by his spirit continued his speech standing on the highest steps of the altar quivering and terrible he raised his arms and the rays from the candelabrum which burned behind him passed between his fingers like javelins of gold you will lose your ships your country seats your chariots your hanging beds and the slaves who rob your feet the jackal will crouch in your palaces and the ploughshare will upturn your tombs nothing will be left but the eagle's scream and a heap of ruins carthage thou wilt fall the four pontiffs spread out their hands to avert the anathema all had risen but the marine suffet being a sacerdotal magistrate under the protection of the sun was inviolate so long as the assembly of the rich had not judged him terror was associated with the altar they drew back hamilcar had ceased speaking and was panting with eyes fixed his face as pale as the pearls of his tiara almost frightened at himself and his spirit lost in funeral visions from the height on which he stood all the torches on the bronze shafts seemed to him like a vast crown of fire laid level with the pavement black smoke issuing from them mounted up into the darkness of the vault and for some minutes the silence was so profound that they could hear in the distance the sound of the sea then the ancients began to question one another their interests their existence were attacked by the barbarians but it was impossible to conquer them without the assistance of the suffet and in spite of their pride this consideration made them forget every other his friends were taken aside there were interested reconciliations understandings and promises hamilcar would not take any further part in any government all conjured him they besought him and as the word treason occurred in their speech he fell into a passion the sole traitor was the great council for as the enlistment of the soldiers expired with the war they became free as soon as the war was finished he even exalted their bravery and all the advantages which might be derived from interesting them in the republic by donations and privileges then magdasin a former provincial governor said as he rolled his yellow eyes truly barca with your travelling you have become a greek or a latin or something 
why speak you of rewards for these men rather let ten thousand barbarians perish than a single one of us the ancients nodded approval murmuring yes is there need for so much trouble they can always be had and they can be rid of conveniently can they not they are deserted as they were by you in sardinia the enemy is appraised of the road which they are to take as in the case of those gauls in sicily or perhaps they are disembarked in the middle of the sea as i was returning i saw the rock quite white with their bones what a misfortune said capuras imprudently have they not gone over to the enemy a hundred times cried the others why then exclaimed hamilcar did you recall them to carthage notwithstanding your laws and when they are in your town poor and numerous amid all your riches it does not occur to you to weaken them by the slightest division afterwards you dismiss the whole of them with their women and children without keeping a single hostage did you expect that they would murder themselves to spare you the pain of keeping your oaths you hate them because they are strong you hate me still more who am their master oh i felt it just now when you were kissing my hands and were all putting a constraint upon yourself not to bite them if the lions that were sleeping in the court had come howling in the uproar could not have been more frightful but the pontiff of eskmoun rose and standing perfectly upright with his knees close together his elbows pressed to his body and his hands half open he said barca carthage has need that you should take the general command of the punic forces against the mercenaries i refuse replied hamilcar we will give you full authority cried the chiefs of the Sicitia. no with no control no partition all the money that you want all the captives all the booty fifty zeraths of land for every enemy's corpse no no because it is impossible to conquer with you he is afraid because you are cowardly greedy ungrateful pusillanimous and mad he is careful of them in order to put himself at their head said some one and return against us said another and from the bottom of the hall hanno howled he wants to make himself king then they bounded up overturning the seats and the torches the crowd of them rushed towards the altar they brandished daggers but hamilcar dived into his sleeves and drew from them two broad cutlasses and half stooping his left foot advanced his eyes flaming and his teeth clenched he defied them as he stood there beneath the golden candelabrum thus they had brought weapons with them as a precaution it was a crime they looked with terror at one another as all were guilty every one became quickly reassured and by degrees they turned their backs on the suffet and came down again maddened with humiliation for the second time they recoiled before him they remained standing for some time several who had wounded their fingers put them into their mouths or rolled them gently in the hem of their mantles and they were about to depart when hamilcar heard these words why it is a piece of delicacy to avoid distressing his daughter a louder voice was raised no doubt since she takes her lovers from among the mercenaries 
at first he tottered then his eye rapidly sought for shahabarim but the priest of tanith had alone remained in his place and hamilcar could see only his lofty cap in the distance all were sneering in his face in proportion as his anguish increased their joy redoubled and those who were behind shouted amid the hootings he was seen coming out of her room one morning in the month of tammuz it was the thief who stole the zaimph a very handsome man taller than you he snatched off the tiara the ensign of his rank his tiara with its eight mystic rows and with an emerald shell in the centre and with both hands and with all his strength dashed it to the ground the golden circles rebounded as they broke and the pearls rang upon the pavement then they saw a long scar upon the whiteness of his brow it moved like a serpent between his eyebrows all his limbs trembled he ascended one of the lateral staircases which led on to the altar and walked upon the latter this was to devote himself to the god to offer himself as a holocaust the motion of his mantle agitated the lights of the candelabrum which was lower than his sandals and the fine dust raised by his footsteps surrounded him like a cloud as high as the waist he stopped between the legs of the brass colossus he took up two handfuls of the dust the mere sight of which made every carthaginian shudder with horror and said by the hundred torches of your intelligence by the eight fires of the kabiri by the stars the meteors and the volcanoes by everything that burns by the thirst of the desert and the saltness of the ocean by the cave of hadramentum and the empire of souls by extermination by the ashes of your sons and the ashes of the brothers of your ancestors with which i now mingle my own you the hundred of the council of carthage have lied in your accusation of my daughter and i hamilcar barca marine suffet chief of the rich and ruler of the people in the presence of bull-headed moloch i swear they expected something frightful but he resumed in a lofty and calmer tone that i will not even speak to her about it the sacred servants entered wearing their golden combs some with purple sponges and others with branches of palm they raised the hyacinth curtain which was stretched before the door and through the opening of this angle there was visible behind the other halls the great pink sky which seemed to be a combination of the vault and to rest at the horizon upon the blue sea the sun was issuing from the waves and mounting upwards it suddenly struck upon the breast of the brazen colossus which was divided into seven compartments closed by gratings his red-toothed jaws opened in a horrible yawn his enormous nostrils were dilated the broad daylight animated him and gave him a terrible and impatient aspect as if he would fain have leaped without to mingle with the star the god and together traverse the immensities the torches however which were scattered on the ground were still burning while here and there on the mother-of-pearl pavement was stretched from them what looked like spots of blood 
the ancients were reeling from exhaustion they filled their lungs inhaling the freshness of the air the sweat flowed down their livid faces they had shouted so much that they could now scarcely make their voices heard but their wrath against the suffet was not at all abated they hurled menaces at him by way of farewells and hamilcar answered them again until the next night barca in the temple of eskmoun i shall be there we will have you condemned by the rich and i you by the people take care that you do not end on the cross and you that you are not torn to pieces in the streets as soon as they were on the threshold of the court they again assumed a calm demeanour their runners and coachmen were waiting for them at the door most of them departed on white mules the suffet leaped into his chariot and took the reins the two animals curving their necks and rhythmically beating the resounding pebbles went up the whole of the mappalian way at full gallop and the silver vulture at the extremity of the pole seemed to fly so quickly did the chariot pass along the road crossed a field planted with slabs of stone which were painted on the top like pyramids and had open hands carved out in the centre as if all the dead men lying beneath had stretched them out towards heaven to demand something next there came scattered cabins built of earth branches and bulrush hurdles and all of a conical shape these dwellings which became constantly denser as the road ascended towards the suffet's gardens were irregularly separated from one another by little pebble walls trenches of spring water ropes of esparto grass and nopal hedges but hamilcar's eyes were fastened on a great tower the three stories of which formed three monster cylinders the first being built of stone the second of brick and the third all of cedar supporting a copper cupola upon twenty-four pillars of juniper from which slender interlacing chains of brass hung down after the manner of garlands this lofty edifice overlooked the buildings the emporiums and mercantile houses which stretched to the right while the women's palace rose at the end of the cypress trees which were ranged in line like two walls of bronze when the echoing chariot had entered through the narrow gateway it stopped beneath a broad shed in which there were shackled horses eating from heaps of chopped grass all the servants hastened up they formed quite a multitude those who worked on the country estates having been brought to carthage through fear of the soldiers the labourers who were clad in animals skins had chains riveted to their ankles and trailing after them the workers in the purple factories had arms as red as those of executioners the sailors wore green caps the fishermen coral necklaces the huntsmen carried nets on their shoulders and the people belonging to megara wore black or white tunics leathern drawers and caps of straw felt or linen according to their service or their different occupations behind pressed a tattered populace they lived without employment remote from the apartments slept at night in the gardens ate the refuse from the kitchens a human mouldiness vegetating in the shadows of the palace hamilcar tolerated them from foresight even more than from scorn 
they had all put a flower in the ear in token of their joy and many of them had never seen him but men with head-dresses like the sphinxes and furnished with great sticks dashed into the crowd striking right and left this was to drive back the slaves who were curious to see their master so that he might not be assailed by their numbers or inconvenienced by their smell then they all threw themselves flat on the ground crying i of baal may your house flourish and through these people as they lay thus on the ground in the avenue of the cypress trees abdalonium the steward of the stewards waving a white mitre advanced towards hamilcar with a censer in his hand salambo was then coming down the galley staircases all her slave women followed her and at each of her steps they also descended the heads of the negresses formed big black spots on the line of bands of the golden plates clasping the foreheads of the roman women others had silver arrows emerald butterflies or long bodkins set like suns in their hair rings clasps necklaces fringes and bracelets shone amid the confusion of white yellow and blue garments a rustling of light material became audible the pattering of sandals might be heard together with the dull sound of naked feet as they were set down on the wood and here and there a tall eunuch head and shoulders above them smiled with his face in air when the shouting of the men had subsided they hid their faces in their sleeves and together uttered a strange cry like the howling of a she-wolf and so frenzied and strident was it that it seemed to make the great ebony staircase with its thronging women vibrate from top to bottom like a lyre the wind lifted their veils and the slender stems of the papyrus plant rocked gently it was the month of shebas and the depth of winter the flowering pomegranates swelled against the azure of the sky and the sea disappeared through the branches with an island in the distance half lost in the mist end of chapter seven part two Chapter Seven, Part Three of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Seven, Part Three. Hamilcar stopped on perceiving Salambo. She had come to him after the death of several male children. Moreover, the birth of daughters was considered a calamity in religions of the sun the gods had afterwards sent him a son but he still felt something of the betrayal of his hope and the shock as it were of the curse which he had uttered against her salambo however continued to advance long bunches of various coloured pearls fell from her ears to her shoulders and as far as her elbows her hair was crisped so as to simulate a cloud round her neck she wore little quadrangular plates of gold representing a woman between two rampant lions and her costume was a complete reproduction of the equipment of the goddess 
her broad-sleeved hyacinth robe fitted close to her figure widening out below the vermilion on her lips gave additional whiteness to her teeth and the antimony on her eyelids greater length to her eyes her sandals which were cut out in bird's plumage had very high heels and she was extraordinarily pale doubtless on account of the cold at last she came close to hamilcar and without looking at him without raising her head to him greeting eye of balim eternal glory triumph leisure satisfaction riches long has my heart been sad and the house drooping but the returning master is like reviving tammuz and beneath your gaze o oh father joyfulness and a new existence will everywhere prevail and taking from Tanach's hand a little oblong vase wherein smoked a mixture of meal butter cardamom and wine drink freely said she of the returning cup which your servant has prepared he replied a blessing upon you and he mechanically grasped the golden vase which she held out to him he scanned her however with such harsh attention that salambo was troubled and stammered out they have told you o oh master yes i know said hamilcar in a low voice was this a confession or was she speaking of the barbarians and he added a few vague words upon the public embarrassments which he hoped by his sole efforts to clear away o oh, father exclaimed salambo you will not obliterate what is irreparable then he drew back and salambo was astonished at his amazement for she was not thinking of carthage but of the sacrilege in which she found herself implicated this man who made legions tremble and whom she hardly knew terrified her like a god he had guessed he knew all something awful was about to happen pardon she cried hamilcar slowly bowed his head although she wished to accuse herself she dared not open her lips and yet she felt stifled with the need of complaining and being comforted hamilcar was struggling against a longing to break his oath he kept it out of pride or from the dread of putting an end to his uncertainty and he looked into her face with all his might so as to lay hold on what she kept concealed at the bottom of her heart by degrees the panting salambo crushed by such heavy looks let her head sink below her shoulders he was now sure that she had erred in the embrace of a barbarian he shuddered and raised both his fists she uttered a shriek and fell down among her women who crowded around her hamilcar turned on his heel all the stewards followed him the door of the emporiums was opened and he entered a vast round hall from which long passages leading to other halls branched off like the spokes from the nave of a wheel a stone disc stood in the centre with balustrades to support the cushions that were heaped up upon the carpets the suffet walked at first with rapid strides he breathed noisily he struck the ground with his heel and drew his hand across his forehead like a man annoyed by flies but he shook his head and as he perceived the accumulation of his riches he became calm his thoughts which were attracted by the vistas in the passages wandered to the other halls that were full of still rarer treasures bronze plates 
silver ingots and iron bars alternated with pigs of tin brought from the Cassaritides over the dark sea gums from the country of the blacks were running over their bags of palm bark and gold dust heaped up in leathern bottles was insensibly creeping out through the worn-out seams delicate filaments drawn from marine plants hung amid flax from egypt greece taprobane and judea mandreporis bristled like large bushes at the foot of the walls and an indefinable odour the exhalation from perfumes leather spices and ostrich feathers the latter tied in great bunches at the very top of the vault floated through the air an arch was formed above the door before each passage with elephants teeth placed upright and meeting together at the points at last he ascended the stone disc all the stewards stood with arms folded and heads bent while abdalonim reared his pointed metre with a haughty air hamilcar questioned the chief of the ships he was an old pilot with eyelids chafed by the wind and white locks fell to his hips as if dashing foam of the tempests had remained on his beard he replied that he had sent a fleet by gades and tumiamata to try to reach ezion gaber by doubling the southern horn and the promontory of aromata others had advanced continuously towards the west for four moons without meeting with any shore but the ship's prows became entangled in weeds the horizon echoed continually with the noise of cataracts blood-coloured mists darkened the sun a perfume-laden breeze lulled the crews to sleep and their memories were so disturbed that they were now unable to tell anything however expeditions had ascended the rivers of the scythians and made their way into colchis and into the countries of the ugrians and of the istians had carried off fifteen hundred maidens in the archipelago and sunk all the strange vessels sailing beyond cape oestrimon so that the secret of the routes should not be known king ptolemaeus was detaining the incense from Scesbar, syracuse elathia corsica and the islands had furnished nothing and the old pilot lowered his voice to announce that a trireme was taken at rosicada by the numidians for they are with them master hamilcar knit his brows then he signed to the chief of the journeys to speak this functionary was enveloped in a brown ungirdled robe and had his head covered with a long scarf of white stuff which passed along the edge of his lips and fell upon his shoulder behind the caravans had set out regularly at the winter equinox but of fifteen hundred men directing their course towards the extreme boundaries of ethiopia with excellent camels new leathern bottles and supplies of painted cloth but one had reappeared at carthage the rest having died of fatigue or become mad through the terror of the desert and he said that far beyond the black harush after passing the atarantes and the country of the great apes he had seen immense kingdoms wherein the prettiest utensils were all of gold a river of the colour of milk and as broad as the sea forests of blue trees hills of aromatics monsters with human faces vegetating on the rocks with eyeballs which expanded like flowers to look at you 
and then crystal mountains supporting the sun behind lakes all covered with dragons others had returned from india with peacocks pepper and new textures as to those who go by way of the Sirtes and the temple of amon to purchase chalcedony they had no doubt perished in the sands the caravans from getulia and fazana had furnished their usual supplies but he the chief of the journeys did not venture to fit one out just now hamilcar understood the mercenaries were in occupation of the country he leaned upon his other elbow with a hollow groan and the chief of farms was so afraid to speak that he trembled horribly in spite of his thick shoulders and his big red eyeballs his face which was as snub-nosed as a mastiff's was surmounted by a net woven of threads of bark he wore a waist-belt of hairy leopard's skin wherein gleamed two formidable cutlasses as soon as hamilcar turned away he began to cry aloud and invoke all the baals it was not his fault he could not help it he had watched the temperature the soil the stars had planted at the winter solstice and pruned at the waning of the moon had inspected the slaves and had been careful of their clothes but hamilcar grew angry at this loquacity he clacked his tongue and the man with the cutlasses went on in rapid tones ah master they have pillaged everything sacked everything destroyed everything three thousand trees have been cut down at mascala and at ubada the granaries have been looted and the cisterns filled up at tedes they have carried off fifteen hundred gomors of meal at marazana they have killed the shepherds eaten the flocks burnt your house your beautiful house with its cedar beams which you used to visit in the summer the slaves at tuburbo who were reaping barley fled to the mountains and the asses the mules both great and small the oxen from taormina and the antelopes not a single one left all carried away it is a curse i shall not survive it he went on again in tears ah if you knew how full the cellars were and how the ploughshares shone ah the fine rams ah the fine bulls hamilcar's wrath was choking him it burst forth be silent am i a pauper then no lies speak the truth i wish to know all that i have lost to the last shekel to the last cab abdalonim bring me the accounts of the ships of the caravans of the farms of the house and if your consciences are not clear woe be on your heads go out all the stewards went out walking backwards with their fists touching the ground abdalonim went up to a set of pigeon-holes in the wall and from the midst of them took out knotted cords strips of linen or papyrus and sheep's shoulder-blades inscribed with delicate writing he laid them at hamilcar's feet placed in his hand a wooden frame furnished on the inside with three threads on which balls of gold silver and horn were strung and began one hundred and ninety-two houses in the mappalian district led to the new carthaginians at the rate of one baker a moon no it is too much be lenient towards the poor people and you will try to learn whether they are attached to the republic and write down the names of those who appear to you to be the most daring what next abdalonim hesitated in surprise at such generosity hamilcar snatched the strips of linen from his hands 
what is this three palaces around Carmon at twelve kesitas a month make it twenty i do not want to be eaten up by the rich the steward of the stewards after a long salutation resumed lent to tigillas until the end of the season two kikars at three per cent maritime interest to bar malkarth fifteen hundred shekels on the security of thirty slaves but twelve have died in the salt marshes that is because they were not hardy said the suffet laughing no matter if he is in want of money satisfy him we should always lend and at different rates of interest according to the wealth of the individual then the servant hastened to read all that had been brought in by the iron mines of anaba the coral fisheries the purple factories the farming of the tax on the resident greeks the export of silver to arabia where it had ten times the value of gold and the captures of vessels deduction of a tenth being made for the temple of the goddess each time i declared a quarter less master hamilcar was reckoning with the balls they rang beneath his fingers enough what have you paid to stratonicles of corinth and to three alexandrian merchants on these letters here they have been realized ten thousand athenian drachmas and twelve syrian talents of gold the food for the crews amounting to twenty minae a month for each trireme i know how many lost here is the account on these sheets of lead said the steward as to the ships chartered in common it has often been necessary to throw the cargo into the seas and so the unequal losses have been divided among the partners for the ropes which were borrowed from the arsenals and which it was impossible to restore the Sicitia exacted eight hundred kesitas before the expedition to utica they again said hamilcar hanging his head and he remained for a time as if quite crushed by the weight of all the hatreds that he could feel upon him but i do not see the megara expenses abdalonim turning pale went to another set of pigeonholes and took from them some planchettes of sycamore wood strung in packets on leathern strings hamilcar curious about these domestic details listened to him and grew calm with the monotony of the tones in which the figures were enumerated abdalonim became slower suddenly he let the wooden sheets fall to the ground and threw himself flat on his face with his arms stretched out in the position of a condemned criminal hamilcar picked up the tablets without any emotion and his lips parted and his eyes grew larger when he perceived an exorbitant consumption of meat fish birds wines and aromatics with broken vases dead slaves and spoiled carpets set down as the expense of a single day abdalonim still prostrate told him of the feast of the barbarians he had not been able to avoid the command of the ancients moreover salambo desired money to be lavished for the better reception of the soldiers at his daughter's name hamilcar leaped to his feet then with compressed lips he crouched down upon the cushions tearing the fringes with his nails and panting with staring eyes rise said he and he descended abdalonim followed him his knees trembled but seizing an iron bar he began like one distraught to loosen the paving stones a wooden disc sprang up and soon there appeared throughout the length of the passage several of the large covers employed for stopping up the trenches 
in which grain was kept you see eye of baal said the servant trembling they have not taken everything yet and these are each fifty cubits deep and filled up to the brim during your voyage i had them dug out in the arsenals in the gardens everywhere your house is full of corn as your heart is full of wisdom a smile passed over hamilcar's face it is well abdalonim then bending over to his ear you will have it brought from euturia brutium whence you will and no matter at what price heap it and keep it i alone must possess all the corn in carthage then when they were alone at the extremity of the passage abdalonim with one of the keys hanging at his girdle opened a large quadrangular chamber divided in the centre by pillars of cedar gold silver and brass coins were arranged on tables or packed into niches and rose as high as the joists of the roof along the four walls in the corners there were huge baskets of hippopotamus skin supporting whole rows of smaller bags there were hillocks formed of heaps of bullion on the pavement and here and there a pile that was too high had given way and looked like a ruined column the large carthaginian pieces representing tamith with a horse beneath a palm tree mingled with those from the colonies which were marked with a bull star globe or crescent then there might be seen pieces of all values dimensions and ages arrayed in unequal amounts from the ancient coins of assyria slender as the nail to the ancient ones of latinum thicker than the hand with the buttons of aegina the tablets of bactriana and the short bars of lacedaemon many were covered with rust or had grown greasy or having been taken in nets or from among the ruins of captured cities were green with the water or blackened by fire the suffet had speedily calculated whether the sums present corresponded with the gains and losses which had just been read to him and he was going away when he perceived three brass jars completely empty abdalonim turned away his head to mark his horror and hamilcar resigning himself to it said nothing they crossed other passages and other halls and at last reached a door where to ensure its better protection and in accordance with a roman custom lately introduced into carthage a man was fastened by the waist to a long chain let into the wall his beard and nails had grown to an immoderate length and he swayed himself from right to left with that continual oscillation which is characteristic of captive animals as soon as he recognized hamilcar he darted towards him crying pardon eye of baal pity kill me for ten years i have not seen the sun in your father's name pardon hamilcar without answering him clapped his hands and three men appeared and all four simultaneously stiffening their arms drew back from its rings the enormous bar which closed the door hamilcar took a torch and disappeared into the darkness this was believed to be the family burying-place but nothing would have been found in it except a broad well it was dug out merely to baffle robbers and it concealed nothing hamilcar passed along beside it then stooping down he made a very heavy millstone turn upon its rollers and through this aperture entered an apartment which was built in the shape of a cone 
the walls were covered with scales of brass and in the centre on a granite pedestal stood the statue of one of the kabiri called aletes the discoverer of the mines in siltiberia on the ground at its base and arranged in the form of a cross were large gold shields and monster close-necked silver vases of extravagant shape and unfitted for use it was customary to cast quantities of metal in this way so that dilapidation and even removal should be almost impossible with his torch he lit a miner's lamp which was fastened to the idol's cap and green yellow blue violet wine-coloured and blood-coloured fires suddenly illuminated the hall it was filled with gems which were either in gold calabashes fastened like sconces upon the sheets of brass or were ranged in native masses at the foot of the wall there were calaides shot away from the mountains with slings carbuncles formed by the urine of the lynx glossopetrae which had fallen from the moon tianos diamonds sandastra beryls with three kinds of rubies the four kinds of sapphires and the twelve kinds of emeralds they gleamed like splashes of milk blue icicles and silver dust and shed their light in sheets rays and stars seronia engendered by the thunder sparkled by the sight of chalcedonias which are a cure for poison there were to passes from mount sarbaca to avert terrace opals from bactriana to prevent abortions and horns of ammon which are placed under the bed to induce dreams the fires from the stones and the flames from the lamp were mirrored in the great golden shields hamilcar stood smiling with folded arms and was less delighted by the sight of his riches than by the consciousness of their possession they were inaccessible exhaustless infinite his ancestors sleeping beneath his feet transmitted something of their eternity to his heart he felt very near to the subterranean deities it was as the joy of one of the kabiri and the great luminous rays striking upon his face looked like the extremity of an invisible net linking him across the abysses with the centre of the world End of chapter 7 part 3Chapter 7, Part 4 of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter 7, Part 4. A thought came which made him shudder, and placing himself behind the idol, he walked straight up to the wall. Then, among the tattooings on his arm, he scrutinized a horizontal line with two other perpendicular ones, which in Canaanitish figures expressed the number thirteen. Then he counted as far as the thirteenth of the brass plates, and again raised his ample sleeve, and with his right hand stretched out, he read other more complicated lines on his arm at the same time moving his fingers daintily about like one playing on a lyre at last he struck seven blows with his thumb 
and an entire section of the wall turned about in a single block it served to conceal a sort of cellar containing mysterious things which had no name and were of incalculable value hamilcar went down the three steps took up a llama's skin which was floating on a black liquid in a silver vat and then reascended abdalonim again began to walk before him he struck the pavement with his tall cane the pommel of which was adorned with bells and before every apartment cried aloud the name of hamilcar amid eulogies and benedictions along the walls of the circular gallery from which the passages branched off were piled little beams of algumim bags of lafsonia cakes of lemnos earth and tortoise carpuses filled with pearls the suffet brushed them with his robe as he passed without even looking at some gigantic pieces of amber an almost divine material formed by the rays of the sun a cloud of odorous vapour burst forth push open the door they went in naked men were netting pastes crushing herbs stirring coals pouring oil into jars and opening and shutting the little ovoid cells which were hollowed out all around in the wall and were so numerous that the apartment was like the interior of a hive they were brimful of mirobalan bdellium saffron and violets gums powders roots grass files branches of filipendula and rose petals were scattered about everywhere and the scents were stifling in spite of the cloud wreaths from the sturax shrivelling on the brazen tripod in the centre the chief of the sweet odours pale and long as a waxen torch came up to hamilcar to crush a roll of metopion in his hands while two others rubbed his heels with leaves of baccaris he repelled them they were Cyrenians of infamous morals but valued on account of the secrets which they possessed to show his vigilance the chief of the odors offered the suffet a little malo bathroom to taste in an electrum spoon then he pierced three indian bezoars with an awl the master who knew the artifices employed took a horn full of balm and after holding it near the coals inclined it over his robe a brown spot appeared it was a fraud then he gazed fixedly at the chief of the odours and without saying anything flung the gazelle's horn full in his face however indignant he might be at adulterations made to his own prejudice when he perceived some parcels of nard which were being packed up for countries beyond the sea he ordered antimony to be mixed with it so as to make it heavier then he asked where three boxes of psagdas designed for his own use were to be found the chief of the odors confessed that he did not know some soldiers had come howling in with knives and he had opened the boxes for them so you are more afraid of them than of me cried the suffet and his eyeballs flashed like torches through the smoke upon the tall pale man who was beginning to understand abdalonim you will make him run the gauntlet before sunset tear him this loss which was less than the others had exasperated him for in spite of his efforts to banish them in his thoughts he was continually coming again across the barbarians 
their excesses were blended with his daughter's shame and he was angry with the whole household for knowing of the letter and not speaking of it to him but something impelled him to bury himself in his misfortune and in an inquisitional fit he visited the sheds behind the mercantile house to see the supplies of bitumen wood anchors and cordage honey and wax the cloth warehouse the stores of food the marble yard and the silphium barn he went to the other side of the gardens to make an inspection in their cottages and the domestic artisans whose productions were sold there were tailors embroidering cloaks others making nets others painting cushions or cutting out sandals and egyptian workmen polished papyrus with a shell while the weavers shuttles rattled and the armourers anvils rang hamilcar said to them beat away at the swords i shall want them and he drew the antelope's skin that had been steeped in poisons from his bosom to have it cut into a cuirass more solid than one of brass and unassailable by steel or flame as soon as he approached the workmen abdalonim to give his wrath another direction tried to anger him against them by murmured disparagement of their work what a performance it is a shame the master is indeed too good hamilcar moved away without listening to him he slackened his pace for the paths were barred by great trees calcined from one end to the other such as may be met with in the woods where shepherds have encamped and the palings were broken the water in the trenches was disappearing while fragments of glass and the bones of apes were to be seen amid the miry puddles a scrap of cloth hung here and there from the bushes and the rotten flowers formed a yellow muck-heap beneath the citron trees in fact the servants had neglected everything thinking that the master would never return at every step he discovered some new disaster some further proof of the thing which he had forbidden himself to learn here he was soiling his purple boots as he crushed the filth under foot and he had not all these men before him at the end of a catapult to make them fly into fragments he felt humiliated at having defended them it was a delusion and a piece of treachery and as he could not revenge himself upon the soldiers or the ancients or salambo or anybody and his wrath required some victim he condemned all the slaves of the gardens to the mines at a single stroke abdalonim shuddered each time that he saw him approaching the parks but hamilcar took the path towards the mill from which there might be heard issuing a mournful melopoia the heavy millstones were turning amid the dust they consisted of two cones of porphyry laid the one upon the other the upper one of the two which carried a funnel being made to revolve upon the second by means of strong bars some men were pushing these with their breasts and arms while others were yoked to them and were pulling them the friction of the straps had formed purulent scabs round about their armpits such as are seen on asses with us and the end of the limb black rag which scarcely covered their loins hung down and flapped against their hams like a long tail their eyes were red the irons on their feet clanked and all their breasts panted rhythmically on their mouths they had muzzles fastened by two little bronze chains to render it impossible for them to eat the flour 
and their hands were enclosed in gauntlets without fingers so as to prevent them from taking any at the master's entrance the wooden bars creaked still more loudly the grain grated as it was being crushed several fell upon their knees the others continuing their work stepped across them he asked for giddenham the governor of the slave and that personage appeared his rank being displayed in the richness of his dress his tunic which was slit up at the sides was of fine purple his ears were weighed with heavy rings and the strips of cloth enfolding his legs were joined together with a lacing of gold which extended from his ankles to his hips like a serpent winding about a tree in his fingers which were laden with rings he held a necklace of jet beads so as to recognize the men who were subject to the sacred disease hamilcar signed to him to unfasten the muzzles then with the cries of famished animals they all rushed upon the flower burying their faces in the heaps of it and devouring it you are weakening them said the suffet giddenham replied that such treatment was necessary in order to subdue them it was scarcely worth while sending you to the slaves school at syracuse fetch the others and the cooks butlers grooms runners and litter carriers the men belonging to the vapour bath and the women with their children all ranged themselves in a single line in the garden from the mercantile house to the deer park they held their breath an immense silence prevailed in megara the sun was lengthening across the lagoon at the foot of the catacombs the peacocks were screeching hamilcar walked along step by step what am i to do with these old creatures he said sell them there are too many gauls they are drunkards and too many cretans they are liars buy me some cappadocians asiatics and negroes he was astonished that the children were so few the house ought to have births every year giddenham you will leave the huts open every night to let them mingle freely he then had the thieves the lazy and the mutinous shown to him he distributed punishments with reproaches to giddenham and giddenham ox-like bent his low forehead with its two broad intersecting eyebrows see eye of baal he said pointing out a sturdy libyan here is one who was caught with the rope around his neck ah you wish to die said the suffet scornfully yes replied the slave in an intrepid tone then without heeding the precedent or the pecuniary loss hamilcar said to the serving men away with him perhaps in his thoughts he intended a sacrifice it was a misfortune which he inflicted upon himself in order to avert more terrible ones giddenham had hidden those who were mutilated behind the others hamilcar perceived them who cut off your arm the soldier's eye of baal then to a samnite who was staggering like a wounded heron and you who did that to you it was the governor who had broken his leg with an iron bar this silly atrocity made the suffered indignant he snatched the jet necklace out of giddenham's hands cursed be the dog that injures the flock gracious tanith to cripple slaves ah you ruin your master let him be smothered in the dunghill and those that are missing where are they have you helped the soldiers to murder them 
his face was so terrible that all the women fled the slaves drew back and formed a large circle around them Giddenem was frantically kissing his sandals hamilcar stood upright with his arms raised above him but with his understanding as clear as in the sternest of his battles he recalled a thousand odious things ignominies from which he had turned aside and in the gleaming of his wrath he could once more see all his disasters simultaneously as in the lightnings of a storm the governors of the country estates had fled through terror of the soldiers perhaps through collusion with them they were all deceiving him he had restrained himself too long bring them here he cried and brand them on the forehead with red-hot irons as cowards then they brought and spread out in the middle of the garden fetters carcanets knives chains for those condemned to the mines sippy for fastening the legs numelae for confining the shoulders and scorpions or whips with triple thongs terminating in brass claws all were placed facing the sun in the direction of moloch the devourer and were stretched on the ground on their stomachs or on their backs those however who were sentenced to be flogged standing upright against the trees with two men beside them one counting the blows and the other striking in striking he used both his arms and the whistling thongs made the bark of the plane trees fly the blood was scattered like rain upon the foliage and red masses writhed with howls at the foot of the trees those who were under the iron tore their faces with their nails the wooden screws could be heard creaking dull knockings resounded sometimes a sharp cry would suddenly pierce the air in the direction of the kitchens men were brisking up burning coals with fans amid tattered garments and scattered hair and a smell of burning flesh was perceptible those who were under the scourge swooning but kept in their positions by the bonds on their arms rolled their heads upon their shoulders and closed their eyes the others who were watching them began to shriek with terror and the lions remembering the feast perhaps stretched themselves out yawning against the edge of the dens then salambo was seen on the platform of her terrace she ran wildly about it from left to right hamilcar perceived her it seemed to him that she was holding up her arms towards him to ask for pardon with a gesture of horror he plunged into the elephant's park these animals were the pride of the great punic houses they had carried their ancestors had triumphed in the wars and they were reverenced as being the favourites of the sun those of megara were the strongest in carthage before he went away hamilcar had required abdalonim to swear that he would watch over them but they had died from their mutilations and only three remained lying in the middle of the court in the dust before the ruins of their manger they recognized him and came up to him one had its ears horribly slit another had a large wound in its knee while the trunk of the third was cut off they looked sadly at him like reasonable creatures and the one that had lost its trunk tried by stooping its huge head and bending its hands to stroke him softly with the hideous extremity of its stump at this caress from the animal 
two tears started into his eyes he rushed at abdalonim ah wretch the cross the cross abdalonim fell back swooning upon the ground the bark of a jackal rang from behind the purple factories the blue smoke of which was ascending slowly into the sky hamilcar paused the thought of his son had suddenly calmed him like the touch of a god he caught a glimpse of a prolongation of his might an indefinite continuation of his personality and the slaves could not understand whence this appeasement had come upon him as he bent his steps toward the purple factories he passed before the ergastulum which was a long house of black stone built in a square pit with a small pathway all around it and four staircases at the corners edibal was doubtless waiting until the night to finish his signal there is no hurry yet thought hamilcar and he went down into the prison some cried out to him return the boldest followed him the open door was flapping in the wind the twilight entered through the narrow loopholes and in the interior broken chains could be distinguished hanging from the walls this was all that remained of the captives of war then hamilcar grew extraordinarily pale and those who were leaning over the pit outside saw him resting one hand against the wall to keep himself from falling but the jackal uttered its cry three times in succession hamilcar raised his head he did not speak a word nor make a gesture then when the sun had completely set he disappeared behind the nopal hedge and in the evening he said as he entered the assembly of the rich in the temple of eskmaun luminaries of the Balim, i accept the command of the punic forces against the army of the barbarians End of chapter seven part four Chapter eight of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter eight part one the battle of the macaras in the following day he drew two hundred and twenty three thousand kikars of gold from the sicitia and decreed a tax of fourteen shekels upon the rich even the women contributed payment was made in behalf of the children and he compelled the colleges of priests to furnish money a monstrous thing according to carthaginian customs he demanded all the horses mules and arms a few tried to conceal their wealth and their property was sold and to intimidate the avarice of the rest he himself gave sixty suits of armour and fifteen hundred gomers of meal which was as much as was given by the ivory company he sent into liguria to buy soldiers three thousand mountaineers accustomed to fight with bears they were paid for six moons in advance at the rate of four minae a day nevertheless an army was wanted but he did not like hanno accept all the citizens first he rejected those engaged in sedentary occupations and then those who were big-bellied or had a pusillanimous look 
and he admitted those of ill repute the scum of malqua sons of barbarians freed men for reward he promised some of the new carthaginians complete rights of citizenship his first care was to reform the legion these handsome young fellows who regarded themselves as the military majesty of the republic governed themselves he reduced their officers to the ranks he treated them harshly made them run leap ascend the declivity of bizra at a single burst hurl javelins wrestle together and sleep in the squares at night their families used to come to see them and pity them he ordered shorter swords and stronger buskins he fixed the number of serving men and reduced the amount of baggage and as there were three hundred roman pila kept in the temple of moloch he took them in spite of the pontiff's protests he organized a phalanx of seventy-two elephants with those which had returned from utica and others which were private property and rendered them formidable he armed their drivers with mallet and chisel to enable them to split their skulls in the fight if they ran away he would not allow his generals to be nominated by the grand council the ancients tried to urge the laws in objection but he set them aside no one ventured to murmur again and everything yielded to the violence of his genius he assumed sole charge of the war the government and the finances and as a precaution against accusations he demanded the suffered hanno as examiner of his accounts he set to work upon the ramparts and had the old and now useless inner walls demolished in order to furnish stones but difference of fortune replacing the hierarchy of race still kept the sons of the vanquished and those of the conquerors apart thus the patricians viewed the destruction of these ruins with an angry eye while the plebeians scarcely knowing why rejoiced the troops defiled under arms through the streets from morning till night every moment the sound of trumpets was heard chariots passed bearing shields tents and pikes the courts were full of women engaged in tearing up linen the enthusiasm spread from one to another and hamilcar's soul filled the republic he had divided his soldiers into even numbers being careful to place a strong man and a weak one alternately throughout the length of his files so that he who was less vigorous or more cowardly might be at once led and pushed forward by two others but with his three thousand ligurians and the best in carthage he could form only a simple phalanx of four thousand and ninety-six hoplites protected by bronze helmets and handling ashen sarce fourteen cubits long there were two thousand young men each equipped with a sling a dagger and sandals he reinforced them with eight hundred others armed with round shields and roman swords the heavy cavalry was composed of the thirteen hundred remaining guardsmen of the legion covered with plates of vermilion bronze like the assyrian clemabarians he had further four hundred mounted archers of those that were called tarentines with caps of weasel's skin two-edged axes and leathern tunics finally there were twelve hundred negroes from the quarter of the caravans who were mingled with the clinabarians and were to run beside the stallions with one hand resting on the manes 
all was ready and yet hamilcar did not start often at night he would go out of carthage alone and make his way beyond the lagoon towards the mouths of the macaras did he intend to join the mercenaries the ligurians encamped in the mappalian district surrounded his house the apprehensions of the rich appeared justified when one day three hundred barbarians were seen approaching the walls the suffet opened the gates to them they were deserters drawn by fear or by fidelity they were hastening to their master hamilcar's return did not surprise the mercenaries according to their ideas the man could not die he was returning to fulfil his promise a hope by no means absurd so deep was the abyss between country and army moreover they did not believe themselves culpable the feast was forgotten the spies whom they surprised undeceived them it was a triumph for the bitter even the lukewarm grew furious then the two sieges overwhelmed them with weariness no progress was being made a battle would be better thus many men had left the ranks and were scouring the country but at news of the arming they returned mato leaped for joy at last at last he cried then the resentment which he cherished against salambo was turned against hamilcar his hate could now perceive a definite prey and as his vengeance grew easier of conception he almost believed that he had realized it and he revelled in it already at the same time he was seized with a loftier tenderness and consumed by a more acrid desire he saw himself alternately in the midst of the soldiers brandishing the suffet's head on a pike and then in the room with the purple bed clasping the maiden in his arms covering her face with kisses passing his hands over her long black hair and the imagination of this which he knew could never be realized tortured him he swore to himself that since his companions had appointed him skalishim he would conduct the war the certainty that he would not return from it urged him to render it a pitiless one he came to spendius and said to him you will go and get your men i will bring mine warn our territus we are lost if hamilcar attacks us do you understand me rise spendius was stupefied before such an air of authority matter usually allowed himself to be led and his previous transports had quickly passed away but just now he appeared at once calmer and more terrible a superb will gleamed in his eye like the flame of sacrifice the greek did not listen to his reasons he was living in one of the carthaginian pearl-bordered tents drinking cool beverages from silver cups playing at the kotabos letting his hair grow and conducting the siege with slackness moreover he had entered into communications with some in the town and would not leave being sure that it would open its gates before many days were over narr havas who wandered about among the three armies was at that time with him he supported his opinion and even blamed the libyan for wishing in his excess of courage to abandon their enterprise go if you are afraid exclaimed matho you promised us pitch sulphur elephants foot soldiers horses where are they narr havas reminded him that he had exterminated hanno's last cohorts as to the elephants they were being hunted in the woods 
he was arming the foot soldiers the horses were on their way and the numidian rolled his eyes like a woman and smiled in an irritating manner as he stroked the ostrich feather which fell upon his shoulder in his presence matho was at a loss for a reply but a man who was a stranger entered wet with perspiration scared and with bleeding feet and loosened girdle his breathing shook his lean sides enough to have burst them and speaking in an unintelligible dialect he opened his eyes wide as if he were telling of some battle the king sprang outside and called his horsemen they ranged themselves in the plain before him in the form of a circle narr havas who was mounted bent his head and bit his lips at last he separated his men into two equal divisions and told the first to wait then with an imperious gesture he carried off the others at a gallop and disappeared on the horizon in the direction of the mountains master murmured spendius i do not like these extraordinary chances the suffet returning narhavas going away why what does it matter said matho disdainfully it was a reason the more for anticipating hamilcar by uniting with oteritus but if the siege of the towns were raised the inhabitants would come out and attack them in the rear while they would have the carthaginians in front after much talking the following measures were resolved upon and immediately executed spendius proceeded with fifteen thousand men as far as the bridge built across the macaras three miles from utica the corners of it were fortified with four huge towers provided with catapults all the paths and gorges in the mountains were stopped up with trunks of trees pieces of rock interlacing of thorn and stone walls on the summits heaps of grass were made which might be lighted as signals and shepherds who were able to see at a distance were posted at intervals no doubt hamilcar would not like hanno advance by the mountain of the hot springs he would think that oteritus being master of the interior would close the road against him moreover a check at the opening of the campaign would ruin him while if he gained a victory he would soon have to make a fresh beginning the mercenaries being further off again he could disembark at cape grapes and march thence upon one of the towns but he would then find himself between the two armies an indiscretion which he could not commit with his scanty forces accordingly he must proceed along the base of mount ariana then turn to the left to avoid the mouths of the macaras and come straight to the bridge it was there that matho expected him at night he used to inspect the pioneers by torchlight he would hasten to hippo Zaritis or to the works of the mountains would come back again would never rest spendius envied his energy but in the management of spies the choice of sentries the working of the engines and all means of defence matho listened docilely to his companion they spoke no more of salambo one not thinking about her and the other being prevented by a feeling of shame often he would go towards carthage striving to catch sight of hamilcar's troops his eyes would dart along the horizon he would lie flat on the ground and believe that he could hear an army in the throbbing of his arteries he told spendius that if hamilcar did not arrive in three days 
he would go with all his men to meet him and offer him battle two further days elapsed spendius restrained him but on the morning of the sixth day he departed the carthaginians were no less impatient for war than the barbarians in tents and in houses there was the same longing and the same distress all were asking one another what was delaying hamilcar from time to time he would mount to the cupola of the temple of eschmoun beside the announcer of the moons and take note of the wind one day it was the third of the month of tibi they saw him descending from the acropolis with hurried steps a great clamour rose in the mappalian district soon the streets were astir and the soldiers were everywhere beginning to arm themselves upon their breasts and they ran quickly to the square of Carmon to take their places in the ranks no one was allowed to follow them or even to speak to them or to approach the ramparts for some minutes the whole town was silent as a great tomb the soldiers as they leaned on their lances were thinking and the others in the houses were sighing at sunset the army went out by the western gate but instead of taking the road to tunis or making for the mountains in the direction of utica they continued their march along the edge of the sea and they soon reached the lagoon where round spaces quite whitened with salt glittered like gigantic silver dishes forgotten on the shore then the pools of water multiplied the ground gradually became softer and the feet sank in it hamilcar did not turn back he went on still at their head and his horse which was yellow spotted like a dragon advanced into the mire flinging froth around him and with great straining of the loins night a moonless night fell a few cried out that they were about to perish he snatched their arms from them and gave them to the serving men nevertheless the mud became deeper and deeper some had to mount the beasts of burden others clung to the horses tails the sturdy pulled the weak and the ligurian corpse drove on the infantry with the points of their pikes the darkness increased they had lost their way all stopped then some of the suffet's slaves went on ahead to look for the boys which had been placed at intervals by his order they shouted through the darkness and the army followed them at a distance at last they felt the resistance of the ground then a whitish curve became dimly visible and they found themselves on the bank of the makaras in spite of the cold no fires were lighted in the middle of the night squalls of wind arose hamilcar had the soldiers roused but not a trumpet was sounded their captain tapped them slowly on the shoulder a man of lofty stature went down into the water it did not come up to his girdle it was possible to cross the suffet ordered thirty-two of the elephants to be posted in the river a hundred paces further on while the others lower down would check the lines of men that were carried away by the current and holding their weapons above their heads they all crossed the makaras as though between two walls he had noticed that the western wind had driven the sand so as to obstruct the river and form a natural causeway across it he was now on the left bank in front of utica and in a vast plain the latter being advantageous for his elephant which formed the strength of his army 
this feat of genius filled the soldiers with enthusiasm they recovered extraordinary confidence they wished to hasten immediately against the barbarians but the suffet bade them rest for two hours as soon as the sun appeared they moved into the plain in three lines first came the elephants and then the light infantry with the cavalry behind it the phalanx marching next the barbarians encamped at utica and the fifteen thousand about the bridge were surprised to see the ground undulating in the distance the wind which was blowing very hard was driving tornadoes of sand before it they rose as though snatched from the soil ascended in great light-coloured strips then parted asunder and began again hiding the punic army the while from the mercenaries owing to the horns which stood up on the edge of the helmets some thought that they could perceive a herd of oxen others deceived by the motion of the cloaks pretended that they could distinguish wings and those who had travelled a good deal shrugged their shoulders and explained everything by the illusions of the mirage nevertheless something of enormous size continued to advance little vapours as supple as the breath run across the surface of the desert the sun which was higher now shone more strongly a harsh light which seemed to vibrate threw back the depths of the sky and permeating objects rendered distance incalculable the immense plain expanded in every direction beyond the limits of vision and the almost insensible undulations of the soil extended to the extreme horizon which was closed by a great blue line which they knew to be the sea the two armies having left their tents stood gazing the people of utica were massing on the ramparts to have a better view at last they distinguished several transverse bars bristling with level points they became thicker larger black hillocks swayed to and fro square thickets suddenly appeared they were elephants and lances a single shout went up the carthaginians and without signal or command the soldiers at utica and those at the bridge ran pell-mell to fall in a body upon hamilcar spendius shuddered at the name hamilcar hamilcar he repeated panting and matter was not there what was to be done no means of flight the suddenness of the event his terror of the suffet and above all the urgent need of forming an immediate resolution distracted him he could see himself pierced by a thousand swords decapitated dead meanwhile he was being called for thirty thousand men would follow him he was seized with fury against himself he fell back upon the hope of victory it was full of bliss and he believed himself more intrepid than epaminondas he smeared his cheeks with vermilion in order to conceal his paleness then he buckled on his nimits and his cuirass swallowed a patera of pure wine and ran after his troops who were hastening towards those from utica they united so rapidly that the suffet had not time to draw up his men in battle array by degrees he slackened his speed the elephants stopped they rocked their heavy heads with their chargings of ostrich feathers striking their shoulders the while with their trunks behind the intervals between them might be seen the cohorts of the velites and further on 
the great helmets of the Kninabarians, with steel heads glancing in the sun cuirasses plumes and waving standards but the carthaginian army which amounted to eleven thousand three hundred and ninety-six men seemed scarcely to contain them for it formed an oblong narrow at the sides and pressed back upon itself seeing them so weak the barbarians who were thrice as numerous were seized by extravagant joy hamilcar was not to be seen perhaps he had remained down yonder moreover what did it matter the disdain which they felt for these traders strengthened their courage and before spendius could command a manoeuvre they had all understood it and already executed it they were deployed in a long straight line overlapping the wings of the punic army in order to completely encompass it but when there was an interval of only three hundred paces between the armies the elephants turned round instead of advancing then the clinabarians were seen to face about and follow them and the surprise of the mercenaries increased when they saw the archers running to join them so the carthaginians were afraid they were fleeing a tremendous hooting broke out from among the barbarian troops and spendius exclaimed from the top of his dromedary ah i knew it forward forward then javelins darts and sling bullets burst forth simultaneously the elephants feeling their croups stung by the arrows began to gallop more quickly a great dust enveloped them and they vanished like shadows in a cloud End of chapter eight part one Chapter Eight, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Eight, Part Two. But from the distance there came a loud noise of footsteps, dominated by the shrill sound of the trumpets, which were being blown furiously. The space which the barbarians had in front of them which was full of eddies and tumult attracted like a whirlpool some dashed into it cohorts of infantry appeared they closed up and at the same time all the rest saw the foot soldiers hastening up with the horsemen at a gallop hamilcar had in fact ordered the phalanx to break its sections and the elephants light troops and cavalry to pass through the intervals so as to bring themselves speedily upon the wings and so well had he calculated the distance from the barbarians that at the moment when they reached him the entire carthaginian army formed one long straight line in the centre bristled the phalanx formed of syntagmata or full of squares having sixteen men on each side all the leaders of all the files appeared amid long sharp lance heads which jutted out unevenly around them for the first six ranks crossed their sarisae holding them in the middle and the ten lower ranks rested them upon the shoulders of their companions in succession before them their faces were all half hidden beneath the visors of their helmets their right legs were all covered with bronze nimits broad cylindrical shields reached down to their knees 
and the horrible quadrangular mass moved in a single body and seemed to live like an animal and work like a machine two cohorts of elephants flanked it in regular array quivering they shook off the splinters of the arrows that clung to their black skins the indians squatting on their withers among the tufts of white feathers restrained them with their spoon-headed harpoons while the men in the towers who were hidden up to their shoulders moved about iron distaffs furnished with lighted tow on the edges of their large bended bows right and left of the elephants hovered the slingers each with a sling around his loins a second on his head and a third in his right hand then came the clinabarians each flanked by a negro and pointing their lances between the ears of their horses which like themselves were completely covered with gold afterwards at intervals came the light-armed soldiers with shields of lynx skin beyond which protected the points of the javelins which they held in their left hands while the tarentines each having two coupled horses relieved this wall of soldiers at its two extremities the army of the barbarians on the contrary had not been able to preserve its line undulations and blanks were to be found through its extravagant length all were panting and out of breath with their running the phalanx moved heavily along with thrusts from all its sarisae and the too slender line of the mercenaries soon yielded in the centre beneath the enormous weight then the carthaginian wings expanded in order to fall upon them the elephants following the phalanx with obliquely pointed lances cut through the barbarians there were two enormous struggling bodies and the wings with slings and arrows beat them back upon the phalanges there was no cavalry to get rid of them except two hundred numidians operating against the right squadron of the clinabarians all the rest were hemmed in and unable to extricate themselves from the lines the peril was imminent and the need of coming to some resolution urgent spendius ordered attacks to be made simultaneously on both flanks of the phalanx so as to pass clean through it but the narrower ranks glided below the longer ones and recovered their position and the phalanx turned upon the barbarians as terrible in flank as it had just been in front they struck at the staves of the sarisae but the cavalry in the rear embarrassed their attack and the phalanx supported by the elephants lengthened and contracted presenting itself in the form of a square a cone a rhombus a trapezium a pyramid a twofold internal movement went on continually from its head to its rear for those who were at the lowest part of the files hastened up to the first ranks while the latter from fatigue or on account of the wounded fell further back the barbarians found themselves thronged upon the phalanx it was impossible for it to advance there was as it were an ocean wherein leaped red crests and scales of brass while the bright shields rolled like silver foam sometimes broad currents would descend from one extremity to the other and then go up again while a heavy mass remained motionless in the centre the lances dipped and rose alternately elsewhere there was so quick a play of naked swords that only the points were visible while two armies of cavalry formed wide circles which closed again like whirlwinds behind them
above the voices of the captains the ringing of clarions and the grating of tires bullets of lead and almonds of clay whistled through the air dashing the sword from the hand or the brain out of the skull the wounded sheltering themselves with one arm beneath their shields pointed their swords by resting the pommels on the ground while others lying in pools of blood would turn and bite the heels of those above them the multitude was so compact the dust so thick and the tumult so great that it was impossible to distinguish anything the cowards who offered to surrender were not even heard those whose hands were empty clasped one another close breasts cracked against caresses and corpses hung with head thrown back between a pair of contracted arms there was a company of sixty umbrians who firm on their hams their pikes before their eyes immovable and grinding their teeth forced two syntagmata to recoil simultaneously some epirote shepherds ran upon the left squadron of the clinabarians and whirling their staves seized the horses by the man the animals threw their riders and fled across the plain the punic slingers scattered here and there stood gaping the phalanx began to waver the captains ran to and fro in distraction the rearmost in the files were pressing upon the soldiers and the barbarians had reformed they were recovering the victory was theirs but a cry a terrible cry broke forth a roar of pain and wrath it came from the seventy-two elephants which were rushing on in double line hamilcar having waited until the mercenaries were massed together in one spot to let them loose against them the indians had goaded them so vigorously that blood was trickling down their broad ears their trunks which were smeared with mimium were stretched straight out in the air like red serpents their breasts were furnished with spears and their backs with caresses their tusks were lengthened with steel blades curved like sabres and to make them more ferocious they had been intoxicated with a mixture of pepper wine and incense they shook their necklaces of bells and shrieked and the elephant arcs bent their heads beneath the stream of phalaricas which was beginning to fly from the tops of the towers in order to resist them the better the barbarians rushed forward in a compact crowd the elephants flung themselves impetuously upon the centre of it the spurs on their breasts like ships prows clove through the cohorts which flowed surging back they stifled the men with their trunks or else snatching them up from the ground delivered them over their heads to the soldiers in the towers with their tusks they disembowelled them and hurled them into the air and long entrails hung from their ivory fangs like bundles of rope from a mast the barbarians strove to blind them to hamstring them others would slip beneath their bodies bury a sword in them up to the hilt and perish crushed to death the most intrepid clung to their straps they would go on sawing the leather amid flames bullets and arrows and the wicker tower would fall like a tower of stone fourteen of the animals on the extreme right irritated by their wounds turned upon the second rank the indians seized mallet and chisel applied the latter to a joint in the head and with all their might struck a great blow down fell the huge beasts falling one above another 
it was like a mountain and upon the heap of dead bodies and armour a monstrous elephant called the fury of baal which had been caught by the leg in some chains stood howling until the evening with an arrow in its eye the others however like conquerors delighting in extermination overthrew crushed stamped and raged against the corpses and the debris to repel the maniples in serried circles around them they turned about on their hind feet as they advanced with a continual rotary motion the carthaginians felt their energy increase and the battle began again the barbarians were growing weak some greek hoplites threw away all their arms and terror seized upon the rest spendius was seen stooping upon his dromedary and spurring it on the shoulders with two javelins then they all rushed away from the wings and ran towards Utica. the clinabarians whose horses were exhausted did not try to overtake them the ligurians who were weakened by thirst cried out for an advance towards the river but the carthaginians who were posted in the centre of the syntagmata and had suffered less stamped their feet with longing for the vengeance which was flying from them and they were already darting forward in pursuit of the mercenaries when hamilcar appeared he held in his spotted and sweat-covered horse with silver reins the bands fastened on the horns on his helmet flapped in the wind behind him and he had placed his oval shield beneath his left thigh with a motion of his triple pointed pike he checked the army the tarentines leaped quickly upon their spare horses and set off right and left towards the river and towards the town the phalanx exterminated all the remaining barbarians at leisure when the swords appeared they would stretch out their throats and close their eyelids others defended themselves to the last and were knocked down from a distance with flints like mad dogs hamilcar had desired the taking of prisoners but the carthaginians obeyed him grudgingly so much pleasure did they derive from plunging their swords into the bodies of the barbarians as they were too hot they set about their work with bare arms like mowers and when they desisted to take breath they would follow with their eyes a horseman galloping across the country after a fleeing soldier he would succeed in seizing him by the hair hold him thus for a while and then fell him with a blow of his axe night fell carthaginians and barbarians had disappeared the elephants which had taken to flight roamed in the horizon with their fired towers these burned here and there in the darkness like beacons nearly half lost in the mist and no movement could be discerned in the plain save the undulation of the river which was heaped with corpses and was drifting them away to the sea two hours afterwards Mato arrived he caught sight in the starlight of long uneven heaps lying upon the ground they were files of barbarians he stooped down all were dead he called into the distance but no voice replied that very morning he had left hippo Zaratus with his soldiers to march upon carthage at Utica, the army under spendius had just set out and the inhabitants were beginning to fire the engines all had fought desperately but the tumult which was going on in the direction of the bridge increasing in an incomprehensible fashion mato had struck across the mountain by the shortest road and as the barbarians were fleeing over the plain he had encountered nobody 
facing him were little pyramidical masses rearing themselves in the shade and on this side of the river and closer to him were motionless lights on the surface of the ground in fact the carthaginians had fallen back behind the bridge and to deceive the barbarians the suffet had stationed numerous posts upon the other bank mato still advancing thought that he could distinguish punic engines for horses' heads which did not stir appeared in the air fixed upon the tops of piles of staves which could not be seen, and further off he could hear a great clamour, a noise of songs, and clashing of cups. Then, not knowing where he was nor how to find Spendius, assailed with anguish, scared and lost in the darkness, he returned more impetuously by the same road the dawn was growing grey when from the top of the mountain he perceived the town with the carcasses of the engines blackened by the flames and looking like giant skeletons leaning against the walls all was peaceful amid extraordinary silence and heaviness among his soldiers on the verge of the tents men were sleeping nearly naked each upon his back or with his forehead against his arm which was supported by his cuirass some were unwinding blood-stained bandages from their legs those who were doomed to die rolled their heads about gently others dragged themselves along and brought them drink the sentries walked up and down along the narrow paths in order to warm themselves or stood in a fierce attitude with their faces turned towards the horizon and their pikes on their shoulders mato found spendius sheltered beneath a rag of canvas supported by two sticks set in the ground his knee in his hands and his head cast down they remained for a long time without speaking at last mato murmured conquered spendius rejoined in a gloomy voice yes conquered and to all questions he replied by gestures of despair meanwhile sighs and death rattles reached them mato partially opened the canvas then the sight of the soldiers reminded him of another disaster in the same spot and he ground his teeth wretch once already spendius interrupted him you were not there either it is a curse exclaimed mato nevertheless in the end i will get at him i will conquer him i will slay him ah, if i had been there the thought of having missed the battle rendered him even more desperate than the defeat he snatched up his sword and threw it upon the ground but how did the carthaginians beat you the former slave began to describe the manoeuvres mato seemed to see them and he grew angry the army from Utica ought to have taken Hamilcar in the rear instead of hastening to the bridge. Ah, I know, said Spendius. You ought to have made your ranks twice as deep, avoided exposing the velites against the phalanx, and given free passage to the elephants. Everything might have been recovered at the last moment. There was no necessity to fly spendius replied i saw him pass along in his large red cloak with uplifted arms and higher than the dust like an eagle flying upon the flank of the cohorts and at every nod they closed up or darted forward the throng carried us towards each other he looked at me and i felt the cold steel as if it were in my heart he selected the day perhaps whispered mato to himself they questioned each other 
trying to discover what it was that had brought the suffet just when circumstances were most unfavourable they went on to talk over the question and spendius to extenuate his fault or to revive his courage asserted that some hope still remained and if there be none it matters not said matho alone i will carry on the war and i too exclaimed the greek leaping up he strode to and fro his eyes sparkling and a strange smile wrinkled his jackal face we will make a fresh start do not leave me again i am not made for battles in the sunlight the flashing of swords troubles my sight it is a disease i lived too long in my ergastulum but give me walls to scale at night and i will enter the citadels and the corpses shall be cold before cock-crow show me any one anything an enemy a treasure a woman a woman he repeated were she a king's daughter and i will quickly bring your desire to your feet you reproach me for having lost the battle against hanno nevertheless i won it back again confess it my herd of swine did more for us than a phalanx of spartans and yielding to the need that he felt of exalting himself and taking his revenge he enumerated all that he had done for the cause of the mercenaries it was i who urged on the gaul in the suffet's gardens and later at sicca i maddened them all with fear of the republic gisco was sending them back but i prevented the interpreters speaking ah how their tongues hung out of their mouths do you remember i brought you into carthage i stole the zaimph i led you to her i will do more yet you shall see he burst out laughing like a madman matho regarded him with gaping eyes he felt in a measure uncomfortable in the presence of this man who was at once so cowardly and so terrible the greek resumed in jovial tones and cracking his fingers Evoe, son after run i have worked in the quarries and i have drunk massic wine beneath a golden awning in a vessel of my own like a ptolemaeus calamity should help to make us cleverer by dint of work we may make fortune bend she loves politicians she will yield he returned to matho and took him by the arm master at present the carthaginians are sure of their victory you have quite an army which has not fought and your men obey you place them in the front mine will follow to avenge themselves i have still three thousand carrions twelve hundred slingers and archers whole cohorts a phalanx even might be formed let us return matho who had been stunned by the disaster had hitherto thought of no means of repairing it he listened with open mouth and the bronze plates which circled his sides rose with the leapings of his heart he picked up his sword crying follow me forward but when the scouts returned they announced that the carthaginian dead had been carried off that the bridge was in ruins and that hamilcar had disappeared End of chapter eight part two